whole new season of the Fanatec GT World Challenge Europe, powered by AWS Endurance Cup, begins here at Imola. It's the return of the championship to the circuit. It's also the return of fans to a venue steeped in Formula One history. It's a circuit that always delivers fantastic racing, and this season opener is going to be no exception. New cars, new teams, new drivers, new Pirelli tyres, and lots of new liveries to get used to as well. It's an old-school circuit. It's one that leaves little margin for error. At certain places, it's one where track limits might be an issue at others. But either way, it is all set to give us a battle royal to start the season. The championships operate for both drivers and teams. And across the course of the season, there's a combined championship, there's an endurance cup, and also the sprint cup. For this three-hour race, there are points to be scored in each of the classes for the overall drivers, Pro-Am, the Silvers, and the new Gold Cup that takes either a gold or platinum driver, plus a silver, plus a bronze. There are 52 cars from nine manufacturers on the grid this weekend. All of them, through the balance of performance, incredibly competitive. There are two mandatory pit stops for fuel and tyres and a driver change. The maximum you can do in a stint is 65 minutes. There's an extra five minutes grace if the safety car is on track. You also get a point for being fastest in qualifying in each class. And for this weekend's three-hour race, it's 25 points for a win and points go to the top 10 in each of the classes with, for the teams, a further five if your driver wins the on-site eSports race that happens in the Fanatec Arena. The big talking point of the weekend, though, is the entry into the championship of Valentino Rossi, the nine times MotoGP champion, has done car racing before. We've seen him in GT World Challenge endurance races before, but this is a major commitment. It's a new experience for me, and, uh, and it's great. I enjoy a lot. The, the car is so fast. It's very funny to, to drive. I'm curious to understand my level in a real weekend because uh, we have a lot of cars and a lot of fast drivers, so we will see. My two mates are very strong. Nico and Fred are, are uh, very fast in all the conditions and especially are good guys, so we enjoy. And uh, maybe it's important for, uh, for a lot of people to uh, know this type of championship because I think that uh, it's very funny to follow. Last season, Dries van Thorpe, along with Charles Wirtz, was the sprint champion and also the combined champion to take sprint and endurance results together. And he's looking for more titles this season. At the end, we I think we are good prepared. Uh, of course, it's a it's a new a new season for everyone. Everybody got new chances, so we're starting off from zero actually completely because we've got a new tyre for this year as well. We've been preparing ourselves well, let's say like that, and um, yeah, feeling confident that hopefully we can get another good season. Reigning endurance champion Nicholas Nielsen stays with our links. Teammates Alessandro Pierre Guidi steps aside from the championship this year, and Kom Ledegar defects to Porsche. It's all a very different feeling. For young Nicholas Nielsen this season. Obviously, we still have a good relationship, we still like each other, but uh, we'll see. Uh, it's going to be a different situation. Obviously, we will fight each other this year, but I think um, with the same respect as always. I'm looking forward to doing another season in the GT World Challenge with Aaron Links. New driver lineup, but nevertheless, I think another strong lineup. They have a lot of experience, a lot of experience with this car, and they, they've been obviously a part of the Friar family for several years, and uh, I think we will, we will do a good job. Colm Ledegar has won the championship for Ferrari. He's also won it for McLaren. And for this year, he's back where he made his name, really, in Porsches. But one thing's for sure, he's going to have to get used to some different co-drivers and he might well be missing, Nicholas Nielsen. For sure, outside of the car, we have a lot of uh, shares and pleasure to see each other. Uh, but uh, for sure, on track, it will be different. We will be rivals and uh, it uh, will not make any difference if it's him or another one on track. I think we have a great combination, uh, like uh, most of the pro cars. With uh, Klaus and Matteo, also uh, Dynamic being a strong team, uh, I'm looking forward to have uh, some uh, success this year. For Mirko Bortolotti, it's another season of Lamborghini racing and with another different team. Emil Frey Racing is going to be the flag carrier this year for Lamborghini. And Mirko has won for all the other teams. He wants to keep that tradition going. It's great to be back in the Endurance Cup. I haven't missed a race since 2015, only actually except one in Spa 2020. So it's great to be back in the championship again. Really looking forward to the season. A new team for me with Emil Frey. 
I think we have a, a good lineup, a good team. We are all looking forward to, to the year. It's going to be really, really tough. The level is really high as usual. So, yeah, we are really motivated and looking forward to it. Raffaele Marchiello is back for another crack at the Endurance Championship. Season 2021 wasn't the best as far as the Rapid Italian was concerned, and he is eager to change his fortunes for this year. We are here for, like, try to win. Uh, this is pretty clear. Jerome put a lot of effort in, in our car to have three factory drivers together. So, I mean, our goal for sure is to win Spa, but we're trying to do well in every race. We did yellow because we have so many yellow fans this year. So I think they are coming all for us. Maybe not, but yeah, it's, uh, it's the same team. But uh, I mean, it's new name. I mean, we are ready for it, so we'll see. Things are a bit different for Sky Tempesta Racing as well this year. The driver lineup remains the same. But gone is the traditional Ferrari, and in its place comes the Mercedes AMG GT3 for the drivers to get used to. And they enter the new Gold Cup. Very excited for the year to come, expecting some learning, obviously, in a completely new car, front engine machine, which is a big difference to the Ferrari. But so far, we all seem to have enjoyed it and um, looking OK. Hopefully, we'll be competitive this weekend. The Gold Cup was uh, really exciting for us, actually, when they announced that. Um, it worked perfectly for our lineup, of course, being like bronze, silver, gold, meant we could keep the same lineup. And also, it's been really well received in the paddock. It seems there's you know, 13 plus uh, entries in the endurance, so it looks like it's going to be a tight fight and another opportunity to test ourselves. It's great to have Aston Martin back in the championship this year. Two cars, one of which is in the Pro Cup, and Maxime Martin part of the driving force. It all comes out of the Beach Dean AMR stable, and the man behind Beach Dean, former British GT champion, is Andrew Howard. I'm just excited. I've raced in Europe quite a lot in the past, and to be honest, over the last two, three years, which has been naff for everyone, I've really missed circuits like this. The car feels great. We did a bit of testing early season, so, uh, but it's not until you get on track with the people you're going to race do you really feel where you are and what's going on. It's just cool to be back in the car. Yeah, it's really nice to be back after a few years without racing in the full season. So it's really good to be back. Two cars, very good team, very good preparation, good teammates. So yeah, it's nice to be back and especially in, at that level. We are here to win and we try to do our best. More changes at Garage 59. Gone is the Aston Martin and instead comes a McLaren. And last year, Alexander West was big rivals with Miguel Ramos. This season, they team up together to drive number 188 McLaren. It's a pleasure to, to race. With, with him uh, for a long time uh, I, I was wishing to do it and uh, so it came possible so I think we'll have a great season. Yeah, I figured I was getting tired of getting beaten by Miguel so I'd rather go, join up with him uh, so I'm glad we managed to make it work. No, it's great to be back with McLaren. Uh, it's nice to be back in a mid-engine car again so I'm really looking forward to it. Remember too that these European races make up part of the global Fanatec GT World Challenge powered by AWS. The brands scoring points in Europe, America, Australasia and Asia. So far, we've only had races down under and it is Audi Sport that heads the points table ahead of Mercedes AMG, then Lamborghini Squadra Corsa and Porsche in fourth. So we are almost good to go racing. The pit exit is going to close in a couple of minutes. The grid is starting to form. It's a busy grid because not only are there lots and lots of cars, of course, but lots of personnel around them. But fans are back, and that means that VIPs for the grid walk are back. And there are very few masks in, ice, in uh, evidence, and we are looking forward to what feels like a proper GT World Challenge Europe race. In other words, lots of action, lots of support from the fans. And of course, John Watson, an awful lot of this impetus, a lot of the attention surrounds a certain Italian who is a big draw wherever he goes. And the uh, Valentino Rossi uh, Audi certainly is going to be a car to watch. Now, let's just, before we talk more about the race, hear from the governor, because the CEO of SRO Motorsports Group, Stefan Rattel, is on the grid. Uh, his thoughts on the race and the season to come with Gemma Scott. Stefan, it's so lovely to have fans back at an event and so many of them here. The atmosphere is incredible. This is going to be a good season. Yeah, after two years of COVID, the last time we were here was in 2020 with no, no one, everybody with a mask and, and a grid that was a lot smaller than this one. So we're back in full strength with an amazing grid with Valentino, which is a blessing. 
uh, with fans with, uh, and with a fantastic competition. There really is, I mean, always close and competitive racing, but every year just seems to get even more exciting. I mean, because, you know, the, the, this time the BOP seems to be, you know, very, very close, which is, you know, new tyre, new cars, new evolution. So at the first race, we're always a bit stressed, even if we do a pre-season test for BOP, and it seems to work very well. And I think we'll have a very, very disputed race. In your opinion, who should we keep our eye on? I have no idea. <laughs> really, no, that, 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 that's the essence of what we're doing, you know? We have no favourites, and everybody has a chance. And you mentioned briefly we've got Valentino Rossi here. It's a real honour to have him as part of the championship and he seems to be really enjoying himself. Yeah, I mean, it was great to see him going a bit sideways this morning. No, no, it's a, it's a fantastic asset for us to have here this season and uh, I'm sure it's, it's going to work throughout all the 10 races. Thank you very much, Stefan. We have 57 stuck in the pit lane, incidentally, Jens Liebhauser. Apparently there were so many people in the pit lane, you couldn't get through the throng and get out in time. Right, Imola, John Watson, what a place. Wonderful circuit, 4.9 kilometres, 3 miles, 23 corners, 21. You're 21 corners in reality, there are curves that don't get counted. But it is a wonderful old school circuit that appeals to the young and the old. <laughs> I've sort of fallen the side <laughs> of the younger drivers, but nevertheless, wonderful to be back here in Imola on a racetrack, which I've mentioned in previous commentary over the past two days. I raced here 50 years ago. In those days, of course, chicanes, the word hadn't been invented, let alone the actual apparition that becomes a chicane. Yes. And uh, nevertheless, the circuit still has got a wonderful character, lots of high speed, some outstanding corners. My favorite is at the top of the hill after you leave the Tossa Herpen Bend up at Peratella. It's one of those corners you come up, up drop off onto a plateau, there's a quick left and a double left, but watch on the outside. That's being monitored for track limit abuses. All cars are carrying a GPS mm. system now, which can then monitor within the circuit also if any driver transgresses. The second place that they're being monitored is up at the very anti Alta. That's the chicane that certainly on Saturday morning caused a lot of considered con consternation because there's a marker cone, a single standing marker cone, and it was so abused. I felt sorry for it. Indeed, I saw you weep, it must be said. So the circuit is a good one. It is dry at the moment, but there is a thought of rain that might be coming later in the afternoon as you look at Nick Yellily, who is set to get on board number 98. But what about the uh, reigning overall champions? Well, one of them is Charles Witt. He's on the grid. He drives out in number 32, and he's with Gemma. Charles, obviously, coming into a new season, reigning champions in the Endurance Cup. You've worked hard this morning. It was a little bit of a difficult quality for yourself in that session, but you've got the pole position and it's looking good. Yeah, for sure. I mean, we, we got a pole position uh, together with the team and uh, my two amazing teammates. Yeah, obviously, I uh, wasn't completely happy about, uh, about my session. A lot of traffic, couldn't get a free lap, but still was enough to, to make pole. And then, yeah, I wanted to, for the only occasion I would have to, to make a free lap, I wanted to, uh, to do a special lap, but it ended up <laughs> pretty early. But, uh, you know, that's what happened. Um, we pushed to the limit and sometimes these things happen. But the most important thing is just to, to focus on this race and uh, yeah, try to, to keep the, the, the position we are now in and hopefully uh, yeah, score a lot of points today. We've had very up and down weather conditions over the last few days, a little bit of rain this morning. What's the uh, idea at the moment? Do you think it'll stay dry? Well, we have our professional weather focus here. Uh, my father, <laughs> <laughs> he, uh, yeah, he thinks it should be, it should be dry. So uh, let's see. I mean, for the time being, it doesn't look like it's going to rain, but we never know. So anyway, we are prepared for any, for any uh, conditions. Thank you and have a great race. Uh, Charles, we plonked it in the gravel this morning at the end of the third qualifying session. That's what he's referring to. Just over his shoulder there, you saw his father, Yves Witt, with Greg Masters, one of the permanent stewards to the championship, who's gone without lunch. So much was there to sort out with people getting grid drops for doing an improvement under a, a yellow flag earlier on in the day. So, uh, yeah, the stewards have been busy. It's been a busy weekend. I mean, there's been non-stop action throughout the three days and uh, certainly David I mean you've been standing here valiantly since what <laughs> 8 30 this morning you're still standing we've got three more hours of this race weekend to go and I suspect you'll be standing by the end of this race I think GT racing is worth standing up for John it's fine uh, we're looking forward to a good race as you see there the the Valentino Rossi car it, it almost ignores his teammates doesn't it Nico Muller and Fred Verviche but I tell you he's with the right team in the right car and he's got two gun drivers for company so yes. it all adds up nicely well all you've got are two outstanding GT3 drivers and Valentino's going to learn rapidly 
from those two drivers. Now, we heard Stefan Rotel refer to a big slide up at the very anti Alta this morning. It wasn't just a big slide. It was a slide that most drivers would have ended up spinning from. So uh, Valentino Rossi, absolutely brilliant when it comes to the balance. Let's watch and see what happens. He hits the curve on the inside, but here, look at the back end slide. Now, that recovery, I think, is entirely due to his career on motorcycles. Mm. That's all about balance. Exactly. And having that level of balance saved the car, saved Valentino Rossi. Even a minor little spin could have been worse. There was no panic in all of that. And uh, another combination of drivers that are going to be uh, potential winners in 88 Mercedes, Raffaele Marciello and Jules Gounon with Gemma. Boys, we're down here, second row of the grid. Qualifying didn't look particularly easy this morning. Have you got any concerns with the car? No, we just, yeah, like many, many track, many cars on track. So, yeah, it was not easy, but I mean, one point everyone had a bit of traffic. So, I mean, for us, I mean, I think we had a bit more in our pocket, but it's okay to be P3. It's, it's a long race, not easy to overtake, but yeah, it's okay. Audi looks strong, everyone looks strong, so it's easy. Certainly, you mentioned the Audi looking strong. You feel competitive, though, of course, in this car, a new car for you guys as well. Thinking about it here as well with the weather, I can feel rain. I don't know if you're feeling that on you now. What do you think is going to happen? Yeah, I'm smiling because when it's raining and Lelo is in the car, normally they have no chance around. So hopefully it's getting a bit uh, more intense. I think our quality was pretty good. Unfortunately, Danny had a lap time cancel at one point and otherwise we would have been on pole. You know, our car is a very good car. The team is doing a great job. And now we're going to have three hours to send it and uh, hopefully see you after, after this afternoon. I love the confidence. Thank you very much. Have a good race. And uh, Jules Gounon wrapped up for the elements. He won't need his Wally hat at Alton Park in two weeks when he makes his British GT debut, one hopes. Uh, there, David Rigon returning to the championship to do the start stint in the Iron Lynx Ferrari number 71. If you remember, David, he was knocked about a bit at Spa last year, but it's good to have him back. And Jack Aitken also just thinking Spa uh, in the car that lines up alongside on that row of the grid, number 63, the Emil Frey Racing Lamborghini. Jack Aitken will be the start driver in that car. So, a busy grid, as I say. Good to have fans back as well. Inevitably, Valentino Rossi has been a draw, but so also is the fact that this is just GT heaven. We've had GT3, GT4, GT2, and Lamborghini Super Trofeo over the weekend. We've lost a WRT Audi because the Arnold Robin, Maxime Robin, and uh, Raichiro Tomita Audi is still stuck in the pit lane with a problem. Ah, now. A bit late in the day to have a yeah, problem. Exactly. Pierre Giudone from WRT saying they're working on it, but uh, for the moment, the car is still stuck in the pit lane. Sounds like it's going to be a pit lane start, should it start, which is unfortunate because the pit lane technically is now closed. Mm. So they will have to wait if they get the car down to the pit lane exit, wait until the entire field takes the start of this race before they can then get involved. Now there's a car with a grid drop. Uh, it's not the only one. Nick Yellowly starts. Augusto Farfus did an improvement under a yellow flag earlier on in the day. Uh, there is Augusto Farfus with Nick Katzberg. It's his fault, says Nick. And uh, a three-place grid drop. But uh, Nick Yellowly, the British driver, given the start duties in the Rover Racing BMW. Another one with a grid drop, the Mad Panda Motorsport uh, Mercedes. Ezekiel Perez Compank was behind the wheel of it. Dawson Borkovic will start in that car. And another one with a, a grid drop for impeding another car was the Haupt Racing Team, number five entry of Hubert Haupt himself, uh, Florian Schotzer and Arjun Maini, another one new to the championship. Now let's go back down to the grid. Let's rejoin Gemma. Marco, only two Astons on the grid this year, but certainly looking competitive. Well, yeah, P8. <laughs> I wouldn't personally say it's fully competitive, but uh, I think we had uh, not the best qualifying today. Um, but let's see if we bring everything into the right temperatures in the race, if we can kind of make up some, some ground. It's not the easiest track to to overtake on, but I think uh, I think we'll have a good chance of making some positions at least. A lot of drivers talking about the problem of traffic in qualifying. Is that going to be a problem in the race here as well? Well, in, in the race, you're just going to have to be aggressive about the traffic. In qualifying, it's a little bit different because you have to kind of find the gap and and you don't know when it's amateur in the car or a pro in the car. And so it's, it was a little bit difficult in qualifying, but I have to say we had a fairly let's say even times over the car and that's the only reason why we're up here actually uh, because there was definitely some cars that, that went quicker but it's it's all about getting the lap in the, in the qualifying but yeah p8 is not not too bad uh, in the have a good race thank you marco thank you. 
So you've got two world champions in that car, Marco Sorensen and Mickey Team from the WEC. And of course, we've had Aston Martins regularly winning in Pro-Am and uh, an outright win in the past at Silverstone. If you think back to the Darren Turner, Stefan Mucker, Fred Makovicki 2013 win, there is the Rob Bell's McLaren, which in Marvin Kirchhofer's hands proved really quick in Q3. Indeed it did. It was the fastest single lap in qualifying, a 139.489 stunning lap from the McLaren. And uh, the key, we're just listening to that comment from uh, the Aston Martin, is the high temperature. I know it's a boring old subject, but it is a cool day here at Imola. Getting to high temperature, especially in the opening laps, you're going to have a parade lap. We may even have two parade laps before the race gets underway. Not going to get sufficient temperature into the tyres, either front or rear or both. So everybody needs to be aware that going into Tamburello on the opening lap, 52 cars trying to get into Tamburello. How many of those 52 will get out unscathed? Well, indeed, we had 48 or so GT4 cars a couple of hours ago, and they didn't all get through on the first lap. So, yes, hopefully the message will have got through to the uh, teams and the drivers to have a, a note of caution. But uh, as Marius Zug gets ready, he's been on commentary duty for GT4 for German television and now race duty in GT3 for Attempto, but uh, splitting his time between World Challenge Europe and also the DTM this year, lining up uh, alongside number 95. You heard from Marco Sorensen, Maxime Martin, Nicky Tim, Marco Sorensen, the drivers of 95, uh, Nicky Tim, Marco Sorensen, the uh, WEC champions, Maxime Martin, we know he's a star anyway in GT cars. Remember those valiant efforts in the Mark VDS BMW, which really put him on the map all those years ago, made him a BMW factory driver in the DTM for a short period of time. We have, as you heard pre-race, got not only the Pro, but the Pro-Am, the Silvers, and the new Gold Cup as well, uh, which has been a very popular innovation for this year. And uh, with the drivers then now strapped aboard the cars, the one minute board engines fire and the grid is cleared. And then of course it will be the formation lap. So with 51, the Ferrari there to be started by Miguel Molina, another ex-DTM racer for Audi. He's good to go. At the back of the grid, the Bentley, Nigel Bailly at the wheel of it, and the last car on the grid, which you'll get to in a second, is Rob Collard, Alex McDowell, and Sandy Mitchell's Lamborghini that Rob uh, uncharacteristically dropped into the gravel this morning but it was hoiked out and carried on in the session and it's Rob's so far only race of the season because uh, he's got now the plans for the uh, concentrating on trying to get uh, Ricky Collard back into racing this year number 25 there lining up on the uh, outside of the front row of the grid Christopher Meese starting for the Santa Locke junior team so it's going to be one of the young guns at Audi Charles versus one of the I don't want to call him old hands Christopher Meese alongside so Charles Wirtz takes the start duties. Calvin van der Linde, uh, winner at Imola the last time the cars were here, two years ago. Uh, it was a WRT win. Calvin van der Linde, Mathieu Vazivier, and Mirko Bortolotti, who was in his one Audi season, if you recall. Well, one minute, the engine's on, and looking at the start grid, Charles Wirtz on the inside going into Tamburello. That should give him the advantage, but on the outside, got the 25 Santa Lock Audi, he can break that a little bit later because he's got that wider arc into mm. the first, the left-hand turn into Tamburello. Always, always a difficult point into Tamburello on the opening lap, especially if you're going to hug the inside, which I suspect Charles Perch probably will do. I don't see him trying to move across and squeeze the 25 RD and force it to back out. So a lot can be lost literally in the first what, 300 meters from the start line down into Tamburello. Indeed, it's all about keeping out of trouble for those first few corners. Yes, it's a three-hour sprint, but you can certainly, I know it's another old adage, can't win it at the first corner, you can certainly lose it at the first corner. Right, we are good to go. The grid not quite complete with 33 Audi sitting in the pit lane, but there the green flag is shown then to release the cars. And from pole position, it is Charles Witz with alongside him Christopher Meese that leads them around. We'll have a look at the full grid in a moment, but as the field accelerates away then, great sights, uh, that backdrop of a really busy grandstand just adds to the atmosphere. I know many of them are here to see Valentino Rossi, but they're going to be treated to some great racing and stunning cars, that's for sure, with Charles Witz on pole and Christopher Meese alongside him. The second row of the 26 rows of the grid, Raffaele Marchiello in the Acker, now Akodis ASP team, Mercedes, and Christopher Hassa, another Audi up at the pointy end of the grid alongside, ahead of uh, Christian Klein in the JP Motorsport McLaren, Miguel Molina's Iron Links Ferrari is next. Starting seventh is Mario Zug for Attempto Racing, and Nicky Team goes first in number 95. 
starting nine, Ron Bell. Mauro Engel goes from 10th in Mercedes number two. On the sixth row, there's Klaus Bachler's Porsche, number 54, and Nick Yellowling aboard the 98 River Racing BMW ahead of Jack Aitken and then David Rigon. That's row seven of the grid. The eighth row, Nico Muller in the so-called Rossi car ahead of Tommaso Mosca, another of the Aquedis ASP team Mercedes drivers ahead of Nicholas Bart and then Neil Verhagen, who was the eSports race winner dominantly last night here on site at Imola. Row 10, there's Benjamin Haitis for Vincenzo Sospiri Racing and Fabian Schiller in one of the fleet of HRT Mercedes ahead of Marcus Winkelhock for a Tempto in an Audi and Hugo Valenti in another of the Trezor by Car Collection Audis ahead of Jens Liebhauser's Mercedes. Hugo Delacour for AF Corsa rounds out row 12. Row 13 of the grid is Giacomo Altue alongside Benji Goethe. The 14th row as the cars come now up through the Piratella is where you will find Adam Atechi and Consta Lapalina. And Adam Atechi, the French Carrera Cup graduate, very impressive this morning. Row 15 of the grid, Sarah Bovi lines up alongside Brendan Arib. On the 16th row, there's the Ralph Bowen starting Porsche and Ethan uh, Simononi for Garage 59, the Canadian in the McLaren. On the 17th row, Patrick Krupinski lines up alongside Louis Machiels. On the 18th row, there's Hubert Hout lining up alongside Jordan Love. On the 19th row, Andrew Howard starts as the team owner in the Beach Dean AMR Aston, but missing from the grid, Arnold Robert ahead of Gianluca Roda and then Jonathan Queen, the Sky Tempesta, row 21. Louis uh, Proctor and Dominic Fishley ahead of Alex Malikin and Valdemar Eriksson. Next on the grid, there's Dawson Borkovic lining up with Dennis Spetzer for company. Ian Loggi is next with Baptiste Moulin alongside him. Alexander West will go first in 188 and Mike Parisi in the number eight Lamborghini in the back row. Nigel Bailly in the Bentley and Rob Collard starts the Barwell Motorsport Lamborghini. That is a 52 strong grid. That is how they will line up and they are coming through Ravazza now on the run up to the start of what John Watson promises to be a tremendous race. Tremendous opening lap. Look how closely the car, the 52 car field is packed together and that's not going to be much different by the time they get down into Tamburello. The safety car will peel off very shortly after the exit of Ravazza 2 and then the race will be in the control of Charles Verts in the pole position 32 RD and everybody behind has got to be patient. Did I say patient? You did. Whether they listened, I can't answer. So, up to the grid they come. They don't stop on the grid. Remember, it is a rolling start. They have to be absolutely one behind the other. You're not allowed to dart left or right until you get to the lights. The race direction team very keen on enforcing that. But the opening round of the 2022 Fanatec GT World Challenge Europe, powered by AWS Endurance Cup, about to get underway. It's Imola, it's three hours, it's go, it's a good start by Wits, it's not a great start by Christopher Mies who slots in behind him and that opens the door possibly for Raffaele Marciello on the outside line as they go storming up towards Tamburello for the first time. Wits leads, Mies goes second, Marciello third and then hold your breath, can they all get through? So far so good. No yellow flags evident on the timing screen as Wits goes left, goes right, tries to not only get warmth in tyres, but also break any slipstream effect from Christopher Meese and also try to out him at the same time. Audi one, Audi two. Yeah, that was Charles Wits trying to get temperature into his tyres. The only way he can do it on this opening lap is to do that little bit of weaving. It's not something that's normally acceptable, but in these conditions with the very good temperatures, he needs that temperature as quickly as possible. Up the hill out of Tosa for the first time then. Mercedes and Raffaele Marciello runs third then, fourth. Christopher Hasser, and then in fifth spot, Christian Klein in the leading McLaren to the outside line there. Look, goes number 54, Porsche. So Klaus Backler gains ground on the outside as they drop down towards Aqua Minerali for the first time on asking. Now, of course, the BOP is such that all the cars are very evenly matched. It means that overtaking ain't that easy on occasions. You've got to be really brave. The next corner, the Varianti Alta, again, not the easiest place to overtake. Look at the weaving that's going on. You think it was a warming up lap, far from it. It's a racing lap, and yet people are still on a cold day in Italy trying to get warm in the tyres. Well, this is a brand new Pirelli tyre, and people are saying that in these cold conditions, and up and up, Philip, you can see what's happened, Varianti Alta. People have just been forced wide. That's normal in the opening lap, but nevertheless, a lot being looked on favourably once the spiel begins to settle down as they run down into the Robazza and the race leader is already away out of the exit of Robazza too. An effort made on the inside there, look number 19, that was Giacomo Altue going through, picks up a place, leaders come over the line then. So, 
One lap in the book, Charles Weitz leads. And you know what? We got through that without any yellows. That's a good job done by everybody. Christopher Meese is second. Raffaele Marciello is third. Fourth is Christopher Hauser. In fifth race is Christian Clean. In sixth race, Nicky Tim. And out of all this, battling out way up the inside of Nick Yellowly. Jack Aitken trying to get through. And there's a yellow flag at the last corner. I spoke too soon because one of the back markers has tripped up into the Villeneuve chicane. The two Audis are getting away up front, aren't they? Yes, uh, good start by the number 32 Audi, Charles Weitz. Likewise, Christopher Meese making that break. And Raffaele Marcello sitting back. And uh, normally he's the hot rod when it comes to the start of any of the races, but having to be more patient maybe this time. Safety with, car. Yeah, just waiting to get his Mercedes to the position that he would like that car to be in so he can start to lean on the car all the way down the hill into Acroma Minerale. Safety car will be deployed. It's but I think sitting at the pit lane exit, waiting for the race leader to come around the Revazza too, and then make his way onto pit straight. And we have not had through. Well, into the pits has come Louis Machiels. That is Patrick Kuprinski off the road, and Sarah Bovi walking away from that battered Ferrari. So I did speak too soon about my yellows. It was Kuprinski going off there. That's done for him. But earlier around the corner, I fear he may have got together with the Ferrari. Well, certainly the Ferrari, you can see the damage to the front of the car, and that's a load of carbon fibre once again right over the middle of the racetrack between Rivazza 1 and Rivazza 2, so the car would be craned away very quickly, but then it's the clean of operation to get those carbon fibre shards removed. Nothing cuts through a Ferrari tyre quite like a bit of carbon fibre on the racetrack, so they don't quite know why that incident occurred, but we did see the JP Motorsports McLaren Spearing off the track on the exit of Ravazza 2. Uh, Louis Machiel's Ferrari may have got caught up in it as well. That's just pitted, but has gone out and stayed on the lead lap. It's a long, long way back, but it'll get that lap back thanks to the safety car. And Valentino Rossi thinking, glad I didn't start. It looks a bit hectic out there. His day will come. He'll have the opportunity to start at some point this season. But with a 52-car field, it's a big ask for anybody in their yep. first effective professional season in a very, very high-class field. So there's 52 Ferrari that has got, for the moment, ensnared behind the safety car, but it should be allowed by because it's not the lead car. So the uh, team in race control will hopefully give that instruction to the safety car crew to allow that car to go by, but we've gone to safety car procedure already, so quite often the safety car will circulate until it finds the right car, then bang the lights on when it left with the lights on uh, before Louis Machiels had exited the pit lane, so it's out of sequence, but the safety car has, as you see, been deployed because we need to get that incident attended to down at turn 17, turn 18. So contact between Sarah Bovey and Patrick Kopinski has been acknowledged by race control. 51 starters in the end, with the number 33 Audi not having got away. We've got a couple that have just also made pit stops, 57 and 9.11 have uh, just blasted out of the pit lane. It's conceivable those cars might have been behind the Ferrari and McLaren and they would be the first to find the racetrack you know, pretty much covered in carbon fibre. So whether they felt in the interest of safety to come in and uh, possibly even put on a fresh set of rubber all round just in the event that they might have picked something up, maybe they didn't even know if there was an issue, but rather than finding out the hard way, they've done what they think might be the smart move. Well, for the moment, safety car stays on track. And of course, they haven't got much time to get warmth into tyres. What warmth they've got, they soon lose at this reduced pace. So it might be that we have a couple of quicker safety car laps before the restart, just to give them a bit of a chance on the uh, temperatures of the tyres. Yes, this is reminiscent of what we saw in Spa, what, some four or five years ago, where we had incidents occurring and then long safety car periods, then cold tyres and then immediately following that another safety car period when uh, drivers had pushed too hard on tyres that were not up to racing temperatures. Um, hopefully that won't be the case here at Imola today, but of course it's all really in the hands of those competitors and their judgments. And let's hope they get it right. The McLaren is still sitting there in an area where it would I preferably want to see that car removed. There's no sign of any assistance uh, being made available to get that car. But they be getting the Ferrari moved. Obviously, that's the car that was right in the middle of the racetrack. So this might take a few more minutes before we get back to green flag racing. Indeed so. Teams, the Brains Trusts in the 
pit lane, start to work out what this is going to do to pit stops. And although they tapped at the end of the lap, let's have a look at the start. Really good getaway by Wiz. Interesting the way that Christopher Meese straight away decided to dive in behind and try and cut off anybody else's challenge. Yeah, the opposite of what I thought might happen. I thought Ferris might hug the inside all the way down in. That was a difficult start for the 97 Aston Martin. And the Mercedes Sky Tempest at 93 gets past, but leaves the door wide open, and the Aston just slots up the inside. So does he maintain the position, or is there any contact? Looks like the 93 may have been able to consolidate and leaves room on the inside for the Aston. Should it be there? It's not on our line of vision, but undoubtedly from the cockpit, he is. A, well, it is actually. You just saw the nose of the Aston sticking up the inside, but now as you go into the Villeneuve, Chicane, the turn to the right, the advantage returns to the 93 Mercedes. Now, I've got a report that 563 Lamborghini might be dropping fluid. It's the Michele Beretta, Yuki Nomoto, Benjamin Haiti's uh, Lamborghini. Have a look at the start from Jack Aitken's point of view. Really good to have Jack back in the championship. And of course, he's busy at the moment because he's got a load of traffic around him. This is the run up towards Tamburello. But the front of the grid doing it absolutely right. Yes, racing for position, of course, but giving each other just enough room. Yeah, a lot more caution in the midfield than normally we are accustomed to. It is the first race of the season, so maybe people are just letting themselves get dialed in. But you can see just how aggressive the BMW there trying, the 98 trying to you know, maintain his position at the same time, put pressure on the 38 McLaren. This is an alternate view of the entry into the Tamburolo chicane. One might ask, how can they all get through 52 cars, get through at race pace, and still have 52 cars come out of the chicane? And then at Rabatza, oh, well, well, that's the, yeah, the replay of yeah. the... Now, there's a bit of contact with uh, Mercedes and Lamborghini. Are you on board with the Sky Tempest at Mercedes? Now, look up ahead, because the Ferrari-McLaren incident is going on. There's the Ferrari that spins. You can just see all the traffic trying to scatter, but possibly with an assist from the McLaren. Others have to go through in avoidance. A lot of debris on the road as well. Yeah, there's three cars Safety involved. Safety car in this lap. Safety car in this lap. That's the voice of Alain Adon, the race director, just quickly to mention. So we will go back to racing this time. We've seen Rivatsa catching out plenty of people over the weekend in the qualifying and the practice sessions, haven't we, with incidents down there? Yes, yeah, so I mean, you're breaking downhill into Rivatsa 1, which is a bit of a novelty, which is most racetracks don't have very many steep downhill braking areas. Uh, Rivatsa 2, easy to run wide on the exit, run over the kerb, get your wheel onto the gravel, and either get sucked into the gravel or loop it round and end up going across the racetrack into the barrier on the left-hand side. So it is a, a part of the racetrack that is always a bit of action going on. So, as you've heard from the race director, safety car in at the end of this lap, and meanwhile, Molina currently running in ninth place in the Ferrari. Gaps are stretching a bit. Yep, it has. Certainly, the front half of the field clearly has stretched. Further back, I suspect, is still quite compressed. There is the safety car. The lights are still on. It's meant to be coming in this lap. I wonder when the light will go out. And then the clear indication to Charles Vietz that we're going to go back to racing. Christopher Meese wants to get himself tucked up under the rear wing of that lead Audi. He can't overtake until he crosses the start-finish line, but he wants to be in a position where he can put a bit of pressure on the young Belgian Charles Beards. Indeed so. Right, I think the lights are now out. Everyone's got the message. I mentioned Porsche 911. Uh, the Renaults had had a pit stop. It's actually Ralph Bone at the wheel of it. That was a damaged tyre, so they've sorted that and sent it back in the race. As you'll see, Louis Machiels was allowed from behind the safety car, so it's the lead car on the road that comes down towards Ravazza now, Charles Wirtz. We are set to go racing. And with the first 12 minutes or so just about done, we go green once more. Wirtz gets a good restart. Green flag. Pounds it out of Ravazza up towards the line. It is go, go, go. It is Audi's first and second. It is Wirtz versus Meat. Much yellow third in the Mercedes. Christopher Hassel runs fourth. Christian Klee fifth in the McLaren. Nicky team sixth for Aston Martin. Yeah, Charles Vez used the opportunity in the earliest off. Oh, chance to get hard on the throttle, catching marginally Chris Meese by surprise, but behind Raffaele Marcello, a little bit further back from the rear of the Audi. Well, he'll not be too worried about it. It's a long way to go in his stint. Riding on board with Miguel Molina then in the 51 Ferrari, which currently is in ninth place as the leaders wriggle out of the Villeneuve chicane. So Wirtz have got to try and build that lead once more. 
who's going to go with it. Well, Christopher Meese is staying just about in touch as there to the inside line. Nicky Tim tries to make a move against Christian Klein, but also tries to block out Mauro Engel. And the Aston is almost alongside the McLaren, but not quite. Christian Klein keeps him at bay. Nicky Tim with the Aston. I thought it might have the drag up the hill. It does not, but he's also got Engel right behind him. How about this for a battle? Yeah, Christian Klein did the right thing. He saw the Aston coming. He gave it enough room to allow it to race. Still maintains his position, currently fifth place to Nicky Team in sixth. Mauro Angle in the pink, blue and white Mercedes in seventh. So those three cars, well, th there's nothing in terms of performance. Well, look at Nicky Team. Not only is he warming up the tires, he's just trying to irritate Christian Clean by making him look in his mirror one way, look the other way. Then the crash back wall up as they go through the very anti chicane. Downhill they plunge. So he's actually shaken off Engel for the moment. Engel's got problems of his own in a sense. Klaus Backler is now breathing down his neck there in a Porsche that's going through the shot. Down to Rivazza they come. This, remember, is lap six. It's a three-hour race. Two mandatory pit stops have got to be made pretty much at the hour mark. And there being forced out wide walls. Is that one of the car collection Audis? Either way, he's got away with it just. Up to the timing line they come now. Klaus Backler looks like he's got enough momentum to make Mauro Engel think about what do I do when I come down to Tamarillo? Am I going to have to go defensive? And likewise, the Aston Martin, Nicky Team doing the very same thing with Christian Clean. Aston looks to go up the inside, can he get alongside? Yes, he does. Nice, clean pass by the Dane. Excellent stuff. So, the Dane train gains a place. The Nicky Team, Marco Sorensen, plus Belgian, Maxi Martin, Aston. One place gained. Good job done there by Nicky Team. And cars everywhere looking for track position. Brilliant example of that of the different shapes and sizes. The BMW kind of towering over the Lamborghini ahead and the McLaren behind. There you go, Molina, Zug, Aitken, Yololi, Bell, Muller, all bunched together. And, and nobody can really do very much when you're so close to the car you're following. You need to give yourself a little bit of space to get your own momentum. Headlights going, Nick Yololi deciding that he thinks that's the way to intimidate Jack Aitken in the Emil Fry racing lap. The incident between car 57 and 83 is under investigation. <laughs> Charles Witts does the fastest lap of the race. You heard the race director talking about the incident under investigation. 57 has already made two pit stops against Steve Hauser. And uh, 83 is the Iron Dames car. So I think the Mercedes may have been the original tapper. Yes, I, I didn't really get a good glimpse of it when we had that replay, but I didn't think it was the McLaren that was directly involved in the contact. So it has been the 57 Winwood Racing Mercedes that is going to be a judge to be a big party. Down the outside, coming into Rivata, that's the second of the BMW. He loses the place, and that was a sort of a, almost like a, a schoolboy error. Oh, dear me, and that was for Hagen to open up the door, and the Audi just said, thank you very much, I'll take it all day. Hugo Valenti in the Audi number 11 gets ahead of Neil Verhagen. Then the leader goes by, Charles Witz leading by three tenths. Fast slap, Nicky team. The Aston is a storming, it goes through now in fifth place. Down to sixth, Christian Clean. but Mauro Engel is still seventh. Uh, the leading Silver Cup car at the moment is 99 of Marius Zug, uh, and other classes are being led by the Gold Cup number 10, Adam Atiki, a little bit further back, going nicely. And that was the leader getting it wrong. Charles Witz coming out of the Villeneuve chicane, rattled it across the gravel, and he has gift wrapped the lead and given it to Christopher Meese. Well, Christopher Meese certainly did not need to ask twice on that one. And, uh, well, well, let's have a look and see. Just too hot, caught the gravel, dragged the car across the grass. And Christopher Meese says, thank you very much. That's the easiest pass I'm going to have all afternoon. And so now, Charles Witt's a bit rattled, tries to fight back. Raffaele Marcello thinks, good, if I apply pressure, let's see what happens next. Well, Raffaele Marcello certainly would know how to apply pressure. Two young drivers, two entirely different cars, but... With the balance of performance, there's very little to pick and choose between the overall lap time. How they achieve it is quite a different thing, but in terms of overall lap time, there's nothing between the Mercedes and the RD. Downhill they turn, their new race leader. But look at this, Raffaele Marchiello is all fired up now, isn't he? He wants to take that place. Then the Italian driver drops downhill. Behind it is Christopher Hauser. And in the field, accelerates through the first element of Rivazza. That is 98, Nick Yellowly. So the BMW. Rattles up the kerb, look back at the rover entry. This is from Jack Aitken's car, the Emil Frey Racing Lamborghini goes through over the timing line. Now, Christopher Meeks leads by over a second now from Witt. Much yellow, half a second back. Then it's Hassa, then it's team, then it's Christian Clean in sixth. Well, Charles Vance is going to have to take up three or four corners to get his tyres cleaned up, because by going onto the gravel, he'll pick up all the rubbish and all the dust and whatever, so that 
Christopher Meese would have easily been able to extend that advantage, but what Charles Bates has got to be aware of is half a second behind me is Raffaele Marcello. The only good news is in sector one, there was a fraction of a second advantage to Charles Vets over that third place Mercedes. Jack Aitken here under pressure, isn't he? He's got Nick Yellowley all over him like a rash. Up the hill they climb, lap nine. So Christopher Meese, race leader, trying to get away. And Charles Wirtz having a word with himself, calming himself down. In fairness, he's not really given Raphael Marchiello a proper opportunity to challenge, so he's still there in that second place. But it's just one constant line of traffic, isn't it? There's not much of a gap, but I suppose if there is one anywhere, it's between fifth and sixth. Nicky Team, having cleared the McLaren of clean, has got away. Yeah, so he's now only a tenth of a second behind Christopher Hasse in the fourth place Audi. So yeah, that would be another move that Nicky Team, if he could repeat what he did a few minutes ago going into Tamborello to make that pass on Christian Clean in the McLaren, well, he'll feel that's been a good start to my one hour stint here this afternoon. There you can see the red Audi. And directly behind it, the Nicky team is getting himself into position to be able to do what he did a minute or two ago. Is he as close as he was to the McLaren? It's difficult to judge, but he will be looking to slip down the inside, assuming that we don't see the Christopher Hauser blow. He hit, but Christopher Hauser knew what was coming. He saw it coming. He put his Audi in the part of the racetrack the Aston was about to put itself into, and nothing Nicky team was able to do. He didn't have quite enough momentum at the point of entry into Tamborello to make it stick. I love the thought of flashing the headlights. He's going to get Hauser out of the way. I know it's a distraction or an attempted distraction, but it doesn't work on Christopher Hauser. Team, again, a tentative look to the inside just to try and unsettle Christopher Hauser as he has a quick look in that uh, rear camera that the cars have. In terms of the top speed heading up towards Tamborello, Rob Bell, the fastest, with Klaus Backler's Porsche matching him and Marius Sood and Redden Areeb and Nick Yellowley all on 276 kilometres an hour. What does, what does that say? It says balance or performance is about as good as it's going to get. Yeah, two McLarens, a Porsche, an Audi and a BMW. Not bad, eh? So in the meantime, Christopher Meese continues to uh, hold sway. The gap up and touch last time, 1.4 seconds. But Nicky Team is certainly taking the battle to Christopher Hauser. Next question is... What's happening to Christian Cleve? Because he has dropped a big chunk of time. He's over 2.7 seconds back now from that Aston Martin. I think it's really about the, the pace that Nicky Team is illustrating. There he again, look down into the Ravazza. Christopher Hauser knows he's got a battle on his hands. Nicky Team is trying to get himself even closer to the rear of the Audi as they then go on to the start finish straight. And again, the battle will be going into Tamborello. Will the Aston be able to get alongside? If it does, it can take the corner. But if he hasn't got enough, of, it hasn't got at least three quarters of the car alongside, it will not happen. 66 track limits. 66 with a track limit infringement then. And whoops, more gravel is settling. Number 10 in the middle of all of that was Adam Eteki in the boots and uh, black and orange Audi. So 20 minutes done. And this explains why the gravel was in the air. And it was Adam Eteki who ran wide, so he was really impressive in his qualifying session this morning. But running out of road at Ravazza, new to the championship, new to this style of GT car. Two of the Lamborghinis getting themselves together there from BS Racing and behind uh, Emil Frey. That is the recovering Eteki. Yeah, I mean, it looks like he's back at the races, resolved the issue about running wide, and uh, that was on Ravazza. So he's recovered well from that. That's important to recover quickly from an incident. He's just got back his Gold Cup lead as well, because he's just moved back ahead of the number 21 Ferrari of Hugo Delacour. So there, the Gold Cup being led in 27th place overall by number 10. The Audi climbs the hill once more. And most people are in a battle. And 39 minutes until we get to the end of the first hour, and people contemplating when is the ideal moment to make that pit stop whether it's just before they are or just after it depending on how you're doing partly in traffic really 65 minutes is the maximum you can do in a stint there's alexander west who is leading in pro-am at the moment garage 59 partly his team of course with uh, chris godwin and andrew piccotti moving away from aston back to mclaren for this year and he's got new co-drivers as well miguel ramos and enrique chavez that were with barwell last year and they were rivals of course to alexander west and now he's co-drivers well, that gap of the lead has extended quite considerably in the last lap, 2.4 seconds. And Raffaele Marcello is not really able to make many impressions on that second place, Audi. But the battle of all interest for me is going to be for that fourth and fifth place. So there is the Aston Martin still behind Christopher Hauser. He's pushed 
He's got close, but not close enough to make it stick. Now down into the Villeneuve chicane. Again, you can see team closes right up to the rear of the Audi, but then it's acceleration off the corner. He's a little bit later on the throttle than the Audi is, and that's where the seesaw of entry and exit of corners, and it equals itself out by the time they now make the climb up the hill, up to Perretella. But one thing about Nicky Team is, he is 100% Danish racer. Yeah, yeah. His father, Kurt Team, DTM champion, uh, Nicky Porsche Super Cup champion. Uh, he won that, the rather sad year, to say the least, that uh, his main rival, Sean Edwards, was killed in Australia. But Nicky Team has uh, been successful in a variety of racing cars, single-seaters, GT cars, but he's become very much part of the Aston Martin fabric. Great character, not afraid to speak his mind either. So I mean, he's just one of those people that you, you gravitate to because he is a personality, aside yep. from his abilities behind the wheel. Exactly so. Over the brow he comes, then heading down to Rivazza. You're right about that gap that uh, Christopher Meese has pulled out over Charles Weir. It's 2.4 seconds, it is. Santa Lock ahead of WRT and Christopher Haas's Audi, another team. You've got to say that the car collection team, yes, experience at the Nürburgring with 24-hour experience and NLS experience, doing a good job here because they've got that car very much in the mix. Indeed they have. So 2.4 seconds was the advantage. Watch and see what it is. 2.3, so in fact, Beards has clawed back a tenth or so of a second to the advantage that Christopher Meese enjoys. Christian, Christian Clean, you just saw go through. He's got himself behind a back marker. That's Nick Yellowly looking to try to make a move. He's going to the outside line. Look, against Jack Aitken heading up towards Tamburello. Can't find a way through. Again, you see the different shapes. So obvious in the case of the Lamborghini and the BMW, but so evenly matched as well. Yeah, Jack Aitken had to go slightly defensive on the entry into Tamburello. Nick Yellowly tried to work the Oracle by adjusting to what Jack Aitken was doing. So they come out of the Villeneuve chicane. In reality, there's nothing between the two cars as they were when they went in. But Yellow Lead this time on the exit of the Tosa Herpen. Again, looks, the BMW looks very strong in certain parts of the circuit. And Jack Aiken, I don't know how much he's got to combat what Nick Yellow Lee is doing. So far, he's been oh. successful. But I think if the BMW gets ahead of the Lamborghini, it's gone. I think you might be right. Well, last time Jack Aiken raced here, was in 2015 in Formula Renault Alps, and he was a race winner. So it's a hopefully good return to Imola for him. Gets away from the BMW there, doesn't he? Out of Aqua Minerale up the hill to Variante Alta. And now brakes and under braking, so the BMW claws back a length right there. You can see Christian Klee, who has got Black Mara and Engel. white flag to car four, track limits. He's got Mara Engel breathing down his neck. Car four, says Alan Adol. That's Jordan Love, the... Uh, Australian driver, managed by Mark Blundell. Through the traffic they go, that uh, 57 Jens Liebhauser, blue and white Mercedes out of sequence, but they've cleared that through Rivazza. A rear review of the battle, there is the lead going through again. So the gap is down to 1.9 seconds. Was that a bit of bodywork on the track, or was that the Aston Martin gets alongside and takes it away from Christopher Hasser? So Nicky team goes through, goes fourth. That car's getting stronger and stronger as the stint, go, stint goes on, and this was it. Side by side up towards the timing line. There oh, was, was a big whack yes. between them. Yes, oh. I saw the bodywork flying. I didn't see the contact initially, but that was what caused the bodywork to fly. So no mercy given whatsoever in that overtake by Nicky Team. Now, that was pro on pro, wasn't it? Because often if there's an incident where it is a pro against a different graded driver, say a, a, a bronze, say an am, uh, then the pro driver cops the, the larger amount of fault and therefore the penalty. But pro on pro, the uh, stewards might just shrug and let them play on, as it were. Certainly anybody other than a pro on pro will get a penalty and a bit more hip and shoulder as they come up the hill. Almost three abreast into Peratella, three into one won't go, but two into one just about does. <laughs> Well, that's a good. Right, here they come down the hill. That's Neil Hagen in the BMW, then looking for a way up past the Hugo Valente driven Audi. Just up the road ahead is Thomas Omosco with the Mercedes. 77 is Rob Collar, that's from the back of the grid. Now, uh, Rob doing a good job because he started on the back row, 52nd effectively. He's got himself up to 39th, so making decent progress here, but he's under attack from Jonathan Cui in the Sky Tempesta Racing Mercedes. New car Black Tempesta. and white flag to car 90, track limits. I suspect we're going to hear an awful lot of this. That's Dawson Borkovic, number 90, being given the driving standards flag. They're relevant now insofar as that's your warning. But once you've had the driving standards flag, then you can anticipate that it's going to be a, a rather more draconian penalty. Yeah, I mean, 
it's been very clear to everybody, particularly here at Varianti Alta, if you run all four wheels off the racetrack over that white line, then you're going to be observed. And if you go completely off the racetrack, then you will have ceded that, or potentially ceding a position, certainly losing time. Well, downhill comes John McQueen, the Hong Kong driver lines up to have a think, at least, about a move on the inside line, but no chance there. Actually, frankly, it was a waste of time. I don't know why he even bothered, because it should have taken his normal line in to Ravazza 1 and gained the, the, the benefit of doing so. But by coming in early and showing your nose when there was no chance to pass, I can't quite get it. Rob Collard is the man he was looking at, as there is the leader, Christopher Meese, building the gap only by a few hundreds here in the tenth there. And that's drama for Hugo Valente. Dust settling as he been off the road coming yep. out of the Villeneuve chicane. Yeah, he went and ride again on the exit of the chicane. Uh, we didn't see it happen, but we saw the consequence of the dust up in the air. So up the hill we go. And further down the field back up at the Peritella oh that's Ooh. the reason why oh yeah <laughs> oh dear oh, me wow. that was a code brown moment as they wow. all scattered oh. wow well that was lucky lucky uh, that's the understatement of the day <laughs> does that go into your ride em cowboy category oh I've the right time I mean that's got to not be a, <laughs> more than a cowboy that's riding a bucking bronco <laughs> uh, oh bucking yes Christopher Meese up towards the line then so this is going to put 15 laps in the book and Charles Wirtz has done the fastest lap of the race, but is being able to get back onto terms with Christopher Meese. Of course, he gave him the lead after he had that moment. The gap between the two is 1.9 seconds now. And then Raphael Marciello is in third place. Raphael's last lap was slightly slower, but he's being caught by Nicky Team, only by a couple of tenths, but the Aston Martin is on a charge. Yes, the Aston Martin now is in clear air. It's, uh, it's, it's, all he's got to do is focus on how can I close the gap. It currently is 2.2 seconds between the third place Mercedes, fourth place Aston Martin, you see it just coming through the Villeneuve chicane. Charles Verts, the gap is 1.9 seconds as they came across the line. A lap earlier it was 1.8 something something. So it's, it's ebbing and flowing by a tenth or a hundredth of a second on a given lap. Up the hill, third place Mercedes. It's a rather restrained drive to date from Raffaele Marcello. Normally we see him very, very uh, aggressive in the early phases of a lap. Yeah. This is the driver here, Nicky Team, who's been really getting his elbows out. And I wonder just that little bit of contact with Christopher Haas's Audi and bits of carbon fiber coming off. Those little bits of carbon fiber do actually an important job. They help channel the air in and around and under the car. Well, Nicky Team has done an absolute best in the first sector, much yellow and absolute best in the middle sector. Of course, we've had half an hour. Yes, some of it was under yellow flag conditions, but the cars are getting lighter now as the fuel is burnt off. Tires are nice and warm, finally. There's Christopher Hasser hanging on to that fifth place as he drops down the hill towards Ravazza. But certainly Nicky Team's car going nicely, going strongly. There is Charles Witz in the uh, orange and white Audi. Rob Collard under attack now. Jonathan Quee has caught him, and this time he's going to have a look on the inside at Piratello. Can't find it there. Rob Collard goes out wide, just gets across in time to get the apex for the corner. Yes, he gave a lot of space for Jonathan Wee to make sure there wasn't contact in the process, put himself way, way out and almost no man's land on the exit of Peratella, but did a good job in avoiding contact and not getting himself into trouble. So that will be, uh, I can think, I can, a force majeure circumstance yeah. for Rob Collard. So the lead gap went up again last time, but Charlwitz quicker in the first sector. He's done the absolute best in the first sector, but now Jonathan Wee is under attack because right on his tail, look, as they drop down the hill, is Mike Parisi in the EGS Events Lamborghini. Mike Parisi, in turn, has got the Mercedes there, and Valdemar Eriksson, the Dane, tucked up behind him. So everywhere you look, pretty much, there's a good battle raging on, and Rob Collard asserting himself once more over the Sky Tempesta Mercedes. A good effort, indeed, from the, the mature British driver. So getting past and avoiding the contact with the 93 Mercedes, as we go down now into Tamburello. Uh, the entry is relatively easy, the transition to the right easy, the exit is lovely, there's Mad Panda, and they're in a battle, well, a true, right, the 27, wow, look at the way it just swung out. So to the outside line then goes the yellow and black Leipert run Lamborghini, that's Dennis Fetzer at the wheel of it, Dawson Borkovic, new to GT racing, trying to fend off everybody, Benoit Moulin as well. As the bonnet on the car, it looks like it's partially open. I don't think there should be such a gap. Might be right. Well, that's a potential problem, or the, that's how the car started the race, but to my mind, that's not fully closed, but there are restraints on the other side of the bonnet to make sure it doesn't 
blow back, but it's something the team will most like to have a look at when it does come in for its first of the two pit stops. Nicky T, fastest lap of the race. 1 minute 40.3. He's currently 4.9 seconds off this leading car. So net, the gap is coming down. Christopher Meese is about to start lap -re look because that is the uh, disabled driver, Nigel Bailly, making his GT World Challenge Europe debut. Uh, Nigel Bailly, who raced at Le Mans last year, uh, was paralyzed after a nasty motocross accident, but returned in karting and then Clio's and then into sports cars. So it's great to have him as part of the GT World Challenge Europe family. Did a good job in realizing that the race leader was closing quickly. Gave him plenty of room to get through. Now Charles Verge will be looking for the same kind of treatment. And of course, a more difficult part of the circuit down into Aqua Minerale. So the Bentley stays as best he possibly can to the left. Charles Verge will have lost some the momentum. Warning flag to car 32, 54, 14, and triple seven for track limits. Stuck it up, aren't they? God, dear me, it takes a half a minute to get the message out. It's so many drivers <laughs> transgressing. Now, Raffaele Marcello will be feeling, oh, why do they let those two Audis go? And now I'm the one that's getting stuck. So he'll dive down the inside into Ravazzo, which he does. And uh, he'll now have to make up. But his concern will not be just losing time to the Audis. It'll be losing advantage to Nicky Team, who now is caught up behind the Bentley likewise. But the disadvantage to Team is going to be less than that would have been to Marcello. Jonathan Quee, he's going to have another go at super sub Rob Collard. Uh, he's in for Adrian Amstutz, who is uh, otherwise engaged this weekend with business commitments. So uh, Rob, for whom he, of course, has driven with Marwell in the past and won the British GT Championship for him, got the call. What are you doing? So rearranged a few things, and here he is back behind the wheel. Gave up the Sunday roast, didn't he? Yeah, exactly. Hasn't gone out for one of his usual 100-mile bike rides or whatever it is that Rob does. Run plenty of marathons. He's a keen cyclist and uh, keen racing dad as well, looking after Ricky and Jordan, his two sons. Top speed at Tamburello, Mauro Engels Mercedes, the fastest, 182 kilometers an hour time with Neil Verhagen's BMW, then it's Ferrari, Porsche, BMW, 181 apiece. Again, what, five, four different brands in the, the top five. So I'm just watching the 83 Rob Bell, who's right on the rear wing of Nick Yellowley in the BMW, who's still battling to get ahead of Jack Aiken in the 11th place 63 Lamborghini. There's Maro Engel, who's down in seventh place. He's just 1.1 seconds behind Christian Clean in the number 111. You can see it, the black and gold. Uh, McLaren as it climbs up the hill out of Acro Minerale, and then the remainder of the climb, slightly shallower climb up into, into Variante Alta. And they just caught a glimpse of the dreaded bollard that remains direct. No one has covered it yet. And uh, there is 99 Audi, which is running in ninth place. Marius Zug doing a good job, staying on the tail of Klaus Backler. The Porsches not seeming to have the outright pace here. There's, there's really none of the Porsches that have, have looked wow, in the same way, actually, that the Ferraris or Lamborghinis have. I think part of the story is Pirelli have introduced this new tower, which is meant to be, a, it is a more competitive tower, but teams have got to uh, learn how to adapt and adjust their cars. So they've had a certain amount of running, but not the level of testing that maybe would have uh, given them the opportunities, but watch the 63. Is it going to catch the Ferrari Albert? Costa? Warning to oh, Jack, Jack, or Jack Aiken. Down Jack the outside, but has to concede. So Jack had to get out of it. And Miguel Molina consolidates in 10th place and gains marginally on the exit from Tamburello and the short sprint down into the Car left. Car 8 is up. under investigation for speeding in the pit lane. Car 8, under investigation, speeding in the pit lane. So that's the Mike Parisi-driven Lamborghini, and that was on its way in, because it's still in the pits. So uh, Mike Parisi with a problem, clearly, because it's early. It's just left now, but it was on the way in that it's bad. Yeah, Klaus Backler getting on the headlights just to give Nigel Bailly in the Bentley, oh, there we are. Why Rob Collard. All that? What has gone wrong? Donald Ravazza. That's Rob Collard, and he's in the gravel. Did he get there with any assistance? He was under pressure from Jonathan Hui, that's for sure, and there are lots of witness marks on the road there. That looks to me like it might have been tapped from behind because the car has begun to spin just before he got to the apex. So we may have a replay of it. We can see whatever. That's going to be a long time to get that car out of the gravel. It will probably be another... Certainly a yellow flag, if not a full Five, course yellow. Five, four, three, two, one, full course yellow now. Yeah. Full course yellow is called for, and everyone stands on the brakes. They have the uh, in-car marshalling system 
these days. So they know what the flags are because they're in the cars. They also have that communication from the race director as to the teams. The teams can either patch that through to the driver or just relay it themselves, the count as Alain Adam counts down. But the reason for the full course yellow is this. Now, why a full course yellow, not a safety car? Well, as it was the first lap of the race when the dramas happened, that was a, an early safety car. Everyone was together in a line. But the full course yellow instantly means that people slow down. So you've straight away got people driving safely. You can get the marshals out there and get the problem sorted. But you can expect the safety car to come out to get people in a line because that can go quicker than you're allowed to go under the full course yellow. So by doing that, you're getting people back up to if you like a, a race rhythm and also tire temperatures up and tire pressures up, John. Yeah, I mean, obviously under a full course yellow, you're not permitted. You've got a delta time you've got to stick to. You're not meant to gain or lose on the car ahead of you or directly behind you. So there is our race leader, Christopher Meese. He built up just prior to this full course yellow, 6.7 seconds. Now that may be the consequence of the, at the point of the racetrack that the full course yellow was issued where Christopher Meese might have been on the lap and where Charles Virch was, but 6.7 seconds, significantly larger than it was on the last racing lap. There you can see the gap between the two cars. But once we go to a safety car, then that gap is going to close back down. And so it, it'll, the work that Christopher Meese has done to build up his advantage will be lost. But that's the same way all the way through the field. So the biggest loser inevitably is always going to be the race leader. Yep. Everybody else benefits. Here comes the safety car. So because, look, it's allowed to go faster than the delta speed for the race cars, it overtakes the leader. And having found him, we'll stay in front. Uh, on instruction from the race director, we'll put the lights on and then we go to safety car procedures. Safety car procedures, safety car procedures. All cars to group. It's a funny echo in this room. Uh, so Alain Adon conferring what I was just saying. So now safety car having got ahead of the race leader. But this is the beauty. You don't have to wait and hope you get in front of the car. You can go and hunt for him. There's the leader. That's my man. Bang. In front. Lights off. I suspect it's going to be a fairly short safety car intervention because I think once they got the snatch rope attached to Rob Collard's Lamborghini, that car will be pulled away pretty quickly. And uh, maybe one, maybe two laps at most behind the safety car, and we'll be back racing. Green light racing, but everybody fifth, fourth, third, second will have benefited. And poor Christopher Meese, well, he's got it all to do all over again. But the benefit he will have, he will be the driver who will control the point at which this race goes green, as we saw Charles Vets do after that first safety car restart just after one lap. It's also going to bring Nicky Team into the mix, isn't it? It's going to allow Christian Clean potentially to close up onto the back of Christopher Hasser. So, uh, echoing John's point, that everybody benefits by closing on the car ahead. Incident between car 77 and 3 in turn 18 under investigation. Car 3, so Valdemar yes. Ericsson, not the Sky Tempesta. Mercedes, yep. as we erroneously thought. So, uh, to me, it looked like Rob Collard and the 77 Barwell Motorsport Lamborghini uh, was probably just at the critical point of turning in when you're breaking downhill, the nose is down, the back is high, and a very, the lightest of touches would be enough just to force the Lamborghini into that spin. That's how I read it, but if there's a replay, we'll bring it to you. Yeah, 93, I think, had got by already. So Jonathan B had made his move, and perhaps Valdemar Eriksson then chanced his arm, and it didn't pay off for it. But uh, Rob Collard then, really tough day at the office for Rob, because he was in the gravel in qualifying, and then he's been assisted off uh, down at turn 18 at Ravazza. There's nothing personal about it, is there? <laughs> yeah. Rob might be thinking so. But is he's from the School of Hard Knocks. He knows all about this. There's that little battle going on with... with uh, Molina and the Ferrari, John, uh, Jack Aiken and the Lamborghini, Neil, Nick Yellowley and Rob Bell and Nico Muller and Abedi Rigo. I mean, that group of cars from 10th all the way down to 16th place is going to be as tight as anything is going to be at the very front of the field. Yeah. So the field heads down the hill. So we lost two on the opening lap. 33 never got into the race. I think the WRT squad have officially retired the uh, Arnold Robin car, sadly. But uh, the rest of the field then getting set to go racing as soon as they possibly can. But once the circuit is clear, it might be another lap or so just to let them go quickly. You can see how much effort is still being put in to keep tyre temperatures and pressures up. Absolutely. I mean, the, the, the key will be getting back as close as you possibly can to certainly the tyre temperature to agree the tyre pressure. 
so that when this race goes green, you know that you're going to be able to charge into Tamborello and the car will perform, respond, do what you want it to do, not have a mind of its own. So we are behind the safety car then, and the field turns its way up towards the completion of lap 22, and it does so with Christopher Beese in the lead of the race in the Santa Lock Junior safety, safety car. car in this lap, safety car in this lap. Messiana, so the safety car in this time, says the race director. Safety car drivers on the ragged edge. I mean, that is yeah. a basic showroom bog standard RDR8 LMS. Uh, race cars, of course, with the braking, the aerodynamics, all the other advantages that they enjoy, they're just cruising around. So the Audi safety car accelerates up. It's a sort of road car plus, isn't it? It's, uh, not quite GT4 spec, but it's been worked upon to make it good to, to do the job in hand, which is to be a pretty competitive race car in its own right, really, to uh, obviously accommodate two people, because you've got an observer in the safety car as well as the driver, so there's a bit more weight than other cars. Yeah, it's probably not a million miles away in specification to a GT4 yeah. Audi, so, I mean, it's not a slow car by any standard, but compared to the full-on, full-race GT3, it's uh, a long, long way behind. Anyway... Anyway, we're about to get this race back into a green flag. Fries van Thor wondering, is his mate, his younger teammate, Charles Veerts, going to be able to nail that 32 ID and uh, take safety the lead back, off. the lead that they enjoyed in the opening laps? Lights out on the safety car. It will be in this time. And bear in mind, we're only a quarter of an hour or so away from that first round of pit stops. So uh, we'll just get a pattern emerging after the restart. What we need to think about the pits, the Rafael Marchiello is on his toes, he's almost on the toes of Charles Wicks because he's sort of urging him on to say, come on, come on, I'm ready to go. Yeah, but watch the Aston Martin, the 95, oh, he's gone, he's gone. Christopher <laughs> Meese has decided to go already. And that was even earlier than Mr. Charles Vert. He didn't wait, he went until he got the edge of the Green flag, green flag. Yeah. Now, watch the fourth car in line. That is Nicky Team. He is going to do all he can to take an opportunity, make an opportunity as they go down into Tamborilla, I fear the gap between the Mercedes and the Aston is maybe a little bit too big. But look, the Aston's moving one way. Raffaele Marcello in the Mercedes is not going to give him any opportunity whatsoever. But that was the thought that was in the, in the head of Nicky T. So out of Tamborella they come, and back onto the power there. Christopher Meese leads the way, six tenths of a second to the good with Charlwitz in second spot. And again, Meese tries to get a bit of warmth into the tyres. Nicky Team likewise pulls out, has a look, pulls back in again. But this is going to be a great battle, isn't it, between the two front-engine cars, the Mercedes versus the Aston Martin and Nicky Team. Look at the quicker as he dives to one side and then the other. Oh, no, you don't, says Rafael Marchiello. Elbows out, stuck them out to make sure that there was no room for Nicky Team to find. It's a bit like a rock on a hard place. I don't know who the rock is, I don't know who the hard place is, but that's these two drivers' personalities and characters. But just behind Christopher Hassa, right back on the tail of the Aston Martin, he will be watching those two going at it and thinking, if they get a little bit adventurous, maybe get a little bit physical, I'm in position. Christian Klein, Mario Engel back at the races as well, look, because they were delayed earlier on with Matt Markers ahead of them. Now they've been brought back into the mix against the Aston Martin. So Christopher Meese leads the way. Charles Wirtz then in second spot. Then March Yellow, then Team, then Hassa, then Klein, then Engel, small gap. Then you've got Klaus Bachler, Marius Stug, and there the Ferrari of Miguel Molina rounding out the top ten. Wrapping their way over the curve at the Variante Alta down towards Rabatza, they come now. Christopher Meese still trying to get away and build back that lead. Not a lot of time around the racetrack to you know, gather your breath. It's a bit frantic after these safety car restarts. So you've got cars you're trying to get on terms with. You've got cars behind you that are trying to put you another place down. Look at the 80, 38 McLaren, Rob Bell, tucking himself under the rear wing of the BMW. Waiting to see, there it is, the BMW is coming into view, there it is now, Rob Bell not able, to, the McLaren had been very quick in a straight line down into Tamborello, Ferrari's got to go to defence of Jack Aiken has now got Nick Lee once again, so Jack looking for opportunities, but in doing so he's to some degree disadvantaging himself, unless he's got a really clear shot into Tamborello or whatever part of the circuit he wants to do, he needs to be aware that directly behind him he will have uh, Dick Yellowley and uh, Rob Bell. 
So Rob Bell looking for a way past Yelleny. Jack Aitken making sure neither find a way past him. Miguel Molina is heading this long, long train of cars. So this is 10th place back. There it is, the Iron Lynx Ferrari, the Emil Frey Racing Lamborghini, both of which come out of the Pro Cup, as does the BMW behind, as does the McLaren. And then we also mentioned the next car in the queue in 14th because it's Nico Muller in the car that Valentino Rossi will get on board, presumably on the first round of pit stops to do the middle stint. I think that would be a correct presumption because then Fred Bavich will be in position to take over the car for that final one hour. Fred is extremely useful when it comes to doing the final stint of a three hour race. So the middle stint would be the, the I think, the, the, the sensible stint to put uh, Valentino Rossi in for his first race. I would call full-on professional GT race in his uh, hopefully a very long and illustrious career. When he drove in the championship in the early days, it was a one-off and it wasn't as competitive as it is now, that's for sure. Uh, it's a smaller grid size as well and of course what you want is your fastest driver in for the last hour in case there's a late race safety car and he can benefit from that. You don't necessarily want an inexperienced driver in at the start because you saw how crowded he was so as we were saying in qualifying, John alluded to it just now, the obvious place is to put him in the middle hour of the race. There goes the car anyway in 14th place, Nico Muller in fairness struggling to make progress from there but it's where you are at the end of the three hours that really matters of course. This year, a point for the pole position in each class has been awarded, and that, of course, went the way of Team WRT's drivers of uh, Charles Witt, Calvin Van der Linden, and Dries Van Thor for the Pro Cup this morning. The 20 Mercedes just leaving, or coming out of a Ravazza, so sort of move a bit sideways. So, again, the traffic. Oh, oh that was that contact into Tamburello for the three get speed Mercedes, and it's going to make that long trip all the way through the gravel to return to the racetrack at the exit of Tamburello. Let's look again. I think that might have been an assist from the Porsche. Looked like it, didn't it? Valdemar Eriksson in number three and Ralph Bowen in the Porsche 911. Now, uh, if it was contact, of course, the front of the Porsche with the radiator, sometimes you find that doesn't do any good at all and that comes some liquid. So Ralph Bowen's going to be careful now as well. It, it didn't look like it was a, what I'd call a big hit. It was a, it was a tap rather than a big hit. Hopefully with the Porsche, the bottom will part of the Porsche is the left front, the, left, the right front, because that's where the oil and water radiators are located. Um, and they're on the extreme outside edge of the, the front of the car. Down into the Vatsa 1, and this battle going on for the positions from 10th all the way down to 16th. There's the 16th place BMW. Neil Verhagen at the wheel of it. He absolutely dominated the esports race yesterday. He's finding this a rather different proposition because he's in the traffic, struggling to make progress at the moment. Was he driving his 50 BMW in the yep. esports event? Yep. Why is it competitive in esports and not at the level yet? And that's a question maybe somebody in BMW could help us with. Uh, indeed, indeed. Right, Valentino Rossi is ready as predicted for the middle stint. We were right, John. So indeed. he will hop on board. On the side of the helmet, Drudy performance. Matthew Drudy? I, was, I would assume so, unless he's got a brother. Well, I'm assuming it's Matthew Drudy, it's the driver coaching that's gone on. Yeah. So, we're getting ready, the point is, for the first round of stops. About 10 minutes' time would take you to the end of the first hour. 65 minutes is the maximum you can do in a stint. So you need to make sure that you don't do more than 65 minutes. A stint starts at, at the pit exit, or at the start of the race, and ends at the pit in line. But uh, with the way that it's a three-hour race and 65 minutes the maximum, then it should be fine for the teams to negotiate their way around that, especially in a short, sharp three-hour race like this. Remember, we've got six hours at Paul Ricard, and we have 24 hours of Spa within the Endurance Cup. No, we don't have 24 hours. We've got about 36 hours by the time <laughs> we top and tail the event. But don't let's go there. That's a, it's a 24-hour race. That's all the add-ons that extend it into a second day. I'll, I'll buy you a beer, John. How about that? Make up for it. Oh, down the hill. Pressure on the Porsche from the 99. So that's... Mario Sugan, yeah, the Audi. He's going well. He's doing very well. I mean, that looks like an overtake. And every car 31, track limits. Car 31, warning flag for track limits. It's another of the WRT fleet. Right, you reckon this is an overtake waiting to happen? I agree. Here it comes, John. No, it's not going to happen because couldn't quite... He needed to make get alongside well before they got into the braking zone and um, he couldn't achieve that so the Porsche consolidated its position but the pressure is there you can see clearly that the, the pace the Audi has is greater 
than the pace of the Porsche right now. So okay. Mario Zug is doing again another new face this season. Very strong performance. Uh, I'm indebted to Jamie O'Leary for clarifying that the Drudy performance is Aldo Drudy, who is a renowned motorcycle racing crash helmet painter. That's Matteo's brother, isn't it? Gonna be. How many <laughs> Drudys can there be in motorsport? <laughs> Thank you, Jamie. Right, 54, they're the Porsche of Klaus Backler, somehow keeping at bay uh, Maria Zug. But again, as you get to the end of the stint, suddenly a, a different battle starts to emerge, doesn't it? I mean, these two have been in this order for lap after lap, but it's only now, late in the stint, that finally the Audi is just about able to have a go. Well, it all maybe comes down to simply which car has been generous or kind on its tyres, and is the Audi right now maybe a little bit more beneficial from the tyre wear, tyre degradation than the Porsche is? I mean, you can see that the Porsche couldn't get the nose in to make the apex into Ravazza 1. So Matteo Drudi looks to me to be struggling, certainly with front end. Mike, Car where's the idea under behind? Looks like it's well hooked up. Car 8 under investigation for speeding in the pit lane. I think we heard that already about Mike Parisi. Rob Collard has just rejoined, by the way, uh, with all the gravel out of the bottom of the 77 Farwell. Lamborghini. Right, there's 54 going through. That's Klaus Backer. Marius Zug still looks quick. He's quicker through Tamburello than the Porsche is. I mean, he's right now under the rear wing, but no chance to pass going into Villeneuve. What I would suggest he does is keep station and think about positioning himself into Tosa so that he gets the run up the hill and tries to get alongside the Porsche. And then, as they get to the top of the hill, he'll be on the inside for Perrotella. It's a big ask. Easy to talk about from the commentary booth, arm check, quarterback and all that. So we've got that fight going on. You've also got Nicky Tim still trying to find a way up on the terms with Raffaele Marchiello then for third place. So Nicky Tim in his sole stint behind the wheel, makes the climb up the hill. Lead gap's coming down as well. Last time, Christopher Meese was only 4,000 quicker. Sorry, Charles Wirtz was 4,000 quicker than Christopher Meese, I should say. But the gap is eight tenths of a second as again here. Look, Zug is on the tail of Backler, but can't find a way by. I've just noticed coming out of uh, Acro Minerale the tail of the ass of Nicky Team for the first time looked to be less stable. Okay. So again, we're seeing with Porsche Klaus Backler, is it maybe just the tyre has peaked and there's no more grip? Is that going to be the same with the Beach Dean Aston Martin running behind? Uh, Raffaele Marcello and the gap is beginning again it's extending it's only by a very small margin but previously the Aston was running maybe half the distance it is now to the rear of the Mercedes so it's effectively now four for the lead thanks to that safety car period because two seconds covers the top four but with only five minutes until the hour mark are people going to keep the fight going are they going to Hold station and wait to see full what they can do on the procedure oh. of car 563 under investigation. Full course yellow procedure of car 563 under investigation. Right, 563 is the VSR Lamborghini being uh, driven at the moment, a fair way down the order by Benjamin Heaty, 25th. Uh, when Alan and I started talking, I thought, oh no, we're going full course yellow procedure, in fact, but uh, to refer to the earlier one and the transgression. And there it is. That's Benji Heinz. He's the Colombian. Well, who's off directly behind him has gone off the track of that one of the McLarens, I think. Ethan Simeone. Yeah, so Ryan Wide again on the exit. Easily done. It's tempting to think it's a quicker turn to the right than it maybe is. And if you get your tyres a little bit congested with whatever you've been picking up, that only enables you to run all wide and into the gravel and make a mess and whatever. So it's full course yellow procedure being investigated. Valentino Rossi arrives in the pit lane, ready to go. Yep. So uh, does that mean they're going to bring Nico Muller in imminently? I think it would be a good thing to bring him in as early as they possibly can to get Valentino into the car. The pit lane is empty. <laughs> what you don't want to be doing is a pit stop when the pit lane... Yeah, I mean, we're not talking about his... <laughs> whatever. But anyway, keep the pit lane as free as possible yep. to enable Valentino Rossi to get into the car. Nico Muller get out, and then he, he'll go back into the racetrack when it's relatively clear. Indeed, right, Nico Muller is, I think, in this time. You have the cheers. Last warning to car eight, track limits. Oh. Next step is drive through. 
Okay, number eight, Mike Parisi on the, the verge of a drive through Right, Nico Muller is in, Valentino Rossi in. It's not often in GT World Challenge that you hear the crowd cheer for a driver when he arrives in the pit lane. Valentino gets that honour, and he's about to get into the car. So he'll open the door and assist. There's a, there's a netting, which is a safety netting, which he then quickly released. So now Nico Muller will help Valentino get himself into the car. You've got a six-point seatbelt harness. You've got to get the crutch strap in position before you can attach the... The, the waist belts and then the shoulder straps. There'll be radio connections. I don't think there's a drinks bottle on board. There's the net being reattached. That's a safety feature, which is mandatory in all cars here this weekend. Nico Miller runs back to the WRT garage. His day's work is complete and the refueling is still going on. Remember we saw back, I think in Barcelona last year, teams being penalized by letting the car off the jacks before the fuel bowser had been removed there was a clear example of the bowser coming out then the car comes down to conform to regulation uh, there is no pit stop regulation time as such other than the fuel hose must be connected for 40 seconds so whatever else you do the fuel hose must be connected for 40 seconds rossi leaves the pits he's on track and he's got clear track yeah nobody behind him immediately and nobody obviously directly ahead of him the leaders have just come through the first four cars but there is valentino rossi first racing lap and uh, well let's enjoy it warning flag to car two and car 11 track limits now there is Valentino Rossi then, so of course the car drops down the order, but as everybody else cycles through their pit stops, then he will of course gain back places, and as John makes the point, with a clear road ahead of him, he can really push now. Yes he can, and that's a great way to let him build confidence, get back into a race, or start a race I should say, up the hill into Peratella, and look at the concentration on his face, the eyes, I mean, I often, well there's a couple of blinks, a couple of blinks in a couple of seconds, well, down the hill in towards Aqua Minerale, down the gears, turn the, the turn to the left, looking for the apex, just then climbing up over the hill, the back of the car wants to get a little bit wayward, pulls more gears as he climbs up towards Varianti Elta, makes the turn in, and oh, what's that, is that fuel? Well, that's a big fuel spillage on the, on the, whose pits are those? It is WRT, isn't it, number 31? Oh, that, that's a real leaker. Dear me, that's, I've not seen that level of fuel. And that's coming out of the overflow, overflow pipe. So the team and the officials having a word and the, the Imola fire crew, pit fire crew. They want to get something on that quickly yeah. because another car coming into the pits in proximity hits that fuel. They'll have a difficulty slowing down. So. so there is Christopher Meese going through. Valentino Rossi then. Still on the lead lap, just, but of course, in the next five minutes, everybody else is going to have to serve their first uh, pit stop. So, what he needs, it's going to be interesting to, to monitor his pace now relative to Christopher Meese behind to see whether he's able to drive away or he's going to be caught. Well, he's got fresh rubber on, yeah. which helps, but he's got a full load of fuel, which will offset maybe some of the gain of that fresh rubber. What he will hope not to happen is that the, lay, the, the, the four, five, six lead cars will catch him and be then he'll be forced to let them go through because he's going to be a lap down and then his own momentum might sort of take a, a bit of a hit. Of course, look at this another way. Uh, Valentino Rossi drives for which team? Audi. WRT. Audi. Audi, OK. The leader is from Santaloc and the second place car is from WRT. Perish the thought that a rookie should delay the leader. Well, at the end of the day, they're all part of a big happy family, but you can see that Christopher Meese clearly is catching up to the back of the 46 Audi as they come through very anti alta and well we're just coming we're just into the second hour of the race so i think we're going to see santa lock coming in very shortly and as we come down the hill there is our leader just a fraction under a second ahead of charles vietz in the second place wrt Audi, and then raffaele marcello who's had by my or by his usual standards a very non-plus yeah. drive. I mean, the flamboyance we see from, Valent uh, not from Valentino Rossi, that's too soon in his career to talk about Warning flamboyance. Warning flag to car 88, Raffaele track Marcello. limits. And he's just, as you heard, been warned about track limits, Raffaele Marcello. All right, Valentino Rossi goes through. That lap was a 
three, which is one second off the car's best in Nico Muller's hands. So he's first flying that one second away from his best. Well, I think he'll be very pleased with that. Yeah. And he's only going to get quicker as this stint goes on and the car gets lighter. Right, in traffic, much yellow dive bombs the Lamborghini. Nicky Tim tries to take advantage of this, but actually gets stuck there behind the slower car. He had no choice. He had to back out of it. He was going to go around the long way around and it wasn't going to work. He gets up the inside and he will have lost, what, maybe a few, a few metres. The Lambo was trying to come back, but uh, a pointless exercise because Nicky Team has consolidated the, the ground. Uh, had to go a little bit offline to get that pass complete, but now drops downhill from Pirantella and relocate or refocuses onto the back of Raffaele Marcello's Mercedes. So, Valentino Rossi is now 36th, but as I make the point, he'll gain an awful lot of the ground back again, given that everybody else ahead of him is going to serve their first mandatory stop. Some are doing so. Right, number eight, Mike Parisi, just to finish this one off. We've heard him being warned about track limits. He's also been looked at for speeding in the pit lane and has got a five-second time penalty to serve at the next pit stop, so it goes from bad to worse. That's the leader, that's Christopher Meese. And uh, he's going to bail this time. He's actually catching Rossi. Yes. Uh, yeah. Again, Charles Vets has decided to come in, as has Nicky Team. So, second and fourth place cars are taking the opportunity when the pit lane is still, in relative terms, not Car too busy. Eight. Five second time penalty on the next pit stop for speeding in the pit lane. So, that's Mike right, Parisi's penalty just being confirmed, I just mentioned. The 563 Lamborghini rejoins. So, not the leader in, but the second place car peels. So, and as John said, so does the fourth. There they both are. So that means that Meese now leads March Yellow. Just need to see whether the gap comes down any between those two in the sectors now that Raffaele has got clear road ahead of him. And the answer is yes, he does. He's four tenths quicker in the first sector alone. And he's gone through, so Valentino's stepped aside to let the race leader go through. He's got second place Mercedes bearing down, and he will also, and that's Raffaele Marcello, but all the top of the hill. Race leader being held up and the run down Car to eight under investigation for speeding in the pit lane. I'll say it again. I'm trying to step aside. 163 under investigation for speeding in the pit lane. I'll say it again. Go for it. Trying to get clear down into Akram Minerali, but not the easiest part of the racetrack to do so. So Mike Parisi continuing to be done for speeding in the pit lane by the sound of it. There's Benji Goethe's uh, Audi in, and the leader busy on the light to try and say to the slower cars, let me by, I'm coming through as he comes down now towards Rivazza, but he can't get through. Marciello, though, is stuck behind Valentino Rossi at the moment, so there's no way by there either. And you, you have to think that both the lead Audi and the second place Mercedes are coming in this lap because they are now 65 minutes into the stint and, yeah. well, even I can't claim to be Einstein. <laughs> Plus the fact they were stuck in traffic anyway, but yeah, it's the end of the drive time, so in they come. And so those that haven't yet stopped have got to be in soon. They've got half a minute in which to be in. Right, who's taking over 95 is the question, because that is now another car to watch for the stint. 95, Marco Sorensen, thank you, is behind the wheel of it. Right, out gets Mies. Interested to see the interaction between the Aston Martin and the 32 Audi. Warning flag to Cal. 563 for track limits. Warning flag 563 track limits. Kelvin van der Linden behind the wheel of the Audi, who we know is an absolute hot rod when it comes to dragging performances out of an Audi anywhere, any place in the world. Uh, and Marcus Sorensen behind the wheel of the Beach Dean Aston Martin. So we will need to wait and see. We can't see the ass now that are ahead or behind the ID. So 88 Mercedes there. Danny Junkadea takes it over. Marco Sorensen we just put into the Aston, haven't we? And number 32 then, as you see, is back on track. Heading up towards the completion of the lap. So Kelvin van der Linde, winner here two years ago, is behind the wheel of the... WRT entry and look he's found himself as much clear space as he could possibly wish for but there is the Santa Lock car that loses the lead so the WRT entry goes through the Mercedes stays ahead of the Aston well there's been a change for the lead but third and fourth of row and through he goes Marcus, Marcus Sorensen has gotten past the 88 wow that was unexpected Danny Uncadillo is caught unawares by that pass that was a that was a Nicky team move opportunistic 
and seized the opportunity and made it work. But equally, of course, it was a long time before he was at the, the pit exit and could release the button in the Mercedes. Nicky Team's car, Marcus Sorensen at the wheel was on full noise. Yes, but remember, that's right, they'd done a, that out lap, so they yeah. were up to speed and trying to look, weaving around uh, Danny Uncadella, but he, he was caught napping in a sense. Yeah. Just on that, so coming out of the pit lane and finding himself under pressure from the Aston Martin. Now, Sorensen is closing up to the back of the Audi down the hill into Aqua Minerale. These two cars, one's done an extra lap, so its tyres are up to temperature. The Audi will be attempting to get there as quickly as it possibly can. The chance for Sorensen to jump and take that position, second position away from the Santa Lock Racing Audi. So, race leader, once more, is number 32, Audi. And uh, 52, the black and white flag for track limits. Trying to break clear, and he can do so while that battle goes on behind him. So, oh. right, sorry, John. This is uh, Valentino Rossi you're on board with, and he's now caught 63 Lamborghini Albert Costa. So, Rossi now is up into 14th place. Well, catching Albert Costa is a pretty good effort already. So, the run now from... Very anti Elsa then under the bridge, down the hill, into the braking zone. So Rossi, everything looks very neat, professional, tidy. What can he do with Albert Costa in the Lamborghini? It's both got the same power units, just a different rocker cover. One says Audi, one says Lamborghini. And you can see there's marginal gain towards the Lamborghini, just in straight line performance, but into the braking zone coming into Tamborello. The gap will close, as you see, but then once they exit Tamarillo, that gap will probably return to where it was before they entered into the three-corner sequence. Well, maybe it's fractionally less. Now, Valentino Rossi, not only is he a multiple world champion in motorbike, he's a racer. Yes. You, you, don't win, you don't win all those world championships by being a motorcycle racer. He's a racer, full stop. Well, bearing in mind, Albert Costa has done many a mile in a Lamborghini GT racing, and Valentino Rossi is racing this car for the first time. He is taking the fight to him, and I think people in the WRT garage approve. He ran a little bit wide in the exit of Trossa, and you can see that that... Oh, and again, wide over up at uh, Peritella. Right, oh. this is for second place. Look, Lucas Legere versus Marco Sorensen. Sorensen, more experienced driver of a GT car, and he lines up to have a go. Is he going to be able to make the switch back? Well, he goes for the outside line into Rivazza. Wide in, tight out. He wants the undercut for part two of the sequence, doesn't he? But he can't do it. Can't really do it. Not with a competitive car. It's too easy to use the racetrack to your advantage. But now he will look at getting a run on the Audi coming down onto start-finish straight. It's a, it's a dog-leg straight, in fact, start-finish line and finish line. So, going one way, going the other way, will he try and dive up the inside of the Audi going into Tamborello? Has to cut out to the right again to try and give himself the better exit out of this three-corner sequence, as the Audi had to go defensive, so this is going to be marginally to the advantage of the Aston Martin, but in tangible terms, no gain. So, nose to tail they run. So, Lucas Legere giving away, as I say, a lot of experience to Marco Sorensen, how long can he keep him at bay? All of this, of course, plays into the hands of van der Linde, who is already 4.8 seconds to the good. So it was a quicker pit stop than the Santalot car. 1 minute 23.8 versus 1 minute 26.6. So as ever, WRT absolutely on the money in the pit stops. And so Legere losing the lead in the pits, losing time on track as well, especially because he's having to defend from number 95. Marco Sorensen at the wheel, it was Nicky team behind the wheel, and Nicky, work done, is with Gemma. Nicky, that was an incredible stint. Did you enjoy it? Did you guys enjoy it? That was a lot of fun. That was a lot of fun. A little bit door banging with Audi down the straight. Sorry, that was not on purpose. But uh, yeah, it was fun. That's what we came here for, and uh, that's actually what I'm looking forward to, like three hour sprint races, banging doors with each other, and. Uh, still doing it uh, the fun way, so um, yeah, just really, really enjoying it. Well, Marco's finally got the position now. Yeah, yeah. Now uh, my Danish Viking friend is uh, is on it, so let's see. The podium looks looks good, and still, um, yeah, oh, halfway to go. So I guess there's a lot to go for you guys as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. you can't not warm to him, can you? No, look, if you ever wanted to make a remake of that classic movie from the 50s called The Vikings, starring Kirk Douglas. <laughs> <laughs> there is your new Kirk Douglas. His name is Nicky Team. Great character.
grinning from ear to ear and looking forward to more door banging, he says. Gosh, don't let the race director hear you say that, Mickey. He can't, it's still, though, Marco Sorensen can't get past this Audi. He may have jumped over the Mercedes, in other words, get past Danny from Judea, but uh, he hasn't cleared Lucas Legere's Audi, and the lead gap going up all the while. So Marco Sorensen needs to try and get on with it. Look who's fifth, Luca Giotto in the Audi he's taken over from Christopher Hauser. There, look, the red and white car, and he's in the mix as well. Look forward to see Giotto behind the wheel of a GT3 car. We know his experience and exploits in Formula 2 and other single seater racing. That's a difficult moment for Leisure to find his way past the Audi down the hill in, and he can't do it, and that's going to, in theory, work to the advantage of the Aston Martin. He should get a little bit better drive off the corner, up the hill, out of Aqua Minerade. The Audi is compromised. The Aston's trying to go one way, and there's a fairly blatant block. And that was a tense moment for Leisure He now is going to have to deal with Sorensen, who will be pumped like you cannot believe. But Junkadea has closed up as well, so he is back at the races now, so the gap's come down. Here they are heading downhill once more. This is where Sorensen again goes to the outside line. He did it a lap ago and it didn't work, and again he wants the undercut, but he's got a face full of Audi. But he had to go to the, to the right because he was closing too quickly on the rear of the Audi, so to avoid any contact, he had to pull out to the right, and that now putting the Mercedes uh, into a Pops possible position to look at making a manoeuvre. Danny Yunkadela in the third of these three cars coming into screen. Well, the Aston has pulled out sufficiently on the pit straight to stop any opportunities for Yunkadela to think there's a positional change up from fourth to third. Didn't happen. And directly behind Luca Giotto. And this is going to be fun to see what Giotto can do because coming from a very combative race series like GP2 or Formula 2 as it now is, He's going to be looking for quick action and to find a way around the 88 Mercedes. But Legere, in his second season in the championship, drove last year for Santa Lock. He's doing a very good job. Last one in car two, at bay. next step is drive through. Last one in car two, track limits. So more back markers and more cars lower down the order for track limit dramas. Eight Lamborghini has had a number of pit stops. Mike Parisi still shown as being behind the wheel of that car, which he shouldn't be because he's run out of drive time if that's the case. So maybe that transponder's having a glitch. Right, it is Legere second. It is Sorensen third. Jean drops back a bit. Fourth, fifth is Luca Giotto. And six, the number two. Warning flag to car 99, track limits. Stein Scott Horse there. Now he's just had a warning about track limits, but he's in sixth place in the Mercedes. And seventh is Vincent Abril. So, in other words, number two Mercedes jumped the 111 McLaren on the last round of pit stops. And 99, Alex Arca uh, is next to the queue, leading in silver cup. Incident the between cars 63 and 38 in turn 19 under investigation which is the Albert Costa 63 Lamborghini and Marvin Kerr, uh, now Ollie Wilkinson, in the Jota McLaren 38, which has dropped back into 16th place. So the car in six, just to make this point, Stein Scott Horse, the pink Mario Engel, Lucas Stoltz, co-driven Mercedes, on its last warning for track limits. So it's pretty significant, that in sixth place. Gold Cup leader, Benjamin Lesset, in the Boots and Racing Audi. He's taken it over from Adam Itiki, and that means that Karim Auger will do the final stint in that car. So, good performance all round from the Bootsen uh, team. And a big change from running, oh, I'll just say that, but flirted with the gravel on the outside of Ravazza too. Big change from running the BMW over previous seasons. And uh, I would say, overall, this lineup looking competitive in this category. Definitely so. Over the timing line then goes Benjamin Lessen. Another experienced driver of GT4, GT3 machinery. Comes now up through Tamburello. But leading the Gold Cup with two cars between himself and then Florian Schultzer in the Mercedes. This is in Pro-Am, the AF Corsa Ferrari. Stefano Costatini is currently the class leader and in 40th. And if you have a look on the timing tower on the screen, you'll see the positions within the class. Valentin Pierberg is chasing him in the SPS Automotive Performance Mercedes. Miguel Ramos uh, runs third for Garage 59 in McLaren. And then Matteo De Romagnano in the... Uh, Bentley is fourth in Pro-Am right now. But looking good this at the moment for Costatini, who knows Ferrari's inside out. Yes, and, and again, got look, clear air directly ahead of him. Nobody within a country mile behind him. As we go back to the 46. So Valentino Rossi now behind the wheel for the best part of 15 or so minutes. This is the view from the cockpit of the 46 down into Ravazza 1. 
And can I just mention that Rossi's last lap was only six tenths slower than the best that Nico Muller did. Getting better. That's not bad at all, the, is it? The more track time, the better. And maybe also going out and doing a, a sort of a close your eyes and hope for a good time qualifying lap, settling into a race, getting your momentum, building your confidence primarily, and maybe that's where Valentino Rossi right now is going to really shine through. That's wide with him here, John. He's out of Tamburello. Out of Tamburello, then the short run down into Villeneuve, a quick left, but then a much slower transition back to the right. And you're only out of the left before you're turning right, so easy to overrun on the outside into the gravel. Then another short burst up into Tulsa. You can take a late apex, as Rossi is doing here, to try and get the best drive up the hill. Maximum acceleration possible then. Stay to the left, then cut across it. If you're driving, you can't see where Piratella is until you get over the top. And then there it is. It's a double apex corner, an early end. Run wide and then come back. They're clipping the second part. Warning Run flag down the hill 19, into track limits. Rally. The last warning for track limits to car 14. Next step is track two. OK, we'll delete going through Akron Minerale and up now into Variante Alta. So just keeping an eye on the rear of the yard ahead of him to make sure that no mistakes are being made. Then the run, a sort of, you can, you can relax momentarily in this part of the racetrack under the bridge down the hill. But here, this downhill braking, easy to outbreak yourself. You need to get the nose of the car right on that curving on the inside. Likewise for Ravazza too, it's a slightly different con contour of a corner and there you are on to the main street again and it's I suppose it's sort of even Stevens between the two cars and in 14th place Valentino Rossi and yep the gap is just six tenths of a second so down towards Tamburello they go weather's changing a little bit brightening up a touch plenty of touch please please with a warm up <laughs> finally uh, so Valentino Rossi, as I say, his, his uh, previous lap, six tenths adrift only of what Nico Muller had been doing in his stint. So very, very impressive. And as John makes the point, the more he spends in the car, the quicker he'll get. Now, number 50 BMW there is being driven by Max Hesse. He's on the back of Leo Roussel's Emil Frey Lamborghini, and they are squabbling for 15th place. In other words, this is the train behind uh, Valentino Rossi. 98 BMW there, also looking for a way back through the traffic. Nick Katzberg at the wheel of that car that's only 23rd. I've got to say, where did they lose all their time? Because that car was running in the top, well, just, just around the top 10, top 12 or so, and it's dropped all the way down, I mean, way beyond where the car would automatically expect it to see it. So Max Hesse, part of the... BMW Junior squad that drives that number 50 BMW. Why is it number 50? Because this year BMW celebrating 50 years of the BMW M brand and the M4 hops over the curb, powering its way now down to the pressure of that, sir. Leo Roussel then for Emil Frey Racing, just being able to fend him off as they drop over the rise there down towards Rivazza this time, John. Yeah, Max Hess is looking every which way he can to try and uh, pick up. Advantage runs the curb on the inside, dabbed the brakes, or certainly the brake lights came on as he went through the second part of the Ravazza. Had the potential to gain a little bit of ground, but had to, I think, check up on the car, so not really going to be in a position to make a move on the number 19 Lamborghini as they come down into the braking zone. Leo Rossell will breathe a sigh of relief because I think he might have felt that he would have been challenged. And who's been going through the gravel? At Tamburello, naughty, naughty. A lot of gravel, a lot of dust still settling. So Leo Russell, LMP2 champion in the ELMS a good few years ago, keeping the BMW at bay. So we are heading towards the halfway mark in this three-hour race. Still a lot to pan out. But Kelvin van der Linde, lest we forget, leads. And he is 7.3 seconds to the good. And he's continuing to build that gap over Lucas Legere, who is busy trying to defend from Marco Sorensen and therefore he's losing time as, look at this, Valentino Rossi now has caught his teammate Jean-Baptiste Simonard, another of the WRT Audis, so Valle here going for a place. A, a racing overtake, no, no benefits from pit stops or whatever, this will be a race. Want to see what his race graph is like, we know his driving is pretty good for the first outing here with WRT Audi, now we want to see what his race, we know he could overtake on two wheels. <laughs> 
and different skill altogether to doing that on four wheels, but undoubtedly learning on the job big time. Bit of a twitch from Simonau's car, welcome back to Simonau adapting to an Audi. He's got a good track record in Porsche Carrera Cup racing, particularly in France. But uh, Valentino Rossi then hunting down. The car ran out of the same stable of WRT. Up toward the line they go then. So the Rothko colours, the Gulf colours on the Audi goes through. That's the one with Benji Goethe having done the first stint. And the margin between those two cars then, half a second. So Rossi goes through. Now there's traffic up the road as well. Ahead of Simonau is the Garage 59 McLaren. So let's see whether Valentino Rossi is able to use the traffic to his advantage. So the Leon Lev takes him away. The rear wing just wobbles around a little bit though as he headed into the chicane. But at Tosa, he is certainly closing on the sister car ahead. No question about it. Yeah, so he needs to be looking a little bit further down the road than the Audi directly ahead of him because this is where the opportunities are going to come. And you have to be aware of track space, spatial awareness, really, so that if there is a log jam as they come up to lap one of the back markers, trying to dive down the inside, and it's always warm. And that's look, look what's happened. Rossi has closed up, not because he's done anything differently, but because the three cars ahead were tripping over one another. So now to the inside of the McLaren goes seven out. Valentino Rossi commits as well, not wasting time. There's no hesitation in all of that. He knew exactly what he had to do. Correct. That's racecraft. That's you only really get that from racing. Not driving a racing car. Down the hill he comes down on lap 46 here at Imola, the opening round of the Fanatec GT World Challenge Europe, powered by AWS Endurance Cup. The next GT World Challenge Europe event, the opening sprint race at Brands Hatch over the 1st of May weekend. And Valentino Rossi again hanging onto a slide, comes up towards the line. The gap stretched a little bit there as a legacy. Yeah, he got a little bit of oversteer in the exit of Ravazza uh, too. We saw that quick hand movement to correct it. Uh, in the meantime, that little battle directly ahead of uh, Schumannauer and Albert Costa. Well, that's, that's right, Costa's well down the road. That's one of the back markers. Rossi, ooh, that was nervous. Because he had to go the long way around the outside going into the first part of Villeneuve. That would be a part of the racetrack. There's plenty of Pirelli rubber on that outside line. So he got away with it. Now he's got to then refocus, get his brain. Oh, and the Lamborghini, and trying to get out of the way itself, drives off the outside of Tulsa Herpen. That was Jordan Witt down in 43rd place. As there, still hanging on to second, Lucas Legere. And he's actually just gapped Sorensen by a couple of lengths finally, hasn't he? So Marco Sorensen unable to find a way through. This is where the drivers start to grumble about the BOP because the cars are so evenly matched. It's really hard to get that extra tenth that gives you the oomph to get past. Likewise, Junkadea not close enough to the Aston and having to fend off the challenge of Giotto now. For me, Giotto of these four cars is potentially the one that might actually get a, a benefit because his car looks good. He's driving himself into this race big time. He's running behind the 88 Mercedes, but uh, I think if he can get clear of the Mercedes, he'll be on the tail of the Aston Martin in uh, a very short space. We well, may well achieve it, let's see, as the cars then now bring up towards the end of the lap. Still got this battle going on between Leo Roussel and their Max Hesse. Behind is Ollie Wilkinson in the Jota McLaren. Behind Ollie Wilkinson is GT4 graduate Cesar Gazzo in his Audi, and then Konstantin Tereshenko in 19th place as they file through. And again, Hesse, a little bit in the sense of one or two others, looks like it's quicker, but just hasn't quite been able to find a way past. Were he to get through, you can anticipate he would make some progress away from that Lamborghini. Yeah, again, looking at the BMW, it looks to me it's got a little bit more pace than the Lamborghini has, but wasn't, wasn't prepared to fully commit going into Parabolica, probably wasn't. Oh, we got the incentive to toss it. Well, side by side. Who's going to come out in front? It should be the BMW. The Lamborghini runs slightly wide, maybe has a bit more momentum as a consequence, but it's up the hill. The BMW should be in position to consolidate, but side by side, yes, the BMW is taking away one position. So he's gone by, gains the place, drops down the hill. So that's Max Hesser ahead then. 
and he's doing what was predicted straight away stretching yeah. that gap so now Ollie Wilkinson is the one that's going to come up onto the tail of the Lamborghini and see what he can do he is bringing with him of course uh, Cesar Gazzo and also Konstantin Tereshenko so life for Leo Russell might get really really tricky now yeah well he was the cork in the bottle but it's not been popped so we'll see how long it takes and there's the sister BMW which is way down and I, I don't know what was the reason for that car's uh, sort of drop is done on 21st place Nicky Katzberg behind the wheel he will certainly drag the max performance out of the 98 car nobody better behind the wheel of a BMW than Nicky Katzberg but Augusta Farfus would disagree with that clearly <laughs> and Dan Harper might in the uh, junior car the Northern Irishman but you're right uh, Nick Katzberg is a very accomplished BMW driver it's a new car the M4 GT3 so as the leaders boom past we've done 47 laps we've got as you can see an hour and 33 minutes to go this is the fifth of the silvers Michele Beretta for VSR Vincenzo Sospiri racing and Sospiri's team operating a couple of cars in the championship too, which is really good to see and Michele Beretta another experienced Lamborghini racer came out of Formula 3 did, did good things in the States in Lamborghinis in Super Trofeo out there coming back into Europe and has uh, certainly matured as a driver over the years. He's got a lot, lot better with more experience and being, if you like, loyal to one type of racing and one brand in particular. It's really done it good. He's got the 777 Mercedes behind. Alfaisal Zubair behind the wheel. And a regular to clear track because normally everywhere is occupied by a car. Number 10 then is uh, Benjamin Lesset, still leading the Gold Cup. Now behind him on the road is Thomas Tuyula, but that is a silver car. So the class opposition is 21 Ferrari and Cedric Sprazzo early, who is a long way back, actually, relatively speaking. So Benjamin Lassen hanging on to that class lead, doing a good job for the minute. Gold cup, remember, made up of either a gold or platinum driver, plus one silver, plus one bronze. But he needs to be careful. The exit up at uh, Variante Alta, that, doing that too frequently, you will get notifications. Race director Alan Adan has been on it all day. Notifications being sent out left, right, and center. There's the second of the Gold Cup cars, Cedric Sprazioli. Also done some Lamborghini racing stateside. And uh, plenty of GT and sports car experience over the years from Ferraris to Maseratis uh, in Europe and America. So he drops downhill, running second in the class. And then there's third, Florian Schultz, a third of the Gold Cup cars in the Haupt racing team at Mercedes. So Florian Schultzer, who in turn has got cars crawling all over the back of him, including Manuel Maldonado, then James Dorlin and Alfred Renauer and Oli Milroy and Teo Noe, also in the Gold Cup, those four. Another great battle pack raging on here. Yeah, you're getting little groups of cars all around the racetrack. Tyron going to go the long way around the outside. It's going to be a difficult pass to make it stick, but he's done it. He's got a little bit later on the brakes, enabled them to get that pass. Now, Kenny can pick himself up and get a good, clean exit through Tamborello, he has, so that was a good pass. Didn't think he was going to make it, but it suddenly popped up, and there it was. I think the Mercedes almost felt that I'm going to give up now rather than make a, a meal of it, and uh, yeah. the consequences which might have been more. But this behind him is also going to be under pressure from Barwell, and the fact that Barwell has been just overtaken indeed. Is that the 66 going up the inside? The, uh, that is, the, the Barwell Lamborghini was Alex McDowell in the okay. Collard car that lost a few laps because of its gravel moment. But if you look there, Florian Schultz is Mercedes. He's got the other Barwell Lamborghini. Now James Dorlin right on his tail. James, former McLaren Development Driver Programme and also uh, Porsche Cayman champion a couple of seasons back in the first year of the Sprint Challenge in the UK. Now, 25, Lucas Legere has fallen down the order hugely to 14th place. Now, what's happened there? Has he had an off? That lap is a slow one. And there it is at Tamborello. Off he went a long, long way off the racetrack. Well, that we saw the dust we didn't see the car but that is the car that went off at the exit of Tamborello so that explains why we had that cloud dust uh, a couple of laps ago so shame that because Legere had been doing a very good job what it has done though is released Marco Sorensen up into second place now what can he do about the gap to Kelvin van der Linde in the lead 9.4 seconds is your starting point and he's got clear air so no disruption from any car that he's following so he can Get on with his program. Car 163 and car 8. Five second time penalty at the next pit stop for speeding in the pit lane. 
163 and car 8. 163 is Michael Dorbacher for Vincenzo Sospiri Racing. 8 is Mike Parisi's Lamborghini again. Still shame, Mike, behind the wheel, but it can't be because he'll be out of uh, time in his stint if he's still in the car. So the transponder's not working either. So the, the dramas for AJS events, graduating to GT3, getting worse and worse. Anyway, back to the story. The gap between first and second has actually come down now that Sorensen yeah. has found that clear air. Not that he did anything himself to find it, but he's the beneficiary of it, and he's now just eight seconds behind Kelvin van der Linde, and we're just coming up to about the halfway point in this second stint, so a lot of work for Sorensen to do, and I've no doubt Kelvin van der Linde will be, be kept advised that the Aston is on a charge, and he's pulled a three-second advantage over third place, Danny Uncadella and the Mercedes, Luca Giotto has dropped back fractionally behind in fourth place in the Audi. That's Kovletta going out the wheel of the dynamic Porsche, up to eighth place at the expense of Nicholas Nielsen, who's just ahead of his teammate Daniel Serra. The two iron links Ferraris in the Pro Cup running together as they head now into Tosa. Valentino Rossi, who keeps going back to him, in 13th position, just 1.9 seconds behind the 12th place Schumannauer ID. So that will be another attention-grabbing opportunity for the Italian star. There is Albert Costa down the hill, so he is in 11th place, just eight tenths of a second behind Daniel Serra in the yellow Ferrari as it climbs up the hill. There you can see the two Ferraris running more or less nose to tail, the Lamborghini closing Albert Costa dives into the very anti alto look very committed in that move wants to get on terms with the two ferraris directly ahead and if he can get on terms you know who's going to bet against albert making that one of his well let's say ambitious overtakes deeper moves yeah 51 then here which is the nicholas nielsen ferrari so he does the middle stint in that car it is ninth overall and that is 97, the Pro-Am Aston, the second car, if you like, in Strife. Uh, Theo Newby, a new in the car, yeah. and that's a disappointment. Now, that was the one that had a puncture this morning, but that looked really grim, doesn't it? Yeah, now that, that looks as if it's uh, a major issue. We don't know whether it's mechanical, electrical, hydraulic. Uh, so many, and he's going to actually, I'm not sure he's even going to make it around a lap. It's in almost limp hone mode. And it's creeping ever so slowly up the hill out of Tosa. And, well, I'm not even sure it's going to make it to the top of the hill. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. So, Teo Nui's car crawls along. Will that mean another full course yellow? Now, if it doesn't make it to the top of the hill, let's hope he gets off to the left, off the racetrack. For sure, if that isn't the case, then he's got, it's going to be a full course yellow. Yeah, exactly. The car can't crawl off the circuit. No worries, drive. Nicholas Nielsen got a bit of a wobble on at the exit of Aqua Minerale in his pursuit of Pom Ledegar. Oh, not coming out. I mean, Nicholas Nielsen, if I'm thinking of Ledegar, still in the Ferrari. Nicholas Nielsen. And directly behind them is Albert Costa in the Lamborghini. The Bentley, of course, has been lapped. Porsche dives down the inside. That's Com Ledegar in the Porsche. The Bentley, just such a physically large vehicle, it's got nowhere to go, it can't really drive off racetrack. But unfortunately for Drive through Nielsen, penalty to car three, causing a collision. Drive through penalty car three, causing a collision. Uh, it matters not, Anna, because it's retired, I'm afraid, the uh, Mercedes in question number three. Right, look at this, John Nielsen comes hammering over the line, and he's right there, isn't he, on the back of the traffic? Yes, now he's slipped through, but it took him a little longer than he would have liked. He didn't want to lose the, the contact to the car directly ahead so that um, is, that's part of the frustration with endurance racing 52 cars on the racetrack maybe not 52 any longer so there is the Aston that's been pulled over to the side it's not particularly you wouldn't get good marks in your driving test for parking like that no but I think that's about as far as it could go really with didn't, the didn't even close the door no, that's, that's even a, a more heinous offense isn't it he's got it as far off the road as he could yellow flag there in the background of course and the yellow flags in sector two so uh, can that car be moved without the need to interrupt the race? Yellow flag in that zone at the moment. And we're going full course yellow. Yeah, full so course that, yellow is called for. I think it was inevitable. The car in its position 
And, oh, 27 spins coming out of Tosa. Five, four, three, two, one. Full course yellow now. Yeah. Jordan Ware. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah. So not only has he st spun it, he's stalled it, I think. Or he's got a problem which they be being unkind to say that he stalled it. Whatever the problem is, he, the two cars now at the same part of the racetrack are immobile, one off the track, one on the track, albeit to the left of the racing line and the exit of Tosa Bend. But, uh, so you've got one car stationary, one that's <laughs> stalled, and there's the leader. So, of course, this is uh, encouraging news for Marco Sorensen because if we end up going safety car for the restart, gaps will come down. Flip side of the coin, look at the traffic one back marker two back markers three back markers between the leader and the second place Aston Martin so even if they all bunch up it would still take him a while to clear the slower cars yeah and of course Kevin van der Linde will be the driver in the pound seat no sorry I beg your pardon in the euro seat a very Brexit we are in Italy after yes, all indeed, yes uh, when the race goes green he will control the pace of the race and he will gain that advantage, and that's a significant advantage with having three cars between the first and second place. So Kelvin van der Linde will be rubbing his hands metaphorically behind the wheel and thinking, happy days. Indeed so. Right, Jordan Witt uh, is trying everything he can to get the car fired up again. So Teo Nui ain't out of the race, that much we do know. Jordan Witt trying to get the car fired up. Goes the Bentley over the line now with Matteo Drobiano at the wheel behind Trombotti Simona and then Valentino Rossi right on his tail in 13th place now. I, don't, I wonder why, well, I suppose it's where are the snatch vehicles actually located, but normally you would expect one to be somewhere in the region of the Tosa Happen to get quickly to either the Lamborghini, but more critically up to the Aston Martin, the car that actually w was responsible for this full course yellow being issued. The Lamborghini was sort of a consequence of a spin in the exit of Tosa. Um, there's Valentino, just checking out everything in the cockpit is A-OK, -okay. a chance to relax. Catching his breath. Yeah. Oh, I think that's right, that was busy. Nobody told me it was going to be this <laughs> difficult, did they? I mean, I'm sweating like a racehorse. <laughs> well, I think he's enjoyed himself. Uh, he's still got 20 minutes to go. So, Valentino Rossi then, as I say, in 13th spot. Um, team there on the Radio 2 Valley. So this is an opportunity for dialogue to go back and forth. We understand that the 97 Aston Martin, uh, it was a gearbox issue. Now, whether that's a gearbox mechanically or whether it's the actuation of the gearbox, whatever it is, it's, let's write it up and say it's a gearbox issue. Big frustration for that car. And you can imagine the team thinking, right, well, whatever it is that's gone wrong on one, could it go wrong on the other? And, a bit edgy about it for another 95. See, so there is the uh, Aston being retrieved. The Lamborghini is gone, it so has. it must have got fired up. So we're now just waiting for the Aston to be removed to safety behind the barriers, and then we can go into a safety car and then uh, back to green. We're just over halfway through this three hour endurance event. It's been a, just over what an hour and 40 minutes of sprint racing, really. So that's why we have this full course yellow. Let's have a look at uh, the highlights of the race so far. You can see Tio Nui's car being retrieved, but uh, while we have this little pause, because as I say, we're going to end up with a safety car, because there it is, it's on track ready to uh, scoot them all up. We can uh, just remind ourselves what's been going on. And it began thus with the uh, car of Charles Witt blasting away from pole position. Christopher Lee's behind, and Rafael much yellow slotting in in third place. 51 starters in the end. They all managed to get round the first corner safely. We very nearly got away with the first lap. 
but then there was drama right at the very end of it after that. So Jack Aitken was able to work his way through on the inside of traffic, the Rover BMW alongside, but a good getaway, certainly, by Charles Witts. Huge field pouring through Tamburello. But for one or two, it would be the only lap that they did because the Iron Dames Ferrari was given a tag at the end of the lap. Spun around, some avoided, some couldn't. Quite a lot of damage was done and a number of casualty of all of that. Patrick Kroprinski, who was off into the gravel, and his McLaren, like the Ferrari, a lap one retirement. One or two others suffered damage, but the race got back underway. And as he did so, more shuffling of the order with the uh, car collection Audi gaining a place. And the lead changing when Charles Weir ran out of road, coming out of Tosa and fell back behind uh, Christopher Meat, also off the road, Adam Ateki, but he was able to regroup and get back into the lead of the Gold Cup. Jack Aitken under attack from the BMW behind. Contact between Nicky Team and Christopher Hassel as they came over the line, but eventually the Aston Martin would go by. In further strife, the number 11 entry around with Hugo Valenti, and how everybody avoided him remains one of the day's mysteries, but they did so by a Nat semi crotchet Bouncing out over the curve, Jonathan Quee, and off into the gravel, Rob Collard. That was another interruption to the race to get the Lamborghini out of the way when the race went back green. Christopher Meese ahead once more of Charles Witt, but Nicky Team looking for a way past Raphael Marchiello. The Mercedes and the Aston Martin absolutely nose to tail. Further down the order, Mario Sue giving a half time to Klaus Bachler. And the first pit stops came with Valentino Rossi jumping on board number 46. Safety car procedure, safety car procedure. We just got safety car back live at Imola, but this is the look back at the highlights with Valentino Rossi in the car, and he had a full lap virtually of clear air to himself. Up into third place, when Marco Sorensen jumping ahead of Danny Junkade as Mercedes on the exit of the pits, and then he made a big bid for second. Could not do it. Lucas Legere was able to fend him off, but eventually Legere went off the circuit and up and past him. Went Sorensen to second place, and Legere fell way, way back. He took 14th position. And then Theo Nui's car retired with mechanical gremlins, and that was the reason for the full course yellow that's now become a safety car. And the news from Aston Martin is that the driver reported he had lost gears. Uh, we don't know why until we look at the car, say the team, but it is a loss of gears. Uh, but no dramas for the sister car number 95, which is good news, the team that reports for us. So, out of harm's way, the uh, Aston. And so, now we are, as you've heard from the race director, under safety car procedure, which means that they can go at a faster speed. And it's still those one, two, three back markers between the uh, two leading cars now. And I hope it's going to be a relatively short safety car intervention because now the track has been cleared. Uh, it's just the formality of getting everybody back up to pace. Certainly the sky has opened up. It's almost total blue sky. Uh, ambient temperature will have been climbing as well, so there's not quite such a pressure to enable to give the drivers an extra lap or two laps to get yeah. to build up their tire temperature, tire pressures again. So hopefully, in a very short space of time, that safety car light will be extinguished and we'll be back at racing. And Kelvin van der Linde, look at him, he knows this race is going to get underway very quickly indeed, putting load, lateral load into the sidewall of the tires, as well as getting to the tread of the tire to get as much temperature as possible so that when it is green flag racing, he can get on it and uh, build up that lead. It was up to just under 10 seconds at one point when they came across the line the last time that was at 5.2 seconds. That was in the, the full course yellow scenario. Uh, so he lost a little bit of time to the second place, uh, uh, second place Aston Martin, but he's got the advantage now when we go into green flag. There's three cars between himself and that second place, Aston. Quick look down at the Gold Cup for a moment. It's still Bonjamin Lesson leading, but Cedric Sparazzioli is now directly behind him in the classification, 7.3 seconds behind. Uh, and then third in the Gold Cup is the Barwell uh, Lamborghini number 78, James Dorling, at the wheel of that car that he's taken over from Alex Malikin. Uh, intriguing, actually, James Dorling and Alex Malikin uh, drive for one team in this championship and then are going to do a British GT campaign with Redline Racing which is synonymous with Porsches, but Simon Leonard's Merry Men taking the British GT Challenge this year with a, a Lamborghini and James Dorlin and Alex Malikin will drive for them, starting in Alton Park uh, in a couple of weeks' time. Safety car in this time, then. 
not directly now because they're just coming up to the line but at the end of the next lap the race leaders have just gone over the beam there it is so this is the last lap for the safety car then we'll go back racing and Valentino Rossi here if he's on his toes has a chance of gaining places yeah and he I'm sure the team will be advising of what is possible and what he would hopefully be able to execute but it's uh, giving advice from the pit lane and being behind the wheel of a race car what Valentino Rossi certainly will not want to do is blot his copybook on his debut. So maybe an element of caution will come into any attempt at overtake unless he's clear that he can make that pass stick. All right, so Rossi then with Jean-Baptiste Simonau ahead of him. Now, behind him, in terms of a, a, a threat for position, is not that Mercedes. It is the blue Santa Lock Audi of the recovering Lucas Legere there. So, in a sense, Valentino Rossi doesn't need to worry about what's going on behind because it's a back marker. He just has to concentrate on getting past that sister WRT Audi. Let's see what the man's made of. Here Stand up there. on the chair, Valentino. <laughs> Let's get the job done. <laughs> You'd think John was sitting here with his uh, 46 hat on. He's not, I promise you. He's as neutral as I am. So, down they come then to the completion of what will be. Lap 57 will go racing this time. It's our third interruption. Safety car, lights off. The instruction. Oh, oh drama in the background, big, a big, big oh hit. Oh, dear, the, BMW, that's a 50. I think that's the... Oh, it's the Bentley. It's the Bentley. It's oh Matthew de Robiano, and that's not going to be the end of the safety no, car. No, no, no. That's process at all. That is a massive, massive safety hit. Safety car, lights on. We remain in safety car procedure. <laughs> no, no kidding, Alan. I'll tell you what, I well. think it's, it's more than a safety car. To clear the racetrack at the exit of uh, Aqua Minerale, that's going to take some time. A, to remove the Bentley, but also the amount of bodywork that is right on the racetrack, on the racing line, offline, any part of the racetrack. So we know it's the Bentley with the damage. Who did he hit? Who was the other one? Because Couldn't didn't tell. Yeah, I mean, that's the next one to try and pinpoint if we can. So we are going to go, for obviously, for more laps behind the safety car. Some of that was caused, I suppose, by people slowing ready for the restart and others not being aware. David, I can assure you, we will have the second round of pit stops before the racetrack is cleared. There's only yeah. 11 minutes to go before we come to the conclusion of... So... Now, let us try to work out from whoever comes into the pit lane at the end of this lap who else we've lost. The Mad Panda Mercedes has been in the pits for a long, long time, sadly. Sean Walkinshaw, and that looks like Jordan Witt. Now, he's been hit, no question about it, and that was the car that had, st had stopped on the track. It is. Couldn't get going. I just wonder whether it was an electrical-type gremlin, and if the car suddenly lost power, lost drive, there was nowhere for the Bentley to go. No, and even if a car just suddenly appears to stop and the Bentley's on, on throttle, but yeah. there is a trail of fluid coming from the, the back of the Jordan, I was the back of Jordan, back of the Lamborghini driven by Jordan Witt, but there's that right rear corner that took the brunt of the impact. Uh, the, the Lamborghini could crawl its way a bit further up the racetrack, but the, the Bentley, that looks like the entire front body section just shattered into a squillion pieces. Uh, you say the Lamborghini crawled up the hill, it probably got biffed there by the Bentley, but it's a big hit from that, it probably propelled it up the hill, but I know what you mean. Uh, it's a real, real shame that, but it may well have been, I mean, when you say what was the Bentley driver doing, but if the car ahead did have a problem and suddenly slowed without warning, there's not much you can yeah, do. Yeah, I mean, you get a car on throttle and a car going nowhere, and there's not a lot of space when you're running that closely in a, in a safety car, train of cars, where are you going to go? You've got cars basically boxing you in. Not literally alongside, but there's not a lot of room. So it was uh, coming over the brow down to Varianti Alta where the impact happened. So it's going to be uh, a good few laps before we can get uh, racing underway. Two cars to remove, but as John makes the point quite rightly, there's all of that debris on the road, and the last thing you need is to be running over that and doing tyres. Well, it literally was across the racetrack, so much carbon fibre had been and other cars coming they are coming they're stopping the cars have been brought to a standstill at the just at the exit of aquaman rally and i hope everybody has slowed down and i am assuming that there's the only way that they can clear the track of carbon fiber is to stop the cars on i've never seen this in memory happen before i've seen it and and, and, in uh, other events elsewhere but not in world challenge they're getting going at the top look I was going to say, believe me, the picture hasn't frozen either. <laughs> Quite. There's one, but one circuit car moving. Uh, of course, now you've got to hope that the car ahead of you gets going. You don't want to overheat. But uh, yes, they found a way through. 
and we all get going again. So the ultimate car park for sports cars, for GT cars. Wow. I mean, it was just an, it was an explosion of carbon mm. fiber. Mm. And I, I thought when I saw it, I thought the whole front of the car back to the, the bulkhead of the chassis and still cars are stopping at the exit of Aqua Minerale to cherry pick their way through. One at a time, tippy towing and trying everything to avoid cutting a tire down. Uh, such was the yeah. degree of the damage and the, the well, look at you can see it there. There's gravel on the racetrack. Where did that come from? But the problem is you're going to have that possibly lap after lap until enough of it can be almost blown out of the way. Marshals will try and get there and, and sweep it, but of course they're also engaged in trying to sort out the uh, two damaged cars. So uh, this has the potential to be quite a situation. It's going to take a little time to clear, as sure. Um, and of course the safety car is still running at a moderate pace and it'll be very quickly back up to the scene of the incident. Yeah. So whether we're going to see a further stoppage when they get to the exit of Ackerman or Rally to allow the, the corner workers to continue with clearing up as quickly as they pos best possibly can. Because there's no alternative, is there, to, to keep going on that. If it's a start line accident, for example, you can use the pit lane yes. and circumnavigate it, but there's no plan B here. No, there's not at all. So there is the Skechers Audi, and they're prepared already for an early pit yeah. stop. The earliest pit stop they could make would probably be in about another lap. That'll take them down to the 65 minutes for the final. And you can see teams, a lot of the teams are looking at making as early possible pit stops to get their car in, do the driver change, get back out. So Maxime Martin preparing himself to get in to the number 95 Beach Dean Aston Martin. Two very good drives from the two 95 Aston Martin drivers to date, Nicky Team and Marcus Sorensen there. You see the tyres for the 46. And Valentino Rossi, I suspect, will probably be one of the earlier pit stoppers. And again, this just great caution yeah. being exhibited by everybody as they get through that scene. And really, it's just... just Carbon fibre is a magnificent material, but when it decarbonizes <laughs> as it did there, yeah. it's the biggest pain for tyre engineers. Well, we have had now the uh, cars through the incident zone for the second time. The Jordan Witt Lamborghini has been moved out of harm's way. Um, with an hour and six minutes to go, the next round of pit stops is imminent. And with what could be a, a, a few more minutes yet of safety car, this could be for the teams how you win or lose the race if you make the pit stop call right. Contact between 107 and 27 during the safety car procedure under investigation. So look at this, virtually, not quite, but virtually everybody peeling in. And into the staying out is Marco Sorensen. So the, the Aston Martin now leads. Now that could either be the right or the wrong call. We'll see in a lap's time. But Marco Sorensen has stayed out for another lap, as has Alex Arca, as has Albert Costa. But you've got the first four, out of the first 17, 14 of them came into the pit lane. Jules Gounon is in as well. Yeah, I mean, the, the, I, mean I don't know. I would have gambled on staying out simply because. Um, well, he's looking for, for Valentino Rossi, looking for his pits. He couldn't see, can't see where it is. He almost came to a standstill on the way in. And I hope he hasn't over, over uh, shot his pits. He, don't undo the buckles. You can undo the, you can undo the straps. But oh, he, he's gone through. I he thought he had. I so thought he had. Right, so he's going to have to do another lap. He's back up to speed. So Valentino Rossi, yeah. Well. It's a new discipline to him, doing all that, you know, relatively. I know he's done a bit of GT racing, but it's relatively new. So, lesson learned, he's back out on track, but that's going to go against them. Yeah, and I think part of the problem was the, the crew on the 46 Audi maybe were not standing as visually, partly because there was traffic all around. So, you can't put a human being out into a very busy pit lane. And, of course, Valentino maybe looking but couldn't quite work out where he should be. 
so he's overshot and uh, had to re-tighten the seat belts, get back in the line of traffic and then go and do another lap and come in and hopefully this time there will be clear space and a, and a clear indication to where he needs to stop. The way that the mechanic with the board ran out, it almost made me think that perhaps they weren't ready for well, that's him either. The, that, that's the very point I'm making, yeah. that there wasn't a sufficiently clear... Uh, here we are, Valentino, mm. park here. But partly, as you say, the fact that the pit lane was busy, but uh, maybe they weren't expecting him on that lap. Either way, he's uh, had another trip through the pit lane and will return this time and park in the right place. Sometimes there are miscommunications shipped to shore that the team might say pit, 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 but maybe misunderstood by the driver or likewise the drivers thought he had heard something, pit, 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 and of course the team were not prepared for it, so I suspect it might have been one of the, the latter is the more likely one, but, um, well, listen, it's his first race and uh, you can allow a little misdemeanor of that nature, but it'll be very disappointing for him. I know that he will feel that uh, that was a, an error. So the Aston now coming in, and did the Audi come in as well? I didn't, did I see the Audi? No, there's the Sorensen. Oh, there's Valentino, was he? Pressing on. Yeah, so Sorensen's in, Acker's in, Costa's in. So at the minute, Barretta in the Lamborghini. It's Lamborghini one, two, and three at the present time, but they're yet to stop. So oh, look at the sun. Look, there we are. There is the signal. That's yeah. where we are. Here we are, Valentino. Look, look. Come on. Now we're ready. <laughs> yeah. Driver on the pit apron. Car controller on the on the pit apron as Ooh. well. And he's arrived. With, with a bang. <laughs> right. And he gets. Uh, Fred Vavish puts his little cushion in. Notice as well these days that they are effectively single pit stops, not the old days of two parts where you can only do the fuel and then do something else. Now you can refuel and do tyres and do driver change at the same time. I like that. That's proper pit stops. Absolutely. And that fuel hose connected for 40 seconds. Leader was in, 95, and there number 19, Lamborghini. Has that got a problem? Is that slow? Well, the Rouge is falling down. There he is. He's dropping yeah. down. He's got a problem, I think. So. So, safety car. And there is the Lamborghini looks coming. Oh, and no, another car stopping on the racetrack, or the Rouge, and that means we're going to continue with the safety car, I fear. So, Valentino Rossi takes off his helmet and can reflect upon what was a pretty impressive stint, it's got to be said. Yes, I think, I mean, he did all he was asked to do, and... Clearly, coming into the pit lane, the garage he was required to stop in wasn't made sufficiently clear. And this time you've got traffic around you, you know, you're looking, it's, it's not easy when you get such a busy pit lane. Yeah. Your, your pit box is not a very big entrance. You haven't got 100 yards on either side to spot it. You're coming down and it's, well, why did it not make it? Well, I think maybe the team in this instance might have done slightly better mm. in giving him a clear, as they did the second time around. Yeah. There was no mistaking Second time around where Valentino was going to stop. Well, it was a good stint on the track. And uh, right now the pit stops are cycling through. So what this has done is put 32 of now Dries Van Thorpe as effectively the best of those that has made two pit stops. But the other Audi of Jean-Baptiste Simonau is in. But there's his, his, car, his car controller oh, he's doesn't get close. a chance to come out. No. It's too close to the Audi coming in, so he was, if you like, blindsided, yeah. watching the car directly ahead of him and, and just simply missed his pits. But I think, likewise, the team could have been... Uh, but they couldn't because the, the Golf Audi was coming, coming in. in, so the, the, engine, the, the workers, the engineers, weren't able to stand out on that sort of mid-pit lane line. Right, two more in the pit lane. So the uh, field, you've got four back markers and then the race leader, which is now Dries Van Thor in Audi number 32. Jules Gounon is now second, Lucas Stoltz is third, Matthew Drudy is fourth, François Abril is fifth. The one that seems to have lost out the most on this is the Aston Martin, isn't it? By it coming is. coming in a lap late. Yep. Because Maxi Martin is way, way back in 21st place. Yeah, no, that's, that's a, a massive loss of track position indeed. 
and maybe that was the penalty of staying out a little bit longer but of course what has happened is they say that the Lamborghini the 19 that stopped on the exit of Vilner may well have played against what could have been a great strategy by the beach team team that might be the reason why they've lost possibly well your face says I'm talking rubbish <laughs> no 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 my face is I'm just pondering that um, but I think because everybody else pitted a lap earlier that they they've just lost track position out of all of that because the cars that were behind had got the stop done and were able to do that while the accident was slowly going around the circuit but it has certainly gone against them whether it's that or the uh, number 19 Lamborghini stopping on the track so we have Ben if you look in the queue the fifth car is the leading car in the race, the best of the two stoppers. So it is Dries Van Thor from Jules Gounon. But look at what's up to effectively third place now, the pink Mercedes number two. That's not really been a factor all day, but now after the last round of pit stops, there it is in third spot, Lucas Stoltz at the wheel. And there is a much clearer circuit. Still needs a bit of sweeping, I'll grant you. There's one line, not two, but it's much better than it was. And the, the, the Bentley has been gradually, gradually removed. Uh, to look at, look at the carbon fibre on the side of yep. the racetrack. I mean, on the grass on the left of our picture, I mean, it's just a, a sea of carbon fibre. So the, the, that part of the racetrack clearly uh, needs further retention. But with, what, 57 minutes remaining? Will it be another seven or more minutes before this race goes into its final segment, into the final what would be, would have been an hour, but it's going to be about 50 minutes, I suspect, of, of green flag racing in the hope that we don't have any more incidents. So the four cars directly behind the safety car, which are most of them heading into the pit lane, three of the four are at least, uh, of course, that markers. So we don't have the leader behind the safety car at the moment, but we did at the start of this procedure. So people will say, ah, yes, but the safety car's not picked up the leader. It had, but then everybody pitted apart from that blue Porsche, which is why it has now ended up where it is. So whether the race officials allow that... People have thought that car had to make another pit stop anyway, so it'll get itself out of the line. Yeah, and I would assume that they'll resolve the issue, and it'll be the lead car will be the 32 WRT RD Dries Van Thor behind the wheel. So, yeah, the Mercedes is behind, and Stoltz, I can't quite see. So, one, two, three. That is Dries Van Thor out of the Villeneuve chicane then on his tail, Jules Gounon ready for the restart, Lucas Stoltz in the pink Mercedes next, then there's a back marker, is that? Triple yes. seven and car seven under investigation for speeding in the pit lane. Triple seven and seven under investigation for speeding in the pit lane. I've got to say, it doesn't look like the Lamborghini suddenly slowed. No, I think I would agree with you on that. Um, the driver has been taken to the medical center to be checked over, everything appears to be, to be good. But uh, it didn't appear that the Lambo stopped moving forward. It, we wait to see when there'll be an investigation into that incident, and all involved will uh, no doubt give their evidence. So let's hear, shall we, from Valentino Rossi. He's no doubt enjoyed his first race stint. He's with Gemma. Valley, did you enjoy your first stint? Yes, it was good. It's, um, in the race, it's, uh, it's very different, but uh, I enjoy it. I did some, uh, some good laps. And uh, it's a shame that uh, I, I cannot finish because we say a lot, a lot with the, with the safety car. But anyway, the first experience was positive. Of course, a little bit of a problem here at the pit stop. What happened? Yeah. Did you just miss your spot? Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, I have a lot of confusion and uh, a lot of cars. And I've, unfortunately, I miss the, the pit. So we lose, uh, we lose a lot. Uh, this is experience. <laughs> and uh, it's quite different from battling on bikes. You enjoy it? Yeah, but... Uh, I have a lot of confusion, a lot of things happen, but, uh, but you can have a, a lot of battle and uh, when you stay on the track when, with, the, with the fastest one, you can, uh, you can learn, so it's good. Well, it's a fast learning curve, I'm sure. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. It's hard to know from that exactly how pleased uh, he is with his stint, because you get the feeling that so seriously is he taking this, he wants to do even better than what he's just done, which was not shabby at all. No, I mean, you've got such, you know, such a reputation and your own sense of pride and your your will 
to want to do something, even in your first professional race as a, a fully professional racing driver. You know, he will go away and think about it, and every every lap he'll analyse. He'll do it with the team. He'll do it on his own. And I mean, the incident in the pit lane is understandable. He was blindsided by the sister car coming in directly ahead of him. Feeding into pit lane. Now the safety car is going to be in at the end of this lap, so we're going to go back to racing. And as you will have seen, now it is the lead car behind the safety car. So the uh, Porsche in question, it was Patrick Matheson, has uh, pitted. So we've got 53 and three quarter minutes to go. 22 is under investigation for speeding in the pit lane. And number 22 then is the Porsche in question of Patrick Matheson I've just mentioned. So fingers crossed this time we're going to be OK for a green flag because the lights will go out at the next part of the circuit. And it was here, of course, that we had the uh, dramas a few minutes ago. But the safety car is in at the end of this lap. But there's still a, a residue on the racetrack, you can see, just to the left of the screen from that com from that contact. Lights off. Right, lights out on top of the safety car. Eddie Cheever at the wheel of the Sky Tempesta Mercedes hustling on. And currently in uh, 38th place then, running in the Gold Cup. Right, so Dries Van Thor versus Jules Gounon versus Lucas Stoltz. This is going to be tasty, isn't it? Here they come. Now for Rivatsa, Dries Van Thor trying to get the tyres up to temperature. When does he go? When does no, he go? he's going to go now. No, he's not. He's been patient. He's backing him up. Backing him up, backing him up. Is he going to go now? He ought to be thinking about going. Yes, he's going now. He's off. And a bit of a twitch as he applies the throttle. But here he comes then. So Dries Van Thor leads. He's got 52 minutes to change on the clock. We come steaming up over the line. This, if it wasn't a sprint race before, sure is now because with everybody that released, this is why you need your fastest driver in, in case of a late race safety car. It's flat out to the checkered flag from here on in. And Matteo Caroli trying to move around the outside, a difficult pass on the Ferrari side by side. Yeah, it gets passed. So Caroli did a good job coming into Tamburello, gains a position. Does indeed, so Matteo Caroli ahead of James Collado goes six. The lead is getting away though, isn't he? Look, because Dries Van Thor opens up the gap slightly on the way to the Villeneuve chicane from Gunnar Stoltz. Then next up is Matteo Drudy in the car collection car. Really good debut in the championship for car collection. And uh, it's 1-1-1, shown as Vincent Abril. Dennis Lynn should be in that car now. Anyway, the 111 McLaren in infringement fifth, of five, six, three, uh, no fifth place, action. and sixth is now Tyrone. And the incident between 63 and 38, no further action. Right, so that sorts those incidents out. Three almost wide coming up the hill there. And round the outside goes the McLaren against the number 10 Audi, which has now lost after the pit stops its Gold Cup lead. The leading Gold Cup car now is number 21 Ferrari, Alessandro Balzan at the wheel of it. So the AF Corsa car, he's uh, relieved Cedric early and now Balzant leads the Gold Cup. Maxime Martin and the ass in the middle of that group of cars already making a position, got himself up into the top 19 when they came past the flag of the start. Contact going into the very anti Alta. I don't know that was uh, a contact or just sort of a self-induced error, but number 10, Ardi is losing Grand Karim Auger behind the wheel and uh, sort of got maybe intimidated yeah. coming up into the very anti alta Well, Maxime Martin, you're right, he is trying to gain places, but he's got a lot of them to make up because from being uh, second, the car's in 19th place, having stopped a lap later. That's the, the strategy that did pay out for them, and a spin there and some damage, 87 Mercedes stranded well, at the Rivazza. I'm not sure that left, uh, right front has not been damaged. It, well, oh, oh, it has. So the right front is damaged as well as bodywork on the racetrack, so again, we're going to have to see another interruption to this race with 50 minutes remaining. So bodywork damage, as well as I think the right front, maybe the suspension or the two or the steering arm uh, has popped. Well, that was Casper Stevenson at the wheel, fresh into the car. He was impressive in a Mercedes in the Gulf 12 hours, but we're going to go full course yellow again, unfortunately, so we've only just got going. Five, and now we need another four, interruption because three, of this incident. Two, one, full course yellow now. Well, Safety cars breed safety cars, don't you know? And so it's inevitable in a way. You get everybody bunched up, and so you have these fights. People want to make places, and then there's contact there. Right, so number 87 off the road, 88 second. Danny Juncadea in the pits with Gemma. Well, Danny, this has been an eventful race so far. You guys now up into second. Yep, 
it's looking good. Uh, you know, it's uh, such a long race. Well, it's an endurance race in the end, three hours. And with the strategy, it worked out pretty well on the last stop, and we gained a position then uh, also on the last stint. Because we dropped one on the previous pit stop to fourth, and luckily now we're back into into podium spot and even even better in second, so it's looking good. That pit stop, Jules didn't look very happy at all. I was with him on the pit wall. What's your take? Yeah, I think it was, uh, was close. I think the Santelo car had a slow pit stop and we could have we could have passed we could have really went for it but i think we took the safest option which was to avoid an unsafe release or a potential unsafe release and my engineer helped me for a few seconds so we, we lost that well we, we could have gained that position and when, when then we lost the, the position with the aston martin on track on that exit uh, but in the end you know it, it's a long race so it's better sometimes not to risk it too much and we are we're again into second so keep pushing thank you yeah. Cheers. Well, again, if we go safety car, as I'm sure we will for the restart, the gap will come down, so that's going to give Jules another chance to make a move against Dries Van Thor. But he pulled out quite a margin, even on the uh, few corners that we'd had of, what, a lap and a bit before the uh, full course yellow was, was called for. Yes, and it all began at the exit of Rivatsa. You saw that Dries Van Thor was on it very hard in back end of the car. Didn't seem to like the amount of torque going through the rear wheels. It objected to step right sideways, but uh, it gave Dries Van Thor the better run down this pit straight into Tamarillo, and he was able to stretch that advantage, and it's 2.9 seconds, but that's when they came across the line after the first flying lap after the last safety car intervention and full course yellow. I hope this is not going to be the pattern for the remaining 47 minutes, because as you have pointed out, David, when you have periods of safety, safety car... Safety car procedure, safety car procedure. It's a question of tire temperature, brake temperature. So full course yellow has been rescinded. It's now a safety car, so everybody again getting back up to speed. So maybe, maybe this is going to be a relatively short safety car intervention and that racing will get back again as quickly as possible. Thomas Neubauer first in silver category in the 30 RD. That's the car that he's taken over from John Baptiste Simena and Benji Goethe, who drove in the first stint so the cars then quicken their pace now that they are behind the safety car safety car is this lap they're hanging about then so uh, very very quick safety car process to just bring things up to speed up to temperature and then let them go I think we want to see racing I think all these safety car interventions of all three of them come one after the other and I think the intention is to try and get cars back racing as quickly as possible and in the process and you know, try to keep the temperatures of the tyres in particular at a, a level where drivers have got the confidence to push once the track goes green. Vigorous weaving again to try and get temperature up in the tyres. So quite a number of retirements. Safety car lights off. And uh, from our 51 starters, we've got what? Effectively 40, I think, now still circulating, about 39 now still circulating. Lights out on the safety car. Right, Dries Van Thor, a good restart last time, but of course, Jules Gournot is wise to what he's up to now. I hope he is. <laughs> so, Jules, let's see what you could do. Lucas Stoltz there in third place. So what was a 50-minute sprint before is down to 45 now. So is, is Van Thor going to do the Green same flag. thing that we saw one lap earlier, or two laps earlier? Looks like he is. He's on it again. He started slightly earlier than he did previously. Van Gournot's well, it's, I don't know how much... It's not bad. He's had a good start. He's, I think he'd be happy with what he's done. In fact, it's Lucas Stolz is maybe the one of the three lead cars that's dropped back and is under under pressure from Matteo Drudi in the fourth place ID. So they come over the line then, and we go racing again. There, one 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 the Avril Lind and uh, pushing clean. McLaren looks for a way to get past number 12 of Matthew Drudy, who's a little bit stuck. He goes a little bit wide. The McLaren goes one side, then the other. Way out up towards the kerb goes Drudy to the inside line. Tries to go the McLaren. He can't find a way by. Can he? Can he? Not quite there. So under huge pressure now is Matthew Drudy. As Dennis Lind is behind the wheel. I think so. It still says yeah, Avril so on the screen, but I'm sure Dennis Lind hasn't driven yet. No, he hasn't. So I'm sure Dennis is behind the wheel. He's got a Dennis Lind feel to it anyway, it hasn't it? It certainly does. And again, close as you can be up the hill. Out of Tosa Heppenbend and Dennis Lind very much on the programme at this restart. But now that Matteo Drudy's completed you know, part of the opening stages, gaining a little bit more 
I suppose, confidence simply knowing that the car will be with him when he leans on it. Second before Porsche, Matteo Cairoli at the wheel. Over the brow, hunting down Dennis Lind, reigning British GT champion, the Quick Dane. Former Lamborghini factory driver, but now a gun for hire. And uh, with the JP Motorsport McLaren going well, that car showing the Jota car the way home. Yes, it is. And uh, the JP Motorsport have done a very good job with these very brightly coloured black and gold. Uh, Lamborghini is. The rest of the field all filing through. The number on the windscreen that you see is the Lumirank display telling you what position the cars are in outright. There goes 1 1 1. So Dennis Lynn up towards the timing line. This will put 68 laps in the book. You can see on the clock just over 43 and a half minutes to go. The leader, Dries Van Thor, six tenths of a second to the good. Still Nicky Team, the man with the fastest lap of the race, but his car now is Maxime Martin at the wheel, way, way back in 18th place after that effective wrong call on the strategy coming in a lap after everybody else. Just watching Dennis Linden, the McLaren running in fifth place. These cars, these McLaren 720s, are going to be a real threat throughout the season. Ten They're showing. 10 second time penalty. 10 second time penalty to car 22 at the end of the race for speeding in the pit lane. So that's the Allied Racing Porsche. So, oh well. Here we go up the hill again, up into Peratella. Oh, wow, just about managed to get through there without contact. It's always a tricky move. Always a tricky move up the inside into Peratella because your driver on the outside and the Driving racing line has always committed. He's uh, stable and conscious. He's going to the hospital for a check. Going to the hospital for a check. So that's the news on uh, Matthew Robiano in the Bentley from earlier on. Right, the gold cup battle is on here. This is Robert Renauer who's now got himself up past Alessandro Balzat on this lap, so new class leader in gold. And not only is Robert Renauer ahead, look, he's storming clear, isn't he? Oh, yeah. Gap. yeah, he's pulling clear comfortably. And he's, yeah, no, he's in, I would say, right now, in very good position. So Robert Renauer building the gap all the time. There are the race leaders. Now it was six tenths of a second on the last lap. And as they come through now, the margin nine tenths of a second. Again, Maxim Martin carving his way through the back markers. He's got himself. He was in. He's in 18th. He was 19th. Now he's up one more place. Merkel Portolotti is the car that's going to be either he's just overtaken or is about to try and make a move. So Portolotti, three tenths of a second behind Martin in 19th position. That's a way, way out of position for Merkel yeah. Portolotti in the 63 Lamborghini. So just by pitting a lap late, uh, the uh, car falls down the order. It's behind the gold cup, it's behind a number of the silvers. Big, big shame for the Beach Dean AMR team. So 41 minutes just under still remain here at Imola. Van Tor to Gunon last time, nine tenths of a second. The lead is creeping up again. So the Carbons on, or started the race on pole, leads now. Trying to increase the margin, but what can Jules Gunon do? What can Lucas Stoltz do in third place? It's Audi versus Mercedes with the uh, Dennis Lind McLaren then in fifth place. Again, this group of cars that have been squabbling over, that was just outside the top ten, are pretty much back at it again. As they go down the hill into the Ravazza, there's a 98. Uh, Augusta Farfus behind the wheel, running in 12th place, running directly behind the 38 Georgia McLaren. With Marvin Kirchhofer, the man who set the single fastest lap in qualifying this morning, so he's got himself sort of locked in, in a position riding with the BMW, Augusta Farfus. So he's not going to be able to challenge. All he can hopefully do is use the fact that the McLaren's going to be slightly stalled out. No oh. contact! Oh, Madrea Drudy getting very racy with Lucas Stoltz, but not going around the outside and behind them, Dennis Lind thinks I want a bit of this action and he may well be able to get it. He's got himself almost alongside the Audi, but it's in the wrong part of the racetrack. He may make the undercut. He's bumping into the back of the Audi. Here he goes, tries oh. to get up alongside, heading up the hill, can't do it. Gets a face full of the R8. Now over the brow towards Piratella. Dennis Lynn to the outside line. The Audi covers that move. 
And where does Dennis Lynn try next? He's trying to force an error out of Drudy. They all run a little bit wide over the curb. Drop downhill. That gives Stoltz the chance to just get away by a lane. Yeah, I mean, that all began on the entry into the Villeneuve chicane when Drudy tried to go the long way around and uh, Dennis Lynn was watching all that and realised he's got an opportunity but it couldn't make it stick because very, very firm defence coming from Matteo Drudy and the Audi precluded any move by Dennis Lynn. But look how close these three cars are. And just behind you've got Matteo Caroli also waiting to pick up any of the pieces that may end up on the racetrack. So this battle going on third, fourth, fifth down the hill. Last Pro Cup podium place on the line here. 38 and three quarter minutes to go. So Lind in the 1-1-1 one, one, one McLaren on the back of Matteo Drudy, on the back of Stoltz. Here they come up to the line. Uh, we think, I think that the McLaren has got a small advantage in straight line performance over the ID and uh, the number... Yeah, the number two Mercedes, but doesn't appear to be materialising. Drudy again, getting very racy, looking to find a way around. Lucas Stolze almost made it work a few corners down the road at the Villeneuve chicane. Don't think he's got the same intention this time. And the gap between these three cars is sort of equidistant, but Lucas Stolze has regrouped and managed to stay comfortably ahead this time of Matteo Drudy into Tosa Herpen. As the lead gap creeps up to one second now, Dries Van Thor, little by little, is just starting to build the advantage. Quick look at who the fastest cars are. Well, the uh, Audi number 99 that Nicholas Schurl at the wheel of it now, 280 kilometres an hour, heading through the fastest part of the circuit towards Tamburello after that long drag past the pits, 278 from Lamborghinis uh, and McLarens, 277 from BMW number 50 and the Lamborghini. Uh, number eight, Mark Parisi at the wheel of that when it did it, uh, 277 kilometres an hour, the AGS events entry. So these five cars getting into their own little battle over third place. Who will come out on the final podium steps? It's difficult to anticipate right now. There's too many other unknown factors that will probably play out for 37 minutes of this three-hour endurance event. Three hours endurance been non-stop flat out sprint racing as far as I can see. Absolutely so, to the line they come then. So Van Thor to Gunnel, the gap was one second. This is the train for third, Stoltz, Drudy, Lind, Caroli, where they all pour. And the lead gap to the eye has crept up, nine tenths of a second. So actually it's come down by hundreds. Lucas Stoltz runs third, he's just on a personal best lap, but it's only the top two being able to do one minute forties. But were Drudy to clear Stoltz, were Lind to clear the two of them, could they start to do the same kind of pace as the race leaders? And again, just looking at the pace of the third, fourth, fifth, sixth pace cars, if Drudy can clear Lucas Stoltz, then he's got an opportunity. He'd be two point, what? Well, he'd be, in fact, he would only be a second or so behind then the second place. Mercedes up the hill, but it's a big ask. He hasn't been able to make it work. And the longer they go retaining their respective positions, the more difficult it's going to become for uh, Drudy to find a way around Stoltz and likewise Dennis Lind and, and Matteo Caroli and of James Collado in the Ferrari. At the Aqua Minerali approach, number two Mercedes, the fastest, 194 kilometers equaled by before it retired the 97 Aston Martin. Uh, number 111 McLaren, 189, matched by the Audi, number 30, the uh, Garden delivered car, and Porsche 54 with Matteo Cairoli in it right now. These speeds are not in Aqua Minerale itself. These are the speeds that they're attaining coming into the braking zone into Aqua Minerale. So the corner itself is a, is a much slower corner, but nevertheless, the, the, the speeds down into it are pretty impressive. Indeed so, right, that's Lynn up to the line. So through they turn, and the gap nine tenths last time between these two. Jules going on trying everything to try to match the Audi, but it's crept up again. He's just done a personal best lap, but even so, it's not quite as quick by tenth as Dries Van Thor ahead of him. And these next four cars again, there's a, a little bit of a gap between all four of them. It's the Porsche right now, which is running in sixth position, that might be thinking, well, is there something for me? Eventually, 34 minutes to go. Matteo Caroli trying to get on terms with Dennis Lind. That is no easy task, I can yeah. assure you. But actually, Lind has fallen back slightly, hasn't he? Yes, he has. Drudy, and therefore the Porsche is that little bit nearer. So that frenetic fight of a lap or two back heading up the hill, not there just now. 
So 34 minutes to go. Still leading in the Silver Cup, Thomas Neubauer. In number 30, Audi, still leading the gold. Robert Renauer, who is getting further and further up the order. Uh, we've also got Maxime Martin's Aston to 15th, incidentally, but again, much, much further down than its day-long pace suggests it should have achieved. Yeah, I mean, the further he climbs up the field, the more difficult it's going to be to overtake. And Renauer in the leading Gold Cup, Porsche ain't no slouch. And Porsche has got good straight-line speed. And it's a race for position. It's not as if he's coming up behind the Porsche to put a lap on it. So every car that Maxime Martin comes up against is going to become more and more difficult to find a way around. So there is James Collado behind Thomas Neubauer in the Audi. Now that's the car, as I say, leading in silver, 98. Uh, Augusto Farfus to bring it to the end, 12th place overall. He's on the tail of Marvin Kirchhoff as McLaren, the Jota single entry. But for JP Metasport, Dennis Lind's the best of the McLarens right now in fifth place. So we've got used to him being a Lamborghini specialist over the last few seasons, but Dennis Lynn proving he can go well in the McLaren as well. Farfus then just losing out a little bit in a straight line because Kirkhoffer is able to maintain three tenths of a second advantage to come down under braking. Triple seven, got triple seven. Ten second time penalty at the end of the race for speeding in the pit lane, for speeding in the pit lane. And treble seven is Axel Jeffries, who is in 13th overall and second in the Silver Cup. Now, Madea Drudy Madea looks as if He's got a second wind uh, because he has closed down marginally on the back of Lucas Stolz and pulled away from the, the clasp of Dennis Lind, who at one point was a major worry for the number 12 Audi. So Matteo Drudy rushes down the hill into Aqua Minerale. This is where they were attaining their maximum speeds. It's a sort of it's a funny double corner Aqua Minerale speed. Its profile has changed quite a lot over the previous seasons almost decades to the incarnation that we have now which I think is a pretty good one over the curve comes the Mercedes then in third spot Stoltz ahead of Drudy Lind ahead of Cairoli Robert Renner I mentioned 14th overall leading the gold cup but the pace that he's got given especially the car ahead of him has got a, a time penalty to be added at the end of the race I uh, just wonder how far up the order Robert Renner can get he's a very very quick Porsche race very successful in the 24-hour series because he's always been in a, a class with an AM driver, for example, in, in this championship. You've never really seen the best of him, but the car running uh, very, very well at the moment. That last safety car period has propelled them up the order. Right, over the line come the leaders. The margin is up to 1.6 seconds now. It's looking as though Dries Van Thor has got this one done now because Jules Gounod just can't bring down that gap. No, and once you can see the car that's pursuing you beginning to get a little bit smaller in your rear view mirrors, you know that you've got... The, the pace that you need to consolidate. This, this is the battle really for third, the final podium position that's going to, I suspect, enthrall us until the end. Can Matteo Drudy find enough pace to get alongside, get ahead of Lucas Stoltz? Can the Porsche running right now in sixth place do anything to Dennis Linden, the McLaren running in fifth? Now, the team manager of number seven has got to go to the stewards immediately. That's the inception racing McLaren. Uh, that Frederick Schandorf is driving. Well, the team manager of that is Bas Linders. So Bas is on his way up the stairs to go and see the stewards. Richard Norbury is the uh, chief steward. And over the brow, heading up now towards the very end, the outer, they go once more for the 76th time. 1.6 seconds the margin between Banthor and Gunnar. This is Matteo Cairoli in sixth spot, still hunting down Dennis Lid, but not, again, being able to get quite close enough to mount an attack. I suppose at this phase of the run, you know, while the fuel load is diminishing, the I suppose also it's the, it's the abuse in effect when you're running so close behind another car, you're in a race with. You're not necessarily always running on the racetrack, the line that you would prefer. And if you're doing it on your own, you can control what you want to do. When you're running behind some cars and you've got a group of cars all so close together, you have to make compromises. You have to make adjustments. Eight, eight, under investigation overtaking during the safety car procedure. 188, under investigation for overtaking during the safety car procedure. Well, was that Alexander West, or...? May have been. Certainly, he's one of the drivers of 188. Oh, that's Cairoli, comes through. That's 77 we're on. Matteo Drudy still there in that fourth place. Number 12, the 
Trezor by car collection, Audi. Very good effort, that, because it's a, a team new to this championship. Yes, they've done quite a lot of endurance racing elsewhere, but uh, in this company, very good. And of course, it's the second best last of the Audi. Last warning for car 11, track limits. Last warning, car 11, track limits. And that is Axel Blum, who's down in 31st place, car number 11. So there is Cairoli heading towards Aqua Minerali. Touches the curb, heads up the hill. Behind him is James Collado in the Ferrari. But again, the Ferraris and the Lamborghinis, and to a degree, the Porsches, have just never quite had the ultimate pace to match Audi or Mercedes, have they? No, I mean, in the case of a race we've seen, I mean, it was explained to us, I think Christopher Hauser mentioned that this circuit seems to have an Audi bias. Uh, I don't think any racetrack is designed around one brand, but just the layout, the nature of this track seems to conform with what Audi produce. Now, the Lamborghini's not a million miles away, as we've talked about earlier, but it, there are sufficient differences to enable one to outperform the other. Just interestingly, and as a, the consequence of the missed pit stop by Valentino Rossi, the 46 Audi, which he was driving, now Fred Babiche behind the wheel, is all the way down in 23rd position. Yeah, an extra pit stop, as you say, and a, an extra slow lap. Uh, 95 after going late for the pit stop. Up to 13th now, Maxime Martin. He's hustling on, but he ain't going to get much up the top 10 if that, I wouldn't have thought, as Lind falls further away now from Matteo Drudy because he's rather busy keeping Matteo Cairoli at bay here. Yeah, and it's Cairoli and, in fact, James Corrado in the Ferrari behind as the pace of the McLaren appears to be ebbing away yeah. rather than the pace of the... Porsche and the Ferrari uh, increasing, so what's Dennis Lind going to do? He'll not be shy about defending, that is for sure. Dan Harper in number 50 BMW has just done the absolute best first sector. The car is way, way back in 16th place, chasing actually Mirko Bortolotti, who's only 50 for Emil Frey Racing. But uh, Dan Harper doing a good job in sector one. Yeah, Dennis Lind has lost a huge amount of time, relatively speaking to Matthew Drudy on whose tail he was four or five laps ago. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's been, if you point out, it's four or five laps since the McLaren started to fall back and it's fallen back into the clutches of the Porsche and James Collado and the Ferrari. But of course, where will they find a way around? And a bit of a battered and bruised 25 Audi. Patrick Niederhauser, a bit of the bodywork on the left-hand side of the car. Some of those little aerodynamic strakes uh, looks like it's becoming are about to detach, there it is, hanging down. Well, that car's back into the top ten after Lucas Legere went through the gravel with it, lost chunks of time. Uh, right, two seconds now, Van Thor to Gunon. I hesitate to say game over as far as Dries Van Thor's uh, threats concerned from Jules Gunon, but it's looking much, much more secure a race now for WRT. There, Maxime Martin clears another back marker, that puts him ahead of Dominic Bauman in the uh, SPS Automotive Performance. Mercedes, that's the Gold Cup leader and potential winner, and therefore history maker, the first race for the Gold Cup, and Robert Renau for the Herbert Motorsport team, which he operates with his twin brother Alfred. He's on target for the win. Yes, and, and how appropriate a 911 in prospect winning the Gold Cup category. Maxime Martin is just under five seconds behind. Uh, Augusta Farfus in the BMW, that's going to be a battle, one would hope shortly engaged for 12th position. I mean, talking about 12th position, it's like it's going for a win, but yeah. for some of these drivers, it will be as close to a win as they were going to get here this afternoon. That's the second of the Gold Cup cars, the AF Corsa Ferrari of Alessandro Balzan, who did lead, but lost out to the charging Renault on that last uh, safety car restart period. So the margin is 2.2 seconds, but it's going up. And Jules Gounon has just done an absolute best middle sector. I wonder, has a message gone from pits to driver we've got half no, we've got 25 minutes you need to start to eat into that two second gap if you want to win this race let's see what the gap is because it's a personal best in sector three from both of them and Dries Van Thul's sector three is better than Jules Grunel's and the gap goes up net to 2.1 yeah. seconds yeah it was a net gain overall on that last lap lap 79 to the 32 ID and again Matteo Drudy still looking, wondering, where am I going to find a way around the number two Mercedes? And the canny, the canny Lucas Stoltz has defended strongly. So Stoltz versus Drudy, they're still at it for third place, but Lucas Stoltz falling away from Gounon, 
has enough in hand, I think, to just be able to repel the challenge of Drudy. This is what it looked like earlier on when the two cars were absolutely together and uh, they were overlapping. Oh, so close to getting past was Drudy. He was on the outside line. He got his nose in front, but he couldn't quite stay there coming off the corner. There was that bit of contact between them. And that's where Dennis Lynn began to think, oh, yeah. I've got a pop here, I've got a chance. So he went one side, then the other side, and then it all got messy coming out of Tosa. So Luca Stoltz it is who climbs the hill, still ahead of Drudy, but they've dropped Lind, certainly. Dennis Lynn in the McLaren, busy fending off Cairoli and Collado, but part of the reason for that is that he's fallen away from this fight. 23 minutes, 50 seconds on the clock. And the lead gap, 2.1 seconds in the first sector of the lap. Uh, it's gone up by hundreds in the next, it's come down by hundreds, so they're evenly matched, but the Audi just looks the stronger. In fairness, as it has done all weekend, because, you know, it's ahead on the grid, and the Mercedes is almost able to match the pace, but not quite. Not good enough, though, at the end of the day, and the pace has been with the WRT Audi, albeit it lost the advantage just shortly after the start. To the 25 Santa Log sister car or sister member of the family. Warning flag to car 30 for track limits. So 23 minutes are still on the clock, and uh, Dries van Thor's advantage up to 2.3 seconds. Now, in fairness to Matthew Drudy, he is not giving up. No, he's not. And that message was to Thomas Neubauer for track limits in the WRT RD number 30. So no, Matteo Drudy has got a second wind as Lucas Stoltz is now beginning to think, well, is my secure third place as secure as I thought it was? They climb the hill once again, just looking further back. Still Thomas Neubauer, well clear in silver now from Axel Jeffries, who's got a penalty to be applied post-race, so that's going to help Nicholas Schurl in 99 Audi. And on this lap, Drudy has dropped away again, hasn't he? So you get these little bursts, and then if they can't find a way through, then car sort of seems to drop back and plateau for a lap or four. There is Van Thor out of Variante Alta. Behind him is Jules Gunn on the gap last time was 2.3 seconds. And it could be even more than that this time. It looks serene as it continues, in my view, to extend its advantage. If it comes down to Ravazza, just turns in, as you'd expect. Okay, he's using all the curb and all the road on the entry and the exit, but he's got that rhythm and he's got nobody ahead of him. He's only got Second place, Mercedes falling back bit by bit, 2.3 seconds. One lap ago, it's going to probably be another tenth or so of a second as they come across the line, and it is going to be 2.6, two tenths of a second advantage to Dries van Thor. Exactly, so he pulls the gap just a little bit further out. There is Jules Gounon, who after his purple sector, struggling now to go green. So the Mercedes, I'll repeat the point, it's been quick all weekend, but just not quick enough. And a tenth here and a tenth there all adds up. And you can see the way now that Van Thor again is stretching. Drudy fighting back as best he can against Lucas Stoltz. It was six tenths of a second at the start of the lap. But then Dennis Lind has got his train behind him. Incident 188 and 8. No further action. Incident 188 and 8. Lind no and Cairoli go through. Collado in seventh. Neubauer in eighth. Nine for this Foco. Patrick Niederhauser is 10th, so actually Dennis Lind has got the queue forming and it's a long queue behind him. Where does it stretch you all the way down to? 12th place, now Gusto Farfus. Yeah, but he seems to have enough performance in hand to stem or stymie the, the pursuit by Matteo Caroli and the Porsche or whatever Caroli can do. Lind seems to be able to counteract it and while the overall pace of that fourth or fifth, or fifth, or fifth place McLaren and dropping back from fourth place, Drudy, it's still strong enough to keep those behind him, to keep them at bay. Out then of Varianti Alta, they flick for the 82nd time. And now look, Antonio Fuoco having a go to get past Thomas Neubauer for eighth place. The little, in comparison, yellow Ferrari on the tail of the Audi as they drop downhill. But Fuoco now on his toes, and he's also taking with him Patrick Niederhauser in the Santa Lock blue Audi for tenth place. Yeah, I'd have to put my money on Fuoco finding a way around the Audi sooner than later. Uh, you know, a single-seater racer of substantial repute in behind the wheel of the Ferrari, and uh, the old laser eyes will be on the back of the Audi and thinking, I need to do this sooner than later, but doesn't get the chance down into Tamburello, and he needs to be on his toes because Nita Hauser behind him will be looking for any little gap, any little flitch from the back of the Ferrari. 
but all eggs at Tamburo look clean. This battle here for third place hasn't really changed. The gap's been much the same Seven. over the last few laps. Five second time penalty added at the end of the race for speeding in the pit lane. Car That's seven. the Frederick Chantor McLaren added at the end of the race Being for speeding right, in the Right, now out of this pack, what do we see? Uh, just I saw... Well, it goes ahead, isn't it? Yeah. And now here comes Niederhauser. So, Thomas Neubauer has lost one place. He's about to lose a second. Throw on the inside goes. And three. Audi. And three, yeah, because... That's Marvin Kirchhofer. So, yeah, you get put off your stride. It could be four in a moment. Here comes Farfus. Look at the BMW. Yeah, up the inside he goes. That is the lap from hell from Thomas Neubauer. Shuffled down the pack. Well, that's what happens. You lose one position. You get yourself out of position. You lose your momentum. Trying to come back against Farfus in the BMW. I don't think Farfus will have anything to do with that attempt to regain position. Maxime Martin yeah. finally, finally getting himself up to the races he's going to be by the end of this lap. But he may still be in 13th position, but the pack has been shuffled. So they drop down through Ravazza, and yes, the Aston Martin has finally got the chance of gaining more ground here. Whole queue of cars ahead, but can he do anything? Remember, points isn't it down to 10th place? In each class, yeah. In each class, so we've got 18 minutes. So what can Maxime Martin do? He's right on the gearbox of the Audi, and he's going to look for a move down the inside. He's going to do it. Can he do it? Job I mean, that done. was a, a nice, professional, thought-out, executed overtake, and no real, real sort of uh, fight, one might say, from Neubauer. Got the job done, didn't he? So nicely through. So Maxime Martin then up into the top dozen. There's the battle for third still. The lead gap, by the way, has doubled since we last looked. It's four seconds now. Stoltz to Drudy, only three tenths of a second. But Mario Drudy, if you like now, is encountering the BOP problem that the cars are designed to be evenly matched. And so, again, where does he have the advantage in order to get up alongside and pass? He needs Stoltz to make a mistake, and that ain't coming. No, he's metronomic. Look at Stoltz, metronomic and everything he's been doing. He's not put a wheel wrong in his stint that we have seen. Again, I keep referring to Matteo Drudy and his Audi. It may have the capacity to lap quicker than the Mercedes directly ahead, but hasn't got that level of extra performance to find a way around it. But get ahead of it, then he'll pull away. Well, don't forget this pink Mercedes, when Mauro Engel was in it at the start of the race, was around seventh place. It worked its way up in the middle stint, and uh, Star Cot Horse was behind the wheel then, despite warnings about track limits and now Lucas Stoltz doing a fine job so it's risen up the order unobtrusively really and a podium beckons although Matteo Drudy has got other ideas over the line they go the lead gap up to 4.3 seconds this time but still not realistically close enough thinks about it shows the nose tries to distract Lucas Stoltz tries to make him look in the mirrors one way look in the other way so on the exit of Tamburello so the headlights are on full beam. Anything, anything you can use to distract the driver you're trying to challenge is fair game. Yeah. But Stoltz has been around the block. He knows the tricks, and he's not for cracking under the pressure, is he, as they make the climb up the hill once more. Still Dennis Lynn hangs on to that fifth place from Cairoli, Collado, Fuoco, Niederhauser, Kirchhofer, Farfus, and Martin. So Maxime Martin then on the back of Augusto Farfus. Uh, both uh, teammates years past in the DTM, of course, but uh, now rivals, different brands. Augusto Farfus staying with BMW, Maxime Martin now part of that uh, Aston Martin effort. So, as you see the white Ferrari of James Collado turn through, he is seventh. This is the view as he heads over the brow. And he's looking at the back of the Porsche all the way up into Arianti Valter. Oh, I'll get it right. I have to tell you a lie, you're on board with Cairo. I was uh, going to say, that doesn't look like the back of a Porsche yeah. to me. It's been a long day. Yeah. Uh, Cairo is six, you're so right. He's look, looking at the back of the advance and um, no, Dennis Lind, the bigger part, McLaren. Looks so different at the rear, you don't get the gold flashes on the side of the car. Sun getting low on the sky as well. So, well, as now, you can see the amount of rubbish that's on the windscreen. You don't really see it when you're driving because you're looking so far down the road, your eyesight, you know, all the adrenaline that gives you an enormous depth of field. But the camera sure picks it up. 
Cairoli has worked this car hard, but so too has Dennis Lind really given that McLaren a workout. And he's taken to that car very impressively as you look at the fight for third. So it is still Stoltz versus Trudy. There's Dennis Lind. He's got this long, long line behind him. But actually, if anything, now it's more Collado attacking Cairoli. People stop and attack, don't they? Then they get a bit One stuck and fall away from the car and get themselves on the defensive, not on the attack. Five. So 14 minutes remain. Dries van Thor is the leader outright. The leading silver is Thomas Neubauer. The leading gold is Robert Renauer. And the leading pro-am is Dominic Baumann in the Mercedes way down in 33rd place, but on target for a class win, which is the main aim. When you're running so close to another competitive car, you do sometimes need just to get the nose of your car out into clear free air, just simply to make sure you can get your brake temperatures into a control, but principally look after your, the coolants, the water and oil, and... Uh, Oh, Dennis Lynn hop, skip and a jump as he came through very anti alto that last time. So he has got nothing left. He's just driving the wheels off the McLaren to try and maintain that fifth position. 13 and a half minutes of this race remaining. So there down the hill drops Cairoli. A little bit nearer to Dennis Lynn to the eye that time. McLaren on the limit, isn't it? Dennis is trying to stay ahead. Fuoco then in eighth place in the yellow Ferrari. Now, this will be interesting because he's on the back of his teammate. What gives here? Well, for Orko, we know, well, James Collado, a great race driver, both on single-seaters and in GT, a little bit of a, a pinch on the 46 Audi as it's trying to make continuous progress. And 52 there, the recovering Ferrari of Andrea Bertolini, second in Pro-Am, and the blue McLaren, one car but one behind, is third. So that is Enrique Chavez, who's trying to get himself up past the Audi but Finlay Hutchison on a different lap and getting in the way a little bit, so it's spoiling their, their fight to an extent. But Andrea Bertolini's car, remember, was involved in the incident on the first lap. He's recovered well, and now the McLaren of Enrique Chavez tries to clear the Audi. It's the Ferrari that's the target, but he's got to get past the Audi first, which he has done. Bounces Ooh. over the curb a little bit. Finlay Hutchison tries to come back. He's a lap or so ahead of the McLaren. He's got himself in strife as well now. Oh, dear me. Now, that's not a very good move. That'll definitely get the attention of race director hitting a car so aggressively, putting that car off the racetrack. That will potentially be up to see this headmaster and have a good talking to her. That was not necessary. Well, um, could have been a much worse incident. Yeah, that was Yuki Nomoto, who was going for position. So that was a car on the same lap, fighting for position. And uh, yeah, as you say, that won't go down very well. Another absolute best first sector posted by Dan Harper. And so what has this done to our second placed uh, Pro-Am battle? Well, it is now Andrea Bertolini ahead of Enrique Chavez, but with the traffic no longer a factor, the McLaren can charge on in pursuit of the Ferrari with only 11 and a half minutes still to go. Beginning to get these bunches of cars around the racetrack. Uh, Bertolini goes through, McLaren follows in the 46, the third car in that group, uh, Fred Bavish. Down the hill they go. For oh, this is the 88th time, with virtually two hours, 50 minutes of this race complete, albeit with a number of safety car or full course yellow interventions. Gravel on the track. You can see just on the inside of the exit of, L of Ravats. I don't know how all that got there, but it's not a part of the racetrack that you should be. If you are there, you're going to be in trouble. So 11 more minutes of the race remain. And Dries Van Thor making this look relatively easy up front now because he's just creeping away. 10th here, 10th there, five seconds is now the margin. And Fuoco looking quicker than Collado. Now, is Iron Lynx going to give a call to say let him buy or are they going to let them fight with the incumbent risk that that might have? I don't think James Collado is going to hand it to Fuoco on a plate. If he wants it, he's going to have to work for it and actually earn it. Of course, both cars, both drivers, uh, and Lynx, you don't want to end up putting one or both cars into jeopardy and losing potential points. So uh, it'll be a call possibly from the pit lane, but I suspect they're going to let them with 10 minutes to go to resolve this issue on track. So 71 is the charging Antonio Fuoco. Still the fastest lap dates all the way back to the first stint when uh, Nicky Team did it on the 17th lap. We've now done 88 laps. But uh, since then, of course, we've had a number of incidents and uh, traffic has been a, a major factor.
So into the final 10 minutes of the race. Dennis Lind goes by, still being chased by Cairoli, Calado, and then Fuoco. Patrick Niederhauser in ninth. Marvin Kirchhofer there, 10th, 11th is Farfus now. 12th is Maxime Martin. So he's going to miss out on Pro Cup points, as, of course, also is Farfus outside the top 10. And still, Lukas Stoltz, literally, it's metronomically, the way he has driven his stint, he's not changed his line that I've seen in any of the corners, the 21 corners around the Emila circuit. He's just placed the car accurately and done what he's there. He's a professional race driver. He's fulfilled his obligation. What's going on here? Oh, oh, oh. well, that was Matteo Drudy just getting a little bit over, over exercised. Down the hill drops number 12 then, Matteo Drudy. And he's going to try and make up that lost time now. That only takes one tiny little slip, doesn't it? But, of course, having dropped back, it means he's got a bit more uh, clear air that he can use to his advantage before he gets stuck behind the car ahead. Yeah, but remember, he put the two right wheels off the yeah. racetrack, so they'll have picked up a bit of the, the gravel dust, and that will take a few corners for it to clear away to get the Pirelli rubber to be in full contact with the tarmac, and uh, he'll be cursing himself for doing that because it's time and lap lost. Only eight and a half minutes now of this three-hour event remaining, so the old sand timer is running out. Well, there is 38, which is Marvin Kirchhofer, 10th place. Not actually a bad race as a whole, this, for McLaren. It's good to have more of them, and well, there you've got two in the top ten. Exactly, as I said a few minutes ago, that the pace that McLaren have illustrated here in the first race of the year, there's going to be races where they will be at the very front, and they'll be the team that will be the dominant team. Don't know where it will be, but this is a very good performance from the McLaren brand. We saw the car take a, a step forward last year, and it was so competitive in the sprint races at Brands Hatch until there was the incident late race. But so the, the, the latent ability of the car is there. It's competitive and been winning in domestic championship. British GT as an example. Patrick Niederhauser still with that bit of bodywork a flapping. Oh, oh, that was a, almost almost a move from James Collado yeah. on Matteo Caroli up into Tosa, but uh, was nowhere near alongside. But he certainly showed that he's not prepared to accept that he's going to finish fifth. I'm oh, sorry, he finished seventh, but right, he's seventh. He wants to finish sixth. So Niederhauser presses on. Marvin Kirchhoff, an impressive McLaren debut, this. We've seen him in the R Motorsport Astons in the past. An effort. Oh, hello, big damage here. What's gone on? That is number seven. That's the McLaren that's being driven by Frederick Schandorf. He's got a penalty uh, for speeding in the pit lane, and it's got bodywork falling off it. Now, that car, remember, was hit by Casper Ste by Casper Stevenson. It was certainly by one car down at Rivazza a long time ago. Well, that door with the wind pressure ain't going to stay there terribly long, and I would imagine he's going to have to make a pit stop uh, at the end of this lap because if that bit of bodywork falls off, they're going to see another situation where the circuit's going to be absolutely littered in carbon fibre. He's slowed down coming through Aquamenerale and hope he stays on the right of the track coming up into. Very anti alto. No, he's, he's, I think he's just powering on as much as he had done previously. But not a pretty sight. Yeah, whether it is a legacy of that accident at Ravazza when the car was sort of pinballed, uh, whether it's something separate, time will hopefully tell us. But it's, it's clearly not got any pace with the air brakes, and the field is streaming past him. Uh, he might as well come in and get it attended to because it's just not fast enough to stay out there for any real benefit now. No, but it, and also it's extremely dangerous if yeah. that door did detach it where it will fly up in the air like a kite but where it lands is anybody's guess and uh, if it landed on the racetrack it could be a oh, oh, oh James Black Collado flag to car seven door is open so Black the Porsche runs wide the Ferrari's attack but James open. Collado still not quite able to make that move but it's getting very tasty between these three isn't it and of course now Cairo has fallen back okay, Dennis Lynn. In the pit lane. Okay. so down the hill here we go Uh, James Collado, you can see the rear of the Porsche. Both have got virtually identical uphill performance. Then hard on the brakes in the swing right. And where is our marker pole? Is it still standing? I think so. Oh, wow, what an effort the drivers have made to avoid that. They've not avoided one another necessarily, but they've no. avoided the bollard, yeah. They have modded, yeah. <laughs> right. So F Fuoco definitely, definitely wants that place off, yeah. off James Collado, but he hasn't got the grunt or the lap time to to make it worthy let's see so that's the start of it that's where the Porsche ran wide yeah 
And so that meant that James Collado tried the outside, but in turn opened the door to Fuoco on the in. Nobody gained, nobody lost, but they all concertinaed. Did, indeed. So on board with James Collado once again. Uh, ooh, there we are. Yeah, just that little error coming out of the Villeneuve chicane. St stopped his momentum back again. There we are one lap later, and the entire field from the top three is beginning to concertina yet again. And Farfus thinks he's going to have a bit of a look at the back of the McLaren of uh, Mervyn Kierkhofer. And the 25 Niederhauser is also under pressure, dropping back from the rear of the Antonio Fuoco Ferrari. So three and three quarter minutes, David. Time has flown, and the lead gap 6.6 .6 seconds. There are still battles to be resolved. In the Gold Cup, Robert Renauer is still gapping Alessandro Balzan, and there, through the traffic, darts Dennis Lind. It's a back marker between himself and, therefore, Matteo Cairoli. And that was Carrie Moje that he's just overtaken in the Audi, but he's now running fifth in the Gold Cup. I'm glad it's early on. Yeah, and that gives Dennis Lind a little bit of breathing space, because, oh, and Cairoli runs wide. He ran under brakes coming into Revazza 1. So again, Collado has been thinking, what have I got to do? Three minutes remaining, what, this lap, one, maybe two more laps possible before check and fly comes out. Well, the race leaders, six and a half seconds between them have kind of long gone, really. Stoltz and Drudy likewise. And now Fuoco again darts out of the draft, has a look, more in hope than in anticipation, trying to unsettle James Collado there. Can't find a way by. That number seven McLaren, by the way, we saw with the door hanging off when it's come in, put a new one on, and it's gone out. What, 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 what do you think he got as a trade in against the, the old one? <laughs> what are you going to give me for my old door, mate? The fact that it's somewhat uh, disfigured, I don't think, helps the value greatly. Don't worry, it'll go back into the old mould, into the old clay, and it'll come out like brand new. Brand new, yeah. So, up the hill come Dennis Lind, still there in fifth, then... Cairoli, Collado, Fuoco, Niederhauser, Kirchhofer, Farfus, and then Maxime Martin, who finally has caught up with the BMW. Now, can he gain another place before the end? Two minutes to go. This lap and one more, potentially, and this is for 11th place. They drop down the hill. I love to see Maxime Martin have a really good, serious overtaking attempt on the BMW. Two well-seasoned, experienced GT racers. But I suspect that the Wiley... Brazilian has just got that little bit in hand to we go back to our race leader, comes across the line to compete 93 laps, is waiting for it to clock up on timing and scoring. So he goes through, and as he does so, yeah. that's going to be the last lap, I reckon. Yeah. It's, it's going to be tight, but this should just be the last lap. He can afford to back off the pace a little bit, to be sure, because he's got 6.6 .6 seconds in hand over Jules Gounod. Dries Van Thor then will bring it home. That man, Charles Witt, started it. Kelvin van der Linde did a very good job, and he's going to be, if you like, the Imola Meister, having won here two years ago, the last time GT World Challenge Europe was here. I think this is the kind of circuit... ...between car 563 and 31 in turn 5 under investigation. I'm not Finley. surprised yeah, to hear that. Exactly. I, wonder, I wonder why it took so long to come through. That was Finley Hutchison on Yuki Nomoto, wasn't it? So, last lap, we think, and Dries van Thor good stint by him, it interrupted him, but Charles Witt had that little slip, put the car off the road. Calvin van der Linden, a very, very good middle stint, getting that car into the lead. So it looks very much as if it's going to remain status quo for those outside of the top three. Matteo Drudy is half a second behind and got little chance. The only person who might think about it is Antonio Fuoco, who ended up just three tenths of a second, and you can see how close the yellow Ferrari is to the white Ferrari, but we're halfway around the final lap, and there's Dries van Thor coming down to the Ravazza for the final time on a racing lap. Clock ticking down, and it's just going to go to three hours, about ten seconds before he takes the cro goes across the start-finish line. The chequered flag at the ready then, and it's going to be a win for Dries van Thor, Charles Witz, and Calvin van der Linde in the opening round of the Fanatec GT World Challenge Europe, powered by AWS Endurance Cup.
It's a win for Audi, and it is going to be second for Mercedes as Jules Gounon storms across the line with Danny Junkadea and Rafael Marchiello's help. It's Mercedes third as well. Lucas Stolt, Stein Scott good return to the championship, and Mara Engel. And then for fourth place, uh, Matti Udrudi, Luca Giotto, and Christopher Hauser. Dennis Lynn comes home fifth ahead of Cairoli, Collado, Fuoco, Niederhauser, then Kirchhoff, and then Farfus, then Martin, and then number 63, Mirko Portolotti, getting ahead of Thomas Neubauer at the end. So the Silver Cup winning car drops down, but still takes the class honours. And uh, there's a very, very happy Charles Witz as the rest of the cars pour over the line. Uh, Watt of Audi number 46, 17th in the end, the Fred Verviche car. There's the Gold Cup winning Porsche of Robert Renauer for 19th, but the car directly ahead has a penalty to be applied, so it'll gain one spot. Robert Renauer to be 18th overall winning in gold. Uh, if we had the silvers through, yes, Thomas Neubauer. What about Pro-Am? Dominic Bauman still leading in the number 20 SPS Mercedes from Andrea Bertolini, and by some margin, so the uh, Mercedes on target and crosses the line to win in Pro-Am. Then number 20, Dominic Bauman's SPS Automotive Performance, Mercedes-Benz. Thoroughly professional performance by WRT to take this victory. Outstanding drive by all three drivers in the 32 car, albeit they lost the lead early in the race, but good strategy, excellent pit stop. At the first round of pit stops, got that car back into contention. As Thomas Neubauer again and WRT Audi getting two class wins, the silver category here this afternoon. I um, mean, what a day for WRT. Absolutely right. And a shame that they lost one car even before the race. A shame that a lot of cars have suffered quite a lot of damage. But uh, we wish uh, Matthew de Robbiano all the, the, the best for his recovery after that accident. As we heard the race director say, getting to hospital for a check. But uh, he was quite an impact, so uh, we wish him well. Right, now, the penalties being applied to treble seven will drop that car to fifth in its class in the uh, Silver Cup. So Axel Jeffries loses third, and that means that 159 Nikolai Sheargaard's Garage 59 McLaren takes third in silver. So the cars make their way into the Park Ferme area fuel rigs up in Park Ferme as well because the data to make sure they were connected for the regulation 40 seconds each time needs to be checked and uh, then the uh, podium ceremonies will eventually take place and it's turned out a lovely evening that's rather after a dullish start to the day the sun is out the sun is falling down quite rapidly but it's uh, a beautiful evening well, the Imola circuit has certainly given drama, given plenty of incident, and uh, a win in the first running of a gold cup within the GT World Challenge Europe for Herbert Motorsport. Robert Renau brings the car home. But Dries Van Thor, another day, another Audi, another win. So the reigning combined champion, the reigning sprint champion, congratulated by Lucas Stoltz, who I suspect might have his uh, thoughts echoed by others. I don't think that was Lucas no, you're Stolz. Right. It is Jules Gounon. It's the, the Bebe Te helmet that's confusing me. <laughs> Lucas Stolz has just driven, driven into the in. pits. Yes, uh, helmet to match the, a different car. Yeah, yeah. Forgive me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Under, easy, easy, <laughs> easy, easy to say. Maro Engel there as well. Stan Schoenhorst delighted with their podium. So great start to his career. It's certainly yeah. an endurance. What I was heading towards in my Mercedes ramble uh, was that the drivers might agree with one another from the different cars that, quick as they were, they just weren't quite there. Didn't have that last tenth to really take the fight to the Audi. No. I mean, a little bit of it, one might say, is that it, it isn't the easiest of race tracks to make an overtake. But actually, for me, it's all about the balance of performance, that the equality of performance across all the nine manufacturers is now so good. There isn't any sort of magic thing you can do well, let's have a word with the winners then. Charles Witt, Calvin van der Linde and Dries van Tour winner at Imola. Well, it's Dries to join us in a second, but a fantastic result. Really, really tough race, and you pushed so hard the whole time. We'll come to you first, Calvin. Yeah, awesome race. I just got to say thanks to the team. It was a long winter. We had some tests where we were like, man, we need to find a bit of lap time. Even yesterday, before, before the qualifying, we were a bit unsure where we were, and then this morning, just really from qualifying onwards, it worked, it worked like a dream. So thanks to my teammates, the whole team. Charles, I'll come across to you quickly. It was a difficult start, but you carried on pushing and set the way for the other two. Yeah, I mean, the uh, start was good at first, and uh, yeah, we struggled a bit with the cold tyres, and uh, then, yeah, I did a mistake, and Mies got by. 
but then we could just keep keep with them, try not to make too many mistakes, and then I knew that with those two guys driving after me, they would they would do great, and uh, that's what happened. So very pleased with this start of the race of the season. Jerry, lovely to see you getting out the car and thrown around by the boys in celebration. Yeah, I mean, what a great race, uh, what a great day actually. I mean, starting from pole, finishing, uh, finishing first, winning the race. The car was today, like Kelvin said, yesterday we were thinking a bit, we, was, we were talking like, oh, where are we, where are we? But uh, the car today was a weapon and a uh, great job by WRT and by Audi by uh, giving us a car to, to fight here. And uh, a good start to the season, but it's a long season still coming, so um, still have a lot of work to do, but it's a good start. Thank you very much, well done. So well done to the WRT Audi drivers. Excellent performance and winning by 6.2 seconds in a much interrupted race with effectively four safety car periods, three of which were prompted by a full course yellow. But the uh, winning Audi drivers then ahead of Jules Gounod, Danny Junkadea and Raffaele Marchiello second. Boys, congratulations. Second place for you. It was a tough race and a lot of pushing. Raffaele, your stint there, first of all. Yeah, it feels like a win. I mean, Audi was just way too quick for us. So I hope something will change for the next race. OK, thank you very much. And Danny, coming across to you, of course, second stint there. And then handing over to Jules. It was a slightly difficult time, as we discussed earlier, but an enjoyable race. Yeah, we unfortunately lost a couple of spots on that uh, second spot, uh, second stop. But um, yeah, it was a fairly uh, comfortable stint, just uh, trying to manage uh, pace around me. And uh, just, I mean, uh, it's difficult to follow with our car. It's very strong in the corners, but when we are following other cars, it's it's hard. But uh, yeah, just having everything ready for Jules for the last stint, which uh, yeah turned out to be a good strategy to stop uh, the earliest, and we ended up with the second place, which is great. Jules, you said we had to speak to Raffaele first. Next time we're speaking to you first, but that last stint was great. Yeah, it was great. I pushed like hell and I was dropping like a stone, so it was quite difficult, but uh, well done to them. You know, they did a perfect race, no, no issue. We also did the same. I think the car was fantastic. We really pushed to the limit. The team has worked so hard in the winter to gain a few more tents. We did, but it wasn't enough, so we will keep working. And congrats to them, but I'm still happy to be back. First podium of the, not the first podium of the season, but first podium of GT World Challenge and uh, next time we will get them harder. <laughs> Thank you. Well, you get the sense of the frustration, don't you, about uh, the, the pace of the Mercedes relative to the Audi there? Yes, I mean, look, if, it, if it was Audi were second, they would be saying the same thing about Mercedes. So it's what goes around comes around. I mean, the next round of the Endurance Championship will be at Paul Ricard. Different racetrack, a big, long, long, long straight, dominates the racetrack. Six hour endurance race, so you know it could be Mercedes Day in the south of France. Let's hear from the third place Mercedes team their thoughts on the race. Well, it's third place. The, the mechanics are very much looking underneath the car. Is everything all right? It looks like we uh, have a wheel nut from a car jammed under the car. So uh, Luca was reporting that there's something skimming and uh, seems like it's a wheel nut from another car. OK, but uh, I mean, a fantastic result and a tough race, a lot of pushing. And it seemed like a sprint race. Yeah, it, it, it was a tough one, especially the last thing for Luca seemed to be uh, quite tough. It wasn't a lot of pressure, but he did a really good job. We're, we can be proud of him. <laughs> you can be proud of yourself as well. A bit, yeah. Yeah, it was, was really tough to fight against Madria, uh, Mattia, but it was, was really fair. Um, I pushed a lot, but yeah, in the end, it's a podium for us. The, the team did a perfect job. Um, it was really nice to stop on a safety car and gain some position. So perfect to start the season on a podium. Congratulations. A great start to the year, as you said. Well done. Thank you. While we've been hearing from the uh, drivers, up on the timing screen comes the line that says a pit stop of car 46 is under investigation. 46, of course, being the Valentino Rossi, Nico Muller, Fred Vervich Audi. One would assume it was because of the overshoot uh, at the first pit stop attempt. And uh, I mean, I don't think it is going to lead to a penalty per se, but it, they just may want to have uh, an explanation. Sure. So we have the provisional result. Dries Van Thor, Calvin van der Linde and Charles Witz, the winners from Raffaele Marciello, uh, Daniel Junkidea and uh, Jules Gounon. And they're taking third, Mario Engel, Stan Scotthorst and Lucas Stoltz. Fourth to Christopher Halser, Matthew Drudy and Luca Giotto. With Christian Klein, Vincent Avril and Dennis Lind coming home fifth from Klaus Backler, Corb Ledegar and Matteo Caroli in sixth. Seventh to Miguel Molina uh, with Nicholas Nielsen and James Collado. Antonio Fuoco's Ferrari comes home eighth. 
ninth game the way of the Santalok Audi that did lead early on. Patrick Niederhauser, Lucas Legere, and Christopher Meese, and Marvin Kirchhoff, and Rob Bell, and Ollie Wilkinson round out the top ten. What about the different classes? Well, in the Silver Cup, Thomas Neubauer uh, brings number 30 home, shared with Benji Goethe and Jean-Baptiste Simonat as the class winner. The Gold Cup won by 9-11. Uh, Robert Renard, Alfred Renard, his brother, and Ralph Bowen, the drivers there, and Pro-Am Dominic Bauman, victorious, along with Ian Loggy uh, and the uh, team principal, Valentin Pierberg. Out of our 52 entries, 51 started, and it was about 40 that officially are classified. Uh, some that we know retired weren't, classic, weren't uh, officially retired, but the likes of the uh, Jordan with Lamborghini, for example, retired 41 laps before the end after its accident, so we wouldn't have done the distance to be classified, I fear. Uh, but a number that you might have expected better from, like the Mad Panda Mercedes, we lost relatively early, uh, and others such as 97 with its gear loss out of the race, and the 57 Mercedes had a litany of problems, as did also number 66, but of course for the Iron Dames, for JP Motorsport, uh, they never completed a lap, and the uh, final car run that less never got into the race. Indeed, number 33, the Audi that Arnold Robin should have started, but had his problems with and never got into the race. So drivers then making their way to the podium area, where the winning drivers from each of the categories will be uh, brought forward in due course. So it is the Pro Cup drivers first of all, Mario Engel, Stan Scotthorst and Lucas Stoltz step forward in the uh, pink BBT colours from AMG Team Getspeed. Then for second place, 88, Raffaele Marciello along with Danny Juncadea and Jules Gounon. They are second, we've lost Lelo for the moment, but two thirds of the winning, uh, two thirds of the second place combination is there. And then for Team WRT for the top step of the podium, the race winners, Stries Van Thor, Calvin van der Linde and Charles Witt step forward. Calvin van der Linde winner here two years ago, but a very different reception this time. No face mask, he doesn't have to collect his own trophy. He can go to the podium, he can shake hands with people, he can smile and celebrate and drink and spray the champagne in a few moments' time. So uh, is Raffaele Marciello not there because he has an early flight or is he rather disgruntled about the pace of his car? Either way, he's joined us now, that's the good news. But well done to our winners of uh, Dries Van Thor, Calvin van der Linde and Charles Wirtz. So well done to the WRT drivers and the Audi victorious then. The trophies, first of all, because it's in reverse order, go to the third drivers of Lucas Schultz, Star Scotthorst, and then Mauro Engel. So Mercedes 2-3. Jules Gounon busy orchestrating from the podium. Jules, who has been, uh, of course, a Spa 24-hour winner. So we've seen him in Audis, we've seen him in uh, Bentleys, but now very much part of the Mercedes establishment. Daniel Junkadeo, who was representing the team in the eSports race last night, got disqualified from the eSports race because he was given a penalty that he didn't serve, so the game spits you out. And so uh, he uh, didn't finish the race. And uh, Raffaele Marciello forcing a smile, but uh, wasn't overly impressed when he got out of the car, was he? And then the trophies will go to our winners. So, Dries Van Thor, Charles Wirtz, and uh, Kelvin van der Linde take honours then here at Imola. And Roberto Rossi presenting the winner's trophy. He's the head of esports at Fanatec. And uh, the trophies now for all of the winning drivers. Fanatec that's become a big, big partner, big supporter of SRO activities. And uh, now. <laughs> The drivers and uh, WRT representative debating whether they've got the right trophies or whether yours is bigger than mine. 
Everyone now holds the trophies for the photographs. Even after the chequered flag, the officials are still hard at it. There's another time penalty being added to the 22 Porsche of Joel Sturm for speeding in the pit lane, but champagne about to be sprayed. Assuming you don't drop the bottle, Dries. <laughs> A win at Imola for Dries van Thor, Calvin van der Linde and Charles Wirtz. The WRT Pro Cup drivers celebrate. And I think that's about the only slip up all day, with the possible exception of, of Charles Witt's moments in gravel on a couple of occasions. But from Dries's point of view, if the worst you do all day is drop the bottle of champagne, it's not a bad day. I think it's a pretty good day indeed. They'll be delighted with that performance, having had somewhat of a concern in Saturday's practice and pre-qualifying, mm. then getting it right in, in qualifying itself, starting in pole position, effectively dominating the race from light side to check it flag. OK. That little moment with Charles Verts, but the team recovered, and it is the the professionalism of WRT at every level of running a race that uh, is a very big part of securing another victory for them. So the Pro Cup drivers make their way from the podium. Uh, it'll be dressed ready for the next category, and of course, with this being the first round of the championship, the way they finish is the way the championship stands. So it's Charles Witt, Kelvin van der Linde, and Dries van Thor ahead of. Jules Grunel, Daniel Kukadea and Raffaele Marciello, Luca Stoltz, Steinz Kotthorst and Mara Engel are third ahead of Luca Giotto, Matteo Drudi and Christopher Hauser, Dennis Lynn, Vincent Abril and Christian Klee fifth. And although those last two crews don't make it to the podium, of course, meritorious efforts nonetheless from the car collection team and the JP Motorsport squad. Yeah, very good effort all told. I mean, both teams did extremely well and uh, Luca Giotto is somebody in that fourth place position. I look forward to seeing more of him because I think he's going to be another one of these little discoveries that's coming into our world of GT3. So that is how we stand in the Pro Cup and uh, Charles Witts, Kelvin van der Linde, Dries van Poel, the winners by, in the end, 6.2 seconds and a, a race time of three hours and three seconds. So they timed that pretty well. So, of course, we have not only pro, but pro-am and gold and silver as well. So the uh, podium made ready for the next nine drivers. So the silver cup is going to be next, where the uh, winners were again for WRT, uh, but it will be in the reverse order. And so third in silver. Should go to Nikola Hiergaard for Garage 59, along uh, with uh, Ethan Simononi and Manuel Maldonado. Second in the Silver Cup to 99, the Attempto Audi team, which is Marius Zug, Nicholas Schurl, Alex Arca. And they're the Silver Cup winners for WRT. Outstep Thomas Neubauer, Benjamin Goethe and Jean-Baptiste Simonard. And how Benji Goethe has come on from that first time we saw him at Monza as a very young teenager in the WEC making mistakes to now a very accomplished Silver Cup category winner for WRT. So well done WRT, well done Thomas Neubauer, Jean-Baptiste Simonau, good Audi debut for him that, and Benjamin Goethe. Yes, they'll be satisfied with their day's work and uh, picking up silver, uh, all the silverware, most importantly picking up the check. Yes, <laughs> trophies Never first. forget the money. No indeed. So Garage 59 on the podium with the new to them McLaren, Nikolai Sheargaard on the far end in the middle, Manuel Maldonado, Ethan Simononi with his trophy then for uh, second place. The uh, awards then go to Nicholas Schurl, to Alex Alka, and to Marius Zug. They've shown good pace in that car over the course of the race, even though it did fall down a bit towards the end. And then the uh, winning team trophy, yet more for WRT. And uh, then for Jean-Baptiste Simonard, for 
Benjamin Goethe and uh, for Thomas Neubauer. The trophy is Thomas Neubauer, of course, ex-Mercedes driver. Remember, he had that outright win as a silver at Brands Hatch with Nico Bastian a few years ago in the Sprint Challenge Sprint Cup rounds. So there are the winner's trophies from Roberto Rossi. Trophies held aloft. And the WRT celebrations will continue at a plenty. So they've won pro, they've won silver. And uh, then the champagne will be made ready for the drivers. And uh, some flee. Very wisely, I can tell you from yes. experience. It's all very well and good popping up on your cork. But what you don't want is somebody to turn around and just point it straight into your eyes. It does sting. <laughs> The joys of doing the podiums at race meetings where some driver decides to be really funny and pour it down your back and then you have to drive home in that set of clothes. Ugh, not ugh. good, not good. No, it's not. And I tell you, whoever is responsible for refreshing the team's overalls, um, you know, by the time they get to them, they're in a pretty poor state. A silver cup win for Thomas Neubau, Jean-Baptiste Simonard and Benjamin Goethe here at Imola. So WRT success in the silver cup. The Rocco colours, the Gulf colours carried on the Audi. And we can hear from the class winners over on the podium. I'm sure your eyes are stinging a little bit at the moment, but uh, well celebrated, a fantastic result. And we'll come to you first. Yeah, that's the best way to actually end the, the race. Um, my teammates did a brilliant job. Uh, Benji did the first amazing stint, overtaking quite a lot of cars. And then we just finished the job with GB and then ended up on the, the first step of the, the podium. So yeah. That's a nice way to have the to finish the race and have the, the eyes uh, done uh, now. <laughs> Absolutely, well, they blink away. And he's certainly a great result and a great start to the season. WRT starting as they mean to go on. Yeah, I mean the perfect start for us. Um, can for, uh, can have asked for any more. And uh, yeah, just hopefully it stays like this throughout the rest of the season now. Absolutely, JB. Did you enjoy it? Yeah, it was amazing to drive. Uh, for some minute three, like they did amazing job. Obviously, Benji, very good stint, and then was just good rhythm. Team also, very good pit stop, so very nice to drive. Thanks, boys, and well done. Do you know what? I've just seen something that scared me, you know what? Go on. They're all so young. <laughs> <laughs> that is part of the point of the Silver Cup, isn't it? To find that, if you like, next generation of young GT star, drag them on, bring them on. And uh, Benjamin Goethe, as we were saying a little earlier, has certainly come on a pace, as now the drivers set forward in the... Uh, gold Cup, so number five, Mercedes taking third place in the gold. That means that uh, Arjun Maini, Hubert Haupt and Florian Schultz are there for uh, second of the golds. 21, Alessandro Balzan, Cedric Brazzioli and Hugo Delacour from AF Corsa. And the Gold Cup winners, the first time the class has run. And it is Ralph Bone, Alfred and Robert Renauer who are the class winners for Herbert Motorsport. So the drivers to the podium and victory for the German Herbeth Motorsport team. So Hubert Haupt, oh sorry not Hubert Haupt, forgive me, in third place, it is uh, Ralph Bone along with the Renau brothers taking honours, but uh, Hubert Haupt on the far end of the podium, collecting his trophy with uh, Arjun Miley and Florian Schultzer, who has moved from Lamborghini Super Trofeo to the GT World Challenge Europe over the last few seasons and stuck at it and he's getting better and better and better all the time. There, Alessandro Balzan, along with Hugo Delacour and Cedric Sparazzioli, take second for AF Corsa. And uh, then Ralph Bone, Alfred Renner, Robert Renner will take the winner's trophies. But before that, Herbert Motorsport given the team's trophy for the success in the Gold Cup. So 
So honours in the Gold Cup to Porsche. A Gold Cup win for Robert Renauer, for Ralph Bone and Alfred Renauer at Imola. Trophies are locked for all smiles. And the Gold Cup, I think, has been a, a good innovation. 13 entries for the first time out, and a good mix of drivers and some new names to the championship as well, like Arjun Maini switching from single seaters to sports cars to GT cars now, the Indian driver there on the right of the podium as you look. Champagne is ready. And again, some drivers disappear. But the stalwarts will stay and spray away. Arjun Maini is the first one to attack. That safety car late race, I think, did help the Porsche team to an extent, but Robert Renau's pace never really in doubt, and he made the most of it. Yeah, and he was a strong run. His best race lap was a 141.698. So within that category, that was right on the pace. Absolutely right. So Dubai 24-hour race winners and uh, other uh, Corentic winners, the uh, Herbert team, Alessandro Balzan, along with Hugo Delacour and Cedric Barazzioli, very happy with their second place. Would you mind collecting your trophies, the SRO officials ask, as we need to dress the podium for the final podium, which is uh, Pro-Am. So they're the winning Porsche out of the Gold Cup, the 911-911. Good racing went on, and that was the move that put them ahead of the Ferrari. And once ahead, Robert ran out, was not hanging about. Off he went, stormed into the distance. So, again, results the championship. Renaults and Ralph Bone ahead of Alessandro Balzan, Cedric Sprazioli, and Hugo Delacour. Adrian Miney with Florian Schotter and Hewitt Hout third. Uh, for Barwell, James Dorlin, Alex Malikin, and Ben Barker just missing out on a podium four in the Gold Cup ahead of Benjamin Lesen, Karim Auger, and Adam Metecki, who did lead early on, but the car fell away towards the end. And that brings us then to the uh, Pro Am podium where. Enrique Chavez, Miguel Ramos and Alexander West uh, make their way to the podium. Then we have for second in uh, the Pro-Am, Louis Machiels, Andrea Bertolini and uh, Stefano Costatini. And then the Pro-Am winners step forward. And they are Valentin Pierberg, Dominic Bauman and Ian Loggi. He's had a very busy winter, staying out in the Middle East, racing in assorted championships but it is a win for the Mercedes team. So well done to the SPS Automotive Performance team. Winners in Pro-Am here at Imola. Let's have a look back then at the best bits of the opening round of the Endurance Cup, led away by Charles Witz. The car stormed up towards Tamburello for the first time. It was a big attack from Christopher Meese. He, in turn, had to repel the challenge of Raffaele Marchiello. It was a 51-strong field, poured its way through that first chicane. It was a busy first lap and it all got really frantic towards the end when the Iron Dames Ferrari was turned around and Patrick Kaprinsky ended up off the road in the gravel, in the tyres, in retirement. That brought out the safety car and on its return to the pits, the race got back underway and there was plenty of action up and down the field as the number 50 BMW Junior F4 lost a place and losing the lead, Charles Weirs having run wide out of the Villeneuve chicane and he fell back into second spot. Jack Aitken was under attack too. There was a bit of rubbing between Christopher Hauser and Nicky Team. Aston Martin against Audi. Eventually, the Aston went through as there was a big, big lose from the Hugo Valenti Audi. Everybody somehow missed it, but it could not have been closer. Rob Collard ended up in the gravel in number 77 Lamborghini. Cue the safety car again. We went back racing. Matt gave Nicky Team a chance to attack Raffaele Marchiello, but once more he was frustrated in his efforts. First round of pit stops came. In early was Nico Muller to give way to Valentino Rossi. That gave them a clear pit lane and also a clear track when the doctor headed onto the pit lane, and onto the circuit after the pit lane exit. It also meant the order would start to shuffle now. Marco Sorensen was attacking 
vigorously against the now Lucas Legre driven Audi for second spot. Eventually, Legre went off the road and fell back into 14th place, and that promoted the Aston. But the sister car was off by the side of the road with a lot of gears. That brought out the safety car. Just as we were getting set to go racing, there was an incident out on track, and that kept people on the road a little bit longer behind the safety car. Valentino Rossi missed his pit box, had to do another lap. We got back underway, and more battling as the cars headed up towards Variante Alta. But after the last round of pit stops, there was yet more drama with Casper Stevenson bouncing off the side of the Inception Racing McLaren. Dries Van Tour was in the lead and he was starting to build that gap. Lucas Stoltz was busy squabbling with Matthew Drudy. In the end, he would stay ahead, but it was touch and go for a time. So Dries Van Thor continuing to lead up front. There were battles going on for second in Pro-Am as well. And then there was this little moment, Finley Hutchinson squeezing Yuki Nomoto to the grass out of Tamborello. For the number 32 WRT Audi, though, the gap just kept on stretching. A couple of tenths here and there and as the battle was lower down. The field raged on. It was a race win for Dries Van Thor, for Kelvin van der Linde and for Charles Witt in the opening Endurance Cup round here at Imola. So, great racing to kick off the season. Next action is the Sprint Cup starter at Brands Hatch, but for now, from Gemma Scott, from John Watson and from me, David Addison, it's goodbye from Imola.